right. There you go. Bless. Thank you. Alrighty, so welcome everybody to our webinar. My name is Eric Johnson. For those of you that don't know me, I'm sure that since you're here, you know me, but uh, those of you that are watching after the fact, my name is Eric Johnson. I am an instructor at the Academy of Real Estate in Boston. Um, I no longer live in Boston, but I do teach the whole online atelier program. So if you want to, um, if you want to research that or look into that, you can always go to ARA, ARA Boston. Um, dot com and you know look at our atelier program and everything so today the main focus is on um, traditional painting techniques and how materials have a very uh, big impact on the type of work or the type of marks or the general appearance of your paintings um, based on what you use and how you use it so I just wanted to thank Trakel um, for sponsoring this. That way, all of you can you know join in for free, and you know we can you know just uh, answer many of your questions and hopefully give you some new information that you haven't heard, perhaps some information that you have already heard. But overall, just um, just sharing information and just making sure that, um, to the best of my knowledge you know, proper factual information is just kind of free, freely um, presented. Any of you that are my follower on Facebook or, or my friend on Facebook or my follower on Instagram, um, I've probably answered many of your questions in the past before. And, you know, I'm, I'm a very big advocate of just being very open and, you know, sharing information. So as a gift for all of you, this link will also be put um, in the chat um, again, but I would like to give a gift of information to all of you, which is my collections, uh, my collection of books on painting written by painters. So in the chat, you're going to see a link for uh, my collection of art books. It's about two to 300 PDFs of books on painting written by painters. We've, we're talking watercolor painting, art history, art conservation, um, you name it. You're going to find enough reading material in that to last you for the next 10 or 20 years. So please enjoy that, um, that list of books. You're welcome to share that with whomever you, whomever you want. Um, this is all just in the spirit of giving. So please, en please enjoy that. So um, I, I would just like to take a moment. We've got, um, we've got, uh, We've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to try to um, just start off with kind of a little bit of my story and how I came to use Trakel and kind of why I use Trakel. So I uh, I essentially I essentially um, came to Boston to study. I was originally self-taught, and then I I, I realized that I just kind of hit a plateau. I there was just things that I didn't know that I didn't know. Um, I, ended up, I ended up getting awarded a scholarship to study at the Academy of Real Estate Boston, which I'm now one of the main instructors at. But in my duration there, I, 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 I fell through many rabbit holes of, you know, kind of obsessing about materials. There's kind of no denial that the, here, let me, uh, Bliss, do me a favor, spotlight me for me. All right, so thank you. Um, so there's no denial that when you go to the museum and you look at the old master's paintings, that there's just that little something that's missing from modern paintings, right? There's just a specific look or there's just a certain depth and quality to the old master's work that's really hard to see in our modern paintings. A big part of that comes down to what what their materials were and what they were using. When I was studying as a, when I was a student, that was one of my main obsessions. So I went through years of making my own pigments, making my own brushes, making my own paint, priming my linen, just about everything um, besides, you know, getting a loom and having like a field of, you know, flax to make, <laughs> to, to weave my own. But I spent years obsessing about materials and I feel that I've learned a lot from just that obsession. Now, there's nothing worse than spending a kind of a ridiculous amount of money for, you know, something that essentially gets kind of thrown away or, or lost or damaged. For example, for me, I, I was just, you know, little old me, I was, um, I didn't, I had to work three jobs just to continue being a student. 
And I couldn't really afford, you know, like is be, you know, 60, 70, $120 paint brushes all the time. Um, once, you know, once I got later in the Atelier program, I was actually introduced to Trakel by one of the other main instructors and the assistant director, Julie Beck. Check out her work if you don't know who she is, Julie B. Creative on Instagram. Um, she introduced me to this, this company that I had never really heard of, which was Trakel, um, Trakel Art Supplies. And she actually gave me some of the brushes and they were like the best brushes. And I was asking her, you know, how much are these going to be? And she, she told me a, a, a price point that I was like, I don't, I don't believe it. And sure enough, I went to the website and all of the brushes were, you know, relatively affordable. I mean, they, they all were at a perfect price point for me where who wants to spend, um, you know, $80 on a brush, who wants to spend $120 on a brush or even, you know, $65 on a brush. So all the brushes were like at, at an incredible price point. And I was, you know, honestly suspicious, like, am I going to get them and all the hairs are going to fall out? And to my surprise, they were the best brushes I've ever used. I've never experienced hairs, hairs falling out. And, you know, there's just a, a nice variety of um, brushes for me to choose from. So I could do, you know, a variety of different effects by just pretty much using one company. I liked Trakel so much that before I was a pro team member, I was still just kind of exclusively using Trakel um, brushes. And I'm very fortunate and thank you. Um, that I'm now a pro team member. That way, you know, I can kind of share, share the love and, um, you know, you know, kind of just use Trakel because that's all I, all I used before anyway. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful for that. So if you've never tried Trakel, I, I, I highly recommend giving some of them, giving some of them a try out. I'm going to go over what brushes I prefer. So I don't use all of the, all, I don't use personally use all of the Trakel um, uh, brushes, but there are a, a few series that I really prefer. And that's what essentially what we're going to do. And we're going to go over making some paint and, um, showing you what some of the different marks you can make with them. So, um, as I finished my studies, I became uh, a main instructor and, um, I, I pretty much, you know, this is, this is pretty much what I do. I just try to, um, share information to the best of my knowledge. Those of you, um, that may have bits of knowledge that you feel are more than I am presenting, or if some of the things that I'm saying aren't entirely accurate based on your research, um, that's great. I would love to see, I would love to receive messages from you. I'd love to get your emails or just message me and just let me know what you know, because I think that, you know, in the spirit of giving and, you know, uh, there's there comes an amalgamation of all of our information coming together. That way we as an entity of artists can make paintings that last the test of time. So we don't wanna make paintings that aren't going to last, um, you know, for our great, 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 great grandchildren. Ideally, all of our paintings can last for hundreds of years that way, you know, in the same way that we look back on the Renaissance 300 years from now, artists can also be looking back on our work as, as well. So I'm gonna talk a lot about the materials and making sure that what we do is sound as far as that is concerned. Um, I wanted to, um, I want to change the mic over to um, Bliss. Can you spotlight the um, spotlight, Courtney? It's called Trakel Trakel Art Supplies. Okay. Trakel Art Supplies. One sec. And then I just. There we go. Just gonna. You and oh, I got it. You got it. I'm just going to reclaim the host and spotlight you. Okay. Morning, everybody. How are you all doing? Thanks, uh, Eric, for doing this. This was all Eric's idea. Everybody, he approached us and basically just said he wanted to host a webinar. So we were totally on board and excited about that. So um, we want to thank you again, Eric. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to say hello to everybody. Just like Eric said, I know you guys have a ton to go over, so I will not take up very much time. Uh, basically, our goal here at Trakel is what Eric had already mentioned, just having really good art supplies at an affordable price. Uh, we've seen it out there where there's just, you know, I don't understand how they can mark up prices so high on supplies when 
I see how much it costs, you know, on on the on our end. But I think that the fact that we're not in a lot of our supply stores, it definitely makes it easier for us to keep our prices low. So unfortunately, it's not as accessible to everybody to walk into a Blick or a Jerry's or a Michael's and not have our product there. But if we were to get into those stores, that's when you will see probably a hefty uh, price increase because of the discounting that they want and everything that goes along with it. That's where those high prices do come from. So. Um, just please be patient with us while we do all this online. We are going to try to get uh, available in other countries because we know that the international shipping and the fees are, you know, astronomical. So we are trying to get out there to everybody. Um, so, yeah, thank you again. And Eric, I'm not sure if you have any specific questions you want me to answer if anybody um, that's attending. Courtney, I have a quick question for you. Is there international shipping available for the brush set? There is, but it unfortunately is really costly right now. We're only offering the expedited services and they um, are actually getting delayed right now. We're not sure why. We've had three international customers email us and saying that they're not getting their packages. And I'm not sure if it's due to the shortage we're having right now because of uh, the Omicron variant that's going around, but it is available, but it does cost a lot of money. Thank you. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention was that one random attendee um, will be selected for a Trickell prize package. So uh, please, if you can, stay till the for the duration of the um, webinar, and we will announce that towards the end. So the prize package is going to include um, the Eric Johnson brush set, which is um, the Trickell linseed oil soap. Turkel Brush Restore, a palette knife, and a quadruple oil prime linen, which is the Cadillac of surfaces for you to paint on. It's just so good. It's my all-time favorite. So um, a early congratulations to the one lucky winner that is going to get that. Um, so I just want to take just a moment to speak a little bit about the, um, the main lineup of the brushes. So the the anatomy of the brush, we obviously have the, we have the handle, we have the metal piece here, which is the ferrule, and then we of course have the fibers. So the majority of all of the brushes at Trakel are a nylon, um, are a nylon, um, uh, what would I call it, a filament, or I'll just say hair. Um, so the main difference between the, let's say, the Opal and the Spectrum line brushes or the Golden Tacbon is essentially the diameter and the smoothness or whether or not there are divots in the actual hair. From what I know about the Sienna brushes, which are a, um, a synthetic um, red sable, they won't tell us exactly what the, um, the hair is made out of. But with that being said, um, they, they have a very, very similar feel to actually um, real sable. What I wanted to do is just share some, um, share some photos of what, um, let's say, sable hair looks like under, an, under a microscope. So natural hair has these divots in it, sometimes jagged or um, almost scaled in a way. So in the processing of the different fibers, they can put some of those divots to mimic the feel of natural hair, or they can leave it completely smooth. For example, the spectrum brushes have, you know, none of those divots are and, and are an extremely smooth um, fiber. This is actual, um, this is actual sable hair. So I just wanted to show you, you know, exactly what, um, this is, you know, the Alaskan fur project, I think. But this is, you know, what you would expect from a natural hair under a microscope. The nylon hair is, you know, similar, but it's going to be, you know, the diameter and how smooth or how rough those fibers are. As you can imagine, a very smooth fiber or a very smooth hair is going to allow you to do generally smoother um, laying down of paint as well. So that's one of the reasons why I personally like the spectrum brushes for more of that kind of really smooth, detailed work as opposed to, let's say, the opal brush, which is a, a synthetic hog bristle. Hog bristle also has lots of those grooves in it and is very wiry and thick as well. So I prefer the opal brushes because they don't they have the, you know, a greater strength that the natural hog bristle doesn't. The best hog bristle brush in the world is still going to shed all, uh, it's still going to break 
and leave, you know, shed lots of hair in your um, painting, which is kind of a nuisance. I've never had that happen with a synthetic hog bristle. And I'm a snob. I'm like the biggest snob that you might meet when it comes to paint and brushes. And I was all about natural haired brushes, natural haired brushes, until I started experimenting with more of the synthetics. And I, to tell you the honest truth, like I use pretty much more synthetics than natural hair these days, especially um, the Sienna or the synthetic hog or the synthetic um, red sable and the opal, the synthetic hog bristle. I mean, those are two of my, you know, big go-tos with all of the other brushes kind of um, filling in the gaps of what those brushes will do. So I just want to, Bliss, I'm gonna make you the host once again. I just want to ask um, Bliss, is there any, any um, questions or anything in the chat that you might want to give to me? Yep. Um, so one of the um, one of the questions was, do we still offer the cradled um, panels through Trequile, or are those no longer available? The cradle. Uh, we are, yeah, we're working on uh, stocking those again. Uh, we did have a shortage of supplies and employees and our wood shop has just been overwhelmed. So we took those off for now, but we will be slowly reintroducing the raw cradled birch panels again. Oh, great. Thank you. Great. Any more? Are you going to be doing a demo? Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. About, about uh, the different techniques with the brushes. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. So to just give you an idea of the way that this is going to, the way that this is going to go. So I generally essentially reserve the first hour for this type of talk, but what I think we're going to do is we're not going to take a whole hour for it, but we're going to jump, um, we're just going to start moving things forward. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to give a PowerPoint presentation. We're going to talk a lot about um, techniques and the materials that would have been used to achieve those looks or those techniques. And then um, before our lunch, lunch time, um, I'm going to show you exactly how the old masters would have made their paint. I've got some genuine rose matter that we're going to mull up. And we're going to go over some of the different uh, panels that Trakel offers and or the surfaces or substrates, as well as the type of marks that each of the brushes are going to make on it. That way you can uh, make a better choice um, if you a don't have a lot of experience, or if you do have a lot of experience and are looking for something very specific in particular, um, so I'm going to go over exactly what the difference in rheology of you know paint that is commercially made compared to handmade, um, as well as just go over some of you know what those um, brush marks, um, brush what the different brushes will do, what I like them for in each stage. And then, you know, we may be able to get the painted demo started before lunch. Um, that's my goal. And right now it looks like we're pretty doing pretty good on time so far. So yes, the last three hours and what I'm expecting more so the last four hours of the webinar is going to be all painted demo. And Eric, uh, one more thing that I forgot to mention when I was talking, uh, uh, Alyssa, our marketing expert, will be sending an email out to everybody who has signed up for this webinar after it is over. So you guys will have all the links that we're already including in the chat. Those will be sent out again. All the brushes Eric's discussing, his brush set, the panels he's talking about, the books he's talking about, everything will be in that follow-up email. So if you miss something, don't worry, you will be getting that information once this is over. Thank you. Thank you. As well as the video too. For those of you that have come in, I'm new. Everything is going to be recorded and, you know, we are going to send out that video as well. Any other questions before we move on? All righty. Well, let's get Not to at the it. moment. Just one moment. Here we go. All righty. So one of the things that I wanted to take a moment and talk about is some of the fundamentals of oil painting. I am primarily an oil painter, so forgive 
me, for all of you, you know, primary, primarily watercolor and acrylic artists, many of these things can apply, but um, we are going to primarily be talking and discussing more so about traditional oil painting because um, that, um, that's my area of focus. And um, there obviously was an acrylic painting in the Renaissance. So these are a couple of paintings, obviously, of myself. And um, for those of you that don't know, this is Beatrice. This is my, this is, this is my daughter, um, the most regal baby ever. Mm. So whenever starting a painting, um, you might be familiar with this term. It's called an imprimatura. Um, there's also a campitura. So what an imprimatura is, it's essentially staining the surface. So there are a handful of surfaces that you can use to paint on. You can paint on you know, a wood substrate. You can paint on stretched canvas, stretched linen. Um, you can paint on marble, stone. Um, you can prime the wood panel. I mean, there's many, many, many different surfaces to paint on. An ideal surface is a rigid one. So panel, panels are always going to be superior to stretched linen or stretched canvas. Stretched linen is going to be superior to stretched canvas because canvas or cotton is more, more absorbent, which means it will experience more atmospheric changes um, due to heat and humidity, relative humidity, how much moisture is in the air. So a panel is going to be a superior surface, which is going to result in less mechanical failures or cracking in your painting. So as you know, storms pass, your, your surface will swell and shrink. My preference for panel or my preference for um, surface to paint on is oil primed linen or an oil ground on an ACM panel. That stands for aluminum composite material. That is by far um, my favorite uh, surface to paint on because it does not fluctuate with changes in humidity and heat in the same way that stretch canvas will or that even wood will. If you do choose to paint on some wooden substrate, um, I think it's a very good idea for you to at least seal all sides. So if you are buying one of the Trakel panels, um, there's lots of great shapes from the Gothic um, shapes to you know, Halloween, there's the Gore store. There's heart panels out right now in, you know, in time for uh, Valentine's Day, if you wanna pick one up, that way you can do one for your you know, significant other, that would be great. My recommendation is to um, at least seal all sides and that will stop it or at least minimize it from swelling and shrinking. Regarding your ground or the primer, in other words, it's very important that your ground, if you are preparing it, needs to be white. A white ground is, you know, your ground acts like a mirror. It sends light back through each layer of the paint. So if you use a very dark ground, the ground, remember, is the white primer. We're not talking about the imprimatur or the stain on that white. The white primer underneath, if you darken that, the color and the value of that is going to devour all of your beautiful color on top in the course of time. So as your paint ages, it becomes more transparent, yellow, and darker. So when doing an imprimatura, my main recommendation is to A, add a tiny bit of stand oil or vacuum body linseed oil, and to apply it in a stain-like manner. That would be an imprimatura. You may use a little bit of OMS turpentine or mineral spirits or your lavender spike oil, that's okay. Just do it in a well-ventilated area. I do not like the use of any um, solvents at all. I try to keep them completely out of my studio. I don't use them in my major painting process. Only for doing this initial stain will I use a little bit of that OMS to A, wipe down or what is traditionally called degreasing uh, the surface and applying the paint while the while the OMS or turpentine is still evaporating. And that will allow me to get a very thin film. Try to avoid using too much odorless mineral spirits or turpentine or um, uh, solvent, because if you do decrease the viscosity of your paint too much, it will start to chalk a bit, which means you know there's not none of that um, oil surrounding the pigment, which can make it seem like it never dries. So. Mineral spirits doesn't actually destroy the oil. It just decreases the viscosity of it. So um, 
the when you used a ton of mineral spirits or some solvent, you actually cause the oil to get sucked into the substrate more. So with that, with that being said, there are a variety of different um, types of priming that you can use for your panel. So what I wanted to do is just show a few of them. These are the panels, or these are the type of surfaces that you can get from Trakel. So the very first one that I'm going to bring up is obviously the raw, which is this, this is just the ACM panel. So this is, this is a solid um, polyethylene core. Um, it's, it's essentially a plastic core. This is what sign, sign makers, you can usually find, um, you know, ACM has come from like the sign making um, businesses, but it essentially is two skins of aluminum. And then there's a, there's a coating on it. That coating can be scratched and a painting can be adhered to it. So for example, you can have a painting that you have done um, on stretch linen and then adhere it with some pH neutral glue, like a polyvinyl acetate. So you can get the raw, you can prime these yourself. Um, you can adhere your own linen to it or your own canvas to it, or you can just use something like a, um, one of Williamsburg's um, lead oil grounds or Gamblin's um, oil ground, whatever, whatever company you choose to use, you can just use an oil ground. My preference is an oil ground as opposed to an acrylic one. Um, with that being said, we also have for you acrylic painters, acrylic primed linen. Linen is always gonna be superior to the cotton. So you can have the ACM panel with acrylic primed linen. One of the things that I really like about the ACM panels, especially um, once you do a painting on it, sometimes you've got a painting that doesn't really quite make the size. Those of you that are familiar with painting, sometimes you do a painting on a stretch canvas and then you realize that your composition wasn't exactly what you wanted or that your image is just a little bit too small for the entire side. Then you have to unstretch it, restretch it. That sometimes happens to me. Um, and I'm, I'm essentially okay with that because I can take a just a, a box cutter and a straight edge and actually score this and it will just break. It'll just pop and, and with a perfect cut edge and line. So you can actually decrease the size of any of the panels that you have um, on ACM or any of the linen that you have on ACM. So that's a really beneficial thing about using the ACM in my opinion. Now. Here we've got a few others. For those of you, you those of you watercolor painters, we also have um, watercolor paper on ACM on ACM panel too. Um, this I personally am not great at watercolor. I envy all of you that are, um, but I prefer to use ink on this, and I really like just the ACM ACM panel because it's really light, and I can store a ton of these paintings with very little space. Um, now we're on to the choices for oil primed linen. If you're an oil painter, I would highly recommend you actually use an oil primed linen. Um, acrylic primed linens are going to be more absorbent, which are going to lead to more sinking in. Those of you who do relatively dark paintings probably have butt up against the problems of sinking in. And you're like, what is happening? Why are all of my beautiful, dark, rich, high chromid colors becoming matte finish? The main reason that's happening is because that oil is getting sucked into your substrate or your ground. So if you're using a wooden substrate, that's going to be more absorbent than a metal substrate. If you're using an oil primed linen, that's going to be less absorbent than a acrylic primed linen. If you're using cotton, that's more absorbent than linen. Linen is less absorbent. So we're getting to you know what we feel is the most superior uh, surface for oil painting in general, in my opinion. And that's why I say the quadruple oil primed linen is like the Cadillac. It's not lead primed. So we do have a lead primed linen. Now lead absorbs very little oil, which means the amount of sinking in is going to be least on the lead primed linen. This is a very fine portrait grade, which is also really nice, which I like. Both of these linens um, are going to be similar in texture. So the lead primed linen is going to be a little bit rougher than the quadruple oil primed. And then just the regular oil primed linen is going to be a little bit rougher than that. I believe this is the Clausen's number 13 portrait grade, which is a great standard for, you know, just about paint, painting about anything in general. 
Um, so I always like to have these three on hand. And then there's also the, um, the oil primed, which I seem to have misplaced. Maybe it's because I've been using it. I actually think that here, here, here we go. I'll grab, I'll grab a little painting of Beatrice. Um, this is on the, um, this is on the oil primed ACM panel. So this doesn't have linen on it, but this has, I believe it's Gamblin's oil ground that's rolled onto it with a high density foam roller, which gives it a slight eggshell texture, um, which is great because you really don't want to paint on a surface that is extremely, extremely smooth. If you're painting on a surface that is unbelievably smooth, you will experience more cracking. So one of the main reasons that we want to have an Imprimatura is we want to cover up some of that stark white. There's an optical illusion called simultaneous contrast, which will make a value or a color look different based on what is surrounding it. Um, I will illustrate. If I were to take, let's say, just this gray block here, and here I'll do it. I'll do it like, I'll do it like this. If I were to take this gray block here, look at the value of it compared to when I take and surround it with black. As you can see, the value looks brighter when it's surrounded by that black. So when you paint on a white linen or white surface in general, the value, all the values that you do are going to look darker than they rightfully are. It's not till you get the rest of the values on the piece that you see that all of your values are a little too light and you've probably added too much white into the mixtures. Having said that, painting on a white surface is actually very good for the longevity of your piece because of that paint becoming more transparent over time. So as you increase your mastery and proficiency in paint, I actually like painting on white canvas um, if I can. But um, if you do do an imprimatura, you want to make sure that it's fairly light. Avoid making very dark imprimaturas for the same reason why you would avoid a dark um, ground. A, a sister to in, in, an imprimatur is a campitura. Campitura is essentially going to be more of an opaque. So if we were to take this, which is essentially raw umber stretched thinly, if we were to mix something like titanium white or some opaque colors and you know actually do a full layer of paint on it, that we could consider more of a campitura. Eric, you've got some great questions in the chat. Sure. Let me know when you're ready for them. I'm ready. Okay. What grade of sandpaper would you use to sand the ACM panel before applying the ground? Something rough. Above 300 is what I would use. Um, I mean, I'm sorry. Below 300 is what I would use. So 120, um, 220, you know, 200, you know, something, you know, maybe even 80. Something that's going to scratch it up enough to let the glue or you know the primer kind of grip and hold on to it just a bit better. Well, cool. how do you replace the use of solvents without having the paints dry forever? How impatient are you? Um, that's <laughs> my that's my question. Is if you're working on one painting and you're just twiddling your thumbs until it's done, I mean, my recommendation is to work on more paintings. That way, while one's drying, the others can be um, something that you work on. So the other thing is. You should prob, so mineral spirits is going to decrease the volume of the oil relative to the pigment to a degree because it will help the oil get sucked into the lower layers, which is going to cause you to experience the appearance of it drying. Um, but that's primarily because more of that oil is getting sucked into the substrate. So the oil is taking the same amount of time to dry. It's just not drying on the surface of the painting. It's drying inside the painting. Um, so this, the, when we do the demo, I'm going to go over fixing the viscosity of the paint, which will make it to where you don't need to use mineral spirits. You shouldn't use it. It's very bad for your health. Um, like go to Wikipedia, type in odorless mineral spirits or turpentine and read the side effects, read the toxicity of it. And you ask yourself if you would, you know, open up a can of that and sit your child or sit in a room for six hours and let them breathe that in. Close to guarantee you wouldn't. Um, yet many of us have spent years just sitting there with an open pot of mineral spirits right in our face, just inhaling all of the fumes. If you have a very long period of working, be it lavender spike oil, 
um, turpentine or um, mineral spirits can somewhat have a scratchy, dry, sore throat at the end of a very long day of working, especially if you're doing using lots of that mineral spirits. So, I mean, it's really, really not good for you. Nervous system, nervous system damage. I mean, we're talking like real problems. Um, so whatever you have to do to not um, damage yourself is, is fine. Plus the old masters didn't have it. Mineral spirits is a byproduct of crude oil. Um, in the past, they only really used turpentine to dissolve the resins for varnishes. So they didn't use it as a, you know, a fundamental part of their working process. So um, I'll go over more of that later. Any other Great, I got one. I got one more for you. What is the function of the pH neutral glue or PVA? Um, that is to adhere it to the panel. Um, that is not necessarily the size. So if you are adhering the, if you're adhering the linen to the panel, the back of the linen or cotton is unsized. It's not, it doesn't have any coating protecting it. So if there's acidity, it will disintegrate the fibers of the linen and then your whole painting just disintegrates with it. So that's why it has to be pH neutral. If your linen is not, um, if you have a raw linen or raw canvas, you would want to size it. Um, recent research has led me to the conclusion that a PVA isn't the best um, size for uh, linen. There are other acrylic based um, polymers that you can use to size the, um, that you can use to size, you know, your linen your linen or your canvas. Um, but that's just gonna just it's gonna take a little bit of research. And I don't want to get too lost in um, too lost in that because you'll lose me on a whole tangent. <laughs> so let's let's move on to more techniques. So let's just talk a little bit about underpainting. What you do in the beginning is going to have a very big impact on um, what the end result looks. Also, the grade or the roughness of your surface is also going to determine how it looks in the end. Um, this is an example of an underpainting that we do at the school. And, you know, from life, this was done from life in the figure room as a demo for um, some of my future students. Um, so this is what we call the extended dry brush. So the, there's only, um, this is on a smooth portrait grade linen. The only two pigments used in this are burnt umber and white. Um, the main objective here is to obviously move from general to particular and to get the appearance of a cool value in the underpainting by applying a more opaque and brighter color over a darker one. So as you can see, the belly here has been darkened. Um, and it is fairly warm because my only pigment is burnt umber. But as I scumble that white over it, it takes on a very, oops, sorry. Um, it takes on a very bluish tinge to it. That's an important lesson for you to learn. You can do that even for your underpaintings if you were to put you know, full color on top of this as well. But each of these are allowed to dry in between layers. Um, there are so many ways to do an underpainting. There's so many different um, colors that you can use for an imprimatura. If you want to have an older world look, you can use a more yellowish, umbery, earth tone hue. If you want a bit more of a modern look, you can even use this, which is a violet hematite, which is an um, which is essentially iron, an iron oxide or iron ore pigment that leans um, towards the violet. Um, we can do the underpainting with just the uh, with just the earth tone that we essentially used for the imprimatura. We could do the underpainting without going much darker, but just adding light. For example, here I did both. I did just the same pigment that I was using for the imprimatura and adding white to it in the light family alone. In this case, I only added white in the light family. Meanwhile, everything else I essentially painted after the fact um, and in a more direct manner, even though this would be technically considered an indirect painting. Here are some more examples of how underpaintings can influence what happens on top. Now, 
When you look at the painting of Beatrice here, you'll notice that there's a similarity in quality, but a slight difference in general appearance. One of the things that is interesting to know about the paintbrushes that the old masters had is that before the 19th century, the main or the only shape that they would have available to them was a round brush. So in this painting, I pretty much did this painting exclusively with the Sienna round brushes, the Spectrum round brushes, and the Golden Taclon round brushes, which gave me a variety of different softnesses. Um, I also used the um, opal um, primarily for the under layers. So in the earliest layers of a painting, especially those that have take on that semi scratchy look to it, I would typically use the opal round brushes. Um, that's one of my favorite ways to do a really large painting. And I've got a couple of videos that I'd like to share with you a little bit later, just showing how I would work on an eight foot painting with round brushes. Round brushes aren't synonymous with small. So I actually do prefer to use a lot of round brushes in, um, in the general way that I work. And that is directly related to what I see for, and what I've researched from medieval and Renaissance or old masters as a general term um, artist. This one, I was a bit more liberal with my use of softer filberts. Um, this takes on a, the one of Beatrice takes on a much more Dutch Flemish or even um, uh, we could consider it, you know, an Italian or Spanish 17th century method. I will say Dutch Flemish primarily because this would be a very similar method that you would see Rembrandt um, use. So an earth tone for the base or the umbra layer, that's just the raw umber, just using the earth tone to separate shadow and light umbra, be, meaning shadow. Um, the dead color, which is a colorless underpainting that can be sometimes synonymous, synonymously used um, when talking about a grisaille or a verdaccio, which is a green gray underpainting, which takes on the appearance of dead flesh. If you're thinking in more of an Italian um, 16th or 17th century way. Um, and then the overpainting, or as you know, many old um, treatises call it um, working up. So this is, you know, using much more direct paint working up. No, I'm not using a whole bunch of thin transparent layers because of the brightness of the white. It does take on a slight appearance of a glaze, but I am applying paint in a relatively direct manner, even when it is transparent. We'll talk a bit about glazing later as well. Now in a more um, neoclassical French way of working, um, you see artists like, uh, Jean-Léon Jérôme and Bouguereau, um, Charles Barg do full constructs, transfer those constructs onto their linen with you know, a method that we would call a paint transfer. And then that is essentially colored, it, colored in. The first layers would be considered the eboche or the dead color. That's the relatively flat tiling in a mosaic fashion of the general shapes, colors, and values. In this case, the entire red was painted a relatively flat color um, with some form on it, but um, a couple of layers of pure lead white was painted on top to increase the value is because the brightness of the cadmium red on the imprimatura is not going to be as vibrant as it would be over this very, very vibrant white. And that is why I recommend using a white canvas if you have the skill um, or proficiency with paint because your paintings will be relatively more vibrant because there's no um, brownish layer to interrupt the light that travels through those um, layers of paint. So on top of this, Thin layers of paint, paint are applied to that underpainting, which increase the value and also slightly increase the chromatic intensity. Here are a couple of other examples of underpainting. So in this Rembrandt master copy, you can see that I'm using lead white here. Now this is a lead white without a stabilizer. This is not necessarily stack lead white, which some of you are familiar with. 
Um, but this is just a regular lead white without stabilizers, which gives it a more fixotropic, soft, um, rounded feel as opposed to the very sharp, um, scratchy look of some cheap manufactured paint. For example, Windsor and Newton student grade paint is going to be a very scratchy, low tinting strength, low chroma color. And that's because of the stabilizers and additives in it. In this case, I'm using paint without stabilizers. Much of the paint when I did this was handmade. Um, here, I'm actually showing the brush that I'm using. Now, I got this on auction quite a few years ago. These are actually brushes from the 18th century. These are goose feral brushes that are wire tied. So um, before the day and age of having the metal ferrule, of course, the Industrial Revolution gave us lots of um, lots of great innovations for us as painters, such as the collapsible tube, which wasn't a thing before the 19th century. Before that, your brushes were typically wire tied, wax threads tied, or um, you know both, and in a goose um, goose feather ferrule. There's also crow. Um, crow, fer crow feather ferrules as well, but essentially just the, the goose feather cut. And that's what holds the round brush. Very convenient. And then that is essentially glued or tied onto a stick or a paint paintbrush as we would commonly say. So with this, the first layer is glaze. Um, I would put a glaze of black over the underpainting just to give a little bit more relief to the stark white underpainting. And then just gradually working up in a relatively direct manner. The Eboche, um, here's an example of a Bouguereau and a Jean-Léon Jérôme. Um, you can see the evidence of the paint transfer, the construct, which was pretty much worked out in a drawing media first, which is transferred onto a sandy colored linen, which in the 19th century, there were in you know Paris at the time, there were usually three to four um, colors of linen, oil prime linen that you could buy. One of them was a sandy color. Another was a maroonish color, kind of a reddish warm color. They're um, almost like a brown paper bag. Um, there was a gray and neutral gray, just like this. And then there was, you know, stark white. But you could essentially buy these pre-toned linens. And that's why you can see, you know, there's kind of a similarity in the areas that the paint has been stretched thinly for that eboche where, you know, everything's colored in in this washy manner first, first before paint is added in a more full bodied, opaque or direct manner. The first layer of that is going to be called dead color. We're gonna go over that too. Here's a Jacques-Louis David, um, where we can once again see the evidence of that paint transfer. Here we have another Bouguereau. Um, these both show the same evidence of that thin washy layer. In David's case, there's many times where he worked a bit more window shady or a little bit more piecemeal where he is working one thing to completion almost before moving on to the next area. It will go through the same kind of systematic beginning of this thin washy layer, but just like this, just like this Bouguereau, it's essentially taken to somewhat of a finish before the area is moved on. Um, in this Jerome, there's many, there's much more of an atmospheric concern. So of course that's handled more holistically. I would generally recommend working more holistically as opposed to finish as you go, but to each their own. That's the lovely part of, uh, about all of us having um, the choice to paint the way that we want to paint. This is just a way, um, but within that you can um, definitely choose. Here's an example that I've um, that I've done. This is you know a painting that I've done from life where my first initial layer is this very thin, um, low contrast example where I'm primarily just focusing on getting the general drawing, the general value and general color. And over multiple layers, I continue to add contrast, more opacity, and um, just work out the lighter and darker moments gradually. Um, so this is an example of you know, what it looks like in layer one and potentially layer three or four. Here's an example of a, um, a French neoclassical um, systematic way where here, once again, we have that Bosch. This was done, um, I did this when I was a student. I did this from life. Um, so in around this, we can see the evidence of that Bosch, um, that thin transparent layer of paint. But we can also see a, 
a kind of a lean towards a planar opacity. We would consider that more so the dead color. Now in the um, Dutch Flemish method, dead color would be much more considered that um, flat, uh, flat underpainting um, with just pure white or maybe white with a raw umber. In an Italian way, dead color could be considered like the Verdaccio, which is a greenish gray underpainting. In a French neoclassical perspective, dead color is a flat tiling or a flat massing in of the shapes and values and colors um, to unify an area under a specific shape, a specific value, a specific color, before further elaborating in the next stage, which is called first painting, which is strange because it's not the first time you paint touch the painting, um, but it's considered first painting. Um, that's when each of those large blocks of value and color are essentially broken down into smaller facets, smaller tiles um, in a uh, patchwork quilt or a mosaic fashion. Moving forward, we have the second painting, which is where we introduce um, in you know, French, it would be considered a couche. Um, some ateliers, our atelier, um, uh, describe second painting in a couch. So you can use couch and couche um, somewhat synonymously. In French, it essentially means to lay down. Um, uh, the main objective is it, in it is to apply a transparent veil of paint and to work into that to unify and um, seam the forms. So not everything necessarily needs to be second painted, um, but it does give a really nice unifying um, layer of paint. You could put it in a almost subcategory as of glazing. Glazing is a very kind of interesting topic that we'll talk a little bit more about once we go into mixing some of the colors. But um, that's essentially the French neoclassical or essentially the one of the modern atelier methods of painting if we're thinking about um, a more European atelier as opposed to let's say a Russian um, academic one. Um, I wanna show just some examples of Adachio. So sometimes you go into the museum and you'll see um, these old icons and religious paintings. And you probably wonder, it's like, why is everybody green? Um, that's primarily because uh, the paintings have been cleaned, um, unvarnished over many hundred years, many hundreds of years. And that's essentially stripping off the very transparent glazes on top. And it's revealing the Verdaccio or the green gray underpainting. Here we have an unfinished Michelangelo where you can see him employing the greenish gray underpainting um, and that, you know, we can see figures at different levels of development. We can also see the presence of that under drawing or that preparatory sketch existing and being filled in. So it's not safe to say that only one century or only one region painted in a specific way, but they all kind of borrow from each other. We as people like to kind of categorize, uh, but essentially, you know, you'll see lots of cross pollination through many of these techniques. One thing to not do is that. You'll see lots of information on the internet um, of, of, you know, that Vermeer and, you know, Aang, you know, doing Verdaccio or, you know, don't do this. If you're gonna do a Verdaccio, do that. He's, don't make everything blackish and greenish. Um, I, I, you don't really see that in history. Um, if you feel that, if you feel that you want to use a specific type of underpainting, my recommendation is to have a purpose or a reason why. No reason to make the blue lean green. Um, there's definitely a reason to use a Verdaccio for a green fabric. There's definitely a reason to use Verdaccio for Caucasian flesh tone, which is generally red. So that acts as a complement to that. I would avoid using a Verdaccio for, let's say, everything. Um, I think that it's better to use it in pieces and to keep the level of green somewhat subdued in the same way that I would not recommend using an extremely vibrant imprimatur, extremely high chroma one, because that color is going to come forward over the course of time. So if it's a little more neutral, a little bit less chromatic, it's going to be more sympathetic as your painting ages. Grisaille, there's so many ways to do a grisaille. The very first underpainting I had shown you, that could have been considered a grisaille. So a grisaille can just be, you know, just like the umber 
um, umber and the the light value, it can be a grisaille in the typical way that we think of, you know, mixing, you know, essentially I'm going to say a neutral black and white, the way that we make a neutral at the school is black raw umber and um, lead white, more or less of that lead white. The raw umber acts as a neutralizer to the bluish tinge of the bone black or commonly known as ivory black. This is an example from, I believe, AR ARA Toronto, um, kind of an exposition on how um, Caravaggio would have worked where he would have just used pure white to pretty much heighten those areas in the light family. You saw me do something very similar in one of those commission portraits in the underpainting section. Now you can you you can do many 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 different ways to you know do a relatively colorless underpainting. Um, you can do that for the um, impact of the colors on top, just like we were talking about before. A lighter color underneath is going to accentuate the chroma and value of the color that you put on top. Um, this is my example of an underpainting for Rembrandt. This is one that I can't remember who did it, but adding in this extra blue is by far too much and something you would not have seen done um, by Rembrandt in particular. Also, things like the shadows um, were usually left the tone in the same way that the shadows are left the kind of tone here. The shadows are essentially left the tone here. Um, you don't always see the shadows painted very opaquely in a more Italian painting. You do sometimes do, but in, you know, especially in Dutch Flemish painting, um, you know, Rembrandt in particular, I'll say um, uh, Vermeer also, you'll see a little bit less of that full opacity in the shadows, especially around the lips and everything. So you can kind of take that, um, take that as you will. Um, moving on. Here's an example of a grisaille or an underpainting from a Peter Paul Rubens and, you know, compare that to the fully um, rendered painting. So as you can see, the shadows are left somewhat of that kind of imprimatura, that um, umbery tone. Meanwhile, there's a bit of opacity in the light family. In Rubens' case, it would have been, the main pigments would have been lead white and raw umber. Here we've got this painting of Jesus, which is just a wonderfully idealistic flesh tone. Um, where he's using all of the um, neutral grays, which would have looked like this, um, to act as those cool half tones. So in this case, the, the underpainting would have looked almost identical, but because there are greater warmths from the overpainting, um, successive, successive direct painting or glazing on top, it does make those halftones look bluer or cooler. There's also the introduction of higher degrees of warmth or red inside the shadow shape. So earlier I was talking a bit about the grammar of coloring. If you are painting in a direct, um, if you are painting in a north light studio as, a, as opposed to like a direct light or like an incandescent bulb, if you're painting in a north light studio, north window, you're getting your light primarily from the blue, um, the blue sky, which provides a very cool light. So whenever you have a cool light, generally speaking, your shadows are gonna be relatively warm. So in this case, we can see that the shadows are all pushed relatively redder or relatively warmer. Meanwhile, the half tones are relatively cool. A pattern develops in this grammar of coloring of warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool. If any of you have daylight right now and it's bright and sunny, go to your window and look outside. The fireball in the sky known as the sun provides an unbelievable amount of warmth. Um, and that is a warm light as well. So if you look at how warm, let's say a colorless sidewalk is compared to a shadow on that sidewalk, you will notice that the shadows in the sidewalk are very bluish, very violet. Meanwhile, in the light family, it's going to be much warmer or oranger. There's also using grisaille as, you know, a means to an end. Um, in other words, creating a strict value piece. Um, this is a painting, a grisaille painting that I did um, um, as a demo from this cast. So this is essentially taking a, a, a draftsman way of thinking or a, you know, almost like a drawing, just stripping all the color out of the situation and simply um, creating the most realistic painting in just black and white or just value. 
This, we have a V-Bear painting. This is in the Fogg or the Harvard Museum in Boston. Um, a speck of color wouldn't, wouldn't have helped this painting. This painting is just, just phenomenal all by itself as a value piece. And it's fairly a big painting. This is, um, I think, one of the best examples in history of a grisaille being used as you know, the end result of just using the full value range of the lightest and darkest pigments. Our black is among the darkest and our white is obviously among the lightest. And that's going to give us the greatest value range, which will allow us to be incredibly more descriptive with all of the forms and light effect. So that's a V bear. So I just wanted to just go over some of the you know old masters limitations. Obviously, we've got lead white. Um, I prefer to use lead white. If you are using lead, it does require a level of respect. Obviously, lead pigment is um, toxic. So treat it with respect. If you are a messy painter, wear gloves. If you have small children, lock your studio, keep them out. I have a locked case that I keep all of my pigments, all of my paints, and I'm very, very clean because the high majority of my paint is very toxic. So no, that means no eating, no smoking with paint on your hands, things like that. So when you are using these toxic pigments, you do have to treat them with a very high level of respect. Uh, basic lead carbonate, lead white is relatively more transparent and relatively larger particle size than let's say your titanium white. This means um, it's also going to be a little bit warmer uh, because of that transparency. transparency. Um, the, the color does not have nearly as much of an impact on your mixtures. So if you've ever experienced your colors getting chalky, um, that's because uh, you've added too much white into it. So lead white will certainly make your colors chalky, just not nearly as aggressively as let's say your extremely opaque, high tinting strength titanium white will be. It is also a very reactive pigment, which means um, the lead, the pigment itself has, um, you know, metallic soaps, which act like cicatives in the same way that raw umber or burnt umber have manganese. Um, present because it's an impure mixture of, you know, soil, iron oxide, stained um, clay with, you know, manganese present, which that manganese acts as a siccative, which is a, pretty much a way to say it expedites or speeds up the drying time of our oils, our vegetable oils, which are drying oils primarily. Later, we'll talk a little bit more about the oils. This is the way that you would make stack lead white. So the Dutch process known as, you know, the stack process, you essentially take um, lead, lead coils and expose them to an environment very rich in acidity. Um, for example, in, you know, the, um, in the olden days, it would be, be spoiled wine or vinegar. Um, and then it would be those uh, that would be essentially floating with, you know, vinegar would be on the inside, oops, um, inside of these pots that would uh, corrode the lead coils, turning them into lead acetate. Um, and then the present carbon dioxide from the decomposition of horse manure um, would cause the lead acetate to carbonize into, you know, our basic lead carbonate that we have. The main difference between commercially made lead white and uh, stack lead white is a variation in particle size, which, um, which essentially is going to change the working properties, making it more thixotropic. Um, which, which essentially um, the, the paint can have a bit more of a stiff sculptural feel on when it's left alone, but when you manipulate it, it becomes much more fluid. So its viscosity seems to decrease when you agitate it. Kind of like a mud pie when you were a child, if you went to the beach. Here's some examples of paintings where lead white are, is put in. Many times I have students say, well, um, why not use titanium white? I need to get whiter. I need to get brighter. And my constant retort is um, only a few thousand years of painting. They didn't have titanium white and they couldn't get that much brighter. Um, if you're that eager to make the values that much brighter to use titanium, um, there may be a more important issue is that all of your values might not be dark enough, making your lead white, even when you've toned it down, not look luminous and bright. Another color is yellow ochre. Um, we can group this with yellow ochre, red ochre. 
Um, this is a this is another iron oxide stained clay. This yellow ochre is hydrated iron oxide. You can essentially see where there were moments of wetness um, when this was more of a bog. Of course, yellow ochre used to be cons um, was sometimes commonly known as bog iron. Um, so you can see moments of drought where it's redder. Of course, at the top here, um, it's going to be much warmer. So you can take yellow ochre and dehydrate it and make it into a red ochre by taking a blowtorch to it or just calcining it or heating it, which is essentially dehydrating it. Now, I'm not a huge fan of calcined clay-based pigments. That means burnt umber, um, burnt yellow ochre, burnt sienna, because clay is very hygroscopic, meaning it's it has a certain affinity for water or atmospheric moisture, and it will get that moisture back through the air and it will get it through the painting or when it, when your paint is actually um, dried on there. And that can cause the paint to swell and crack. So I'm not a huge fan of calcine clay based pigments because they're just so absorbent um, or very hygroscopic. Here's some examples of you know the qualities of um, paint without stabilizers, that yellow ochre and also um, that lead white. So I usually like to say, you know, with a big question mark, you know, and uh, over, uh, over Rembrandt's face saying glaze, because most people, you know, you read online that, oh, Rembrandt glaze, Rembrandt glaze. And then when you look at a Rembrandt up close and, and personal, you realize that, yes, there are obvious moments of glazing, but there's also a lot more direct paint of just taking the actual color and applying it down. And you can see, um, in this case, it appears to be his um, neutral gray tone, Campitura, Imprimatura, or um, Rembrandt was also known for toning his ground, which is kind of a big no-no if you want the colors in your paintings to last. The darker, um, for example, the later years Rembrandt would tone his grounds, um, much darker grays, and that's why one of the main reasons why his paintings have a much darker feel. There's also just how he painted it, but those are just some examples. Um, here's an example of a Rembrandt, a Rubens, and a, um, a I'm sorry, a Rembrandt, a Rubens, and a Van Dyck. Um, same type of, exact same type of mixture, same type of grammar of coloring. Um, so we've got lots of lead white, we have lots of yellow ochre, and then we've got red earth pigments, which, which can be very similar to the composition of those yellow ochres, iron oxide based pigments, um, as well as vermilion, also known as cinnabar. So your cinnabar lacquer ginger jars, um, snuff bottles and boxes, you know, from China and Japan. Um, that, that's essentially the cinnabar mineral. If you did something bad enough um, in the Roman times, but not quite bad enough to get, you know, executed right on the spot, they'd send you to the Spanish um, um, cinnabar mine, which was pretty much um, a quick death sentence because um, it would, uh, the cinnabar mineral would sometimes sweat or have quicksilver mercury, um, which um, evaporates. Um, if you leave quicksilver mercury, you know, in, in open air, it will just eventually just kind of, you know, all turn to a gas. Um, that gas is usually considered methyl mercury. That's very, very dangerous. It will mess you up really bad and you will go in a very terrible way, like the first emperor of China, who's, you know, priests brought him, um, uh, you know, vats full of quicksilver mercury for him to look at his reflection over and breathe in all those methyl mercury fumes. So you'll go insane before you die. Um, with that being said, when the mercury is bound with sulfur, we have mercuric sulfide, also known as cinnabar or um, vermilion. That is, that does not pose the same danger as quicksilver mercury. Um, if you eat cinnabar vermilion, it is not um, not as I, I don't want to underscore or I don't want to undershoot the um, toxicity of it. But if you accidentally ingest some of the um, genuine vermilion or cinnabar, it's not your body's not going to absorb as much of it as let's say the lead white will because lead white is very susceptible to acids. Mercuric sulfide isn't quite as susceptible. So um, much of it will go to your kidneys, um, and your your liver, um, but that's only usually about two two percent, as opposed to the lead, which is going to um, you're going to absorb a lot more. 
with that being said, don't eat it. Um, don't handle the powdered pigment without proper ventilation, respirator, and, you know, schmuck and clothes and stuff that you kind of don't bring into your house. Here we have an Aang, we have a sergeant. One of the things that you've commonly seen done is um, underpaintings are done in vermilion, sometimes vermilion in an umber or vermilion in black, and then that is sometimes glazed over with a genuine rose matter or an alizarin crimson, rose matter being uh, what came before alizarin. Alizarin is the synthetic um, version of rose matter. Rose matter has um, a chemical in it called purpin, which is more rapidly fading as opposed to the dihydroxyanthoquinone, which is essentially the long name for alizarin crimson of the non-permanent variety. Um, it's a perfect segue into the matter. Um, matter root, this is once again, you know, one of those really common colors that you see in a lot of old masters paintings. A dye stuff is made depending on the uh, roots, how old they are, um, and what colorless salt that is being kind of affixed to. That you'll get, you know, a variety of different colors from brownish to more ruby red colors. Um, chemists like George Field um, perfected um, some of the uh, production of rose matter. Um, Windsor Newton still claims to be using George Field's recipe, and you can even look up the grammar of coloring by George Field and read some of his work on um, the pigments and kind of color theory that he was talking about. Um, here's a couple of other examples by Viber, that artist that did the um, grisaille. Viber was a very um, avid writer, especially on the um, kind of the science of painting. His book is actually called The Science of Painting. I recommend reading it. Just remember, whenever you read old treatises or old um, technical books on painting, it's important to read them with a small grain of salt and to support all of that with um, modern um, information about painting. For example, he um, believed in using a retouch varnish to, to pretty much remedy sinking in, which is a terrible idea because um, retouch varnish will essentially turn your painting to a puff pastry um, and it will lead your paintings much more susceptible to cracking. Don't use retouch varnish or any resins in your painting just in general. Um, but he loved to use, he loves to use reds, um, alizarin crimson um, in particular um, and rose, rose matter, you know, commonly known as well. Um, his paintings have survived very well, even though some of the things that he did weren't the most proper. Um, he was a very um, big advocate of using a white ground and painting on white as opposed to a colored ground. And that's one of the reasons why his paintings have aged so well, even after 150 years. Here's a couple of examples of the good and not good use of the rose matter. Here we have Franz Halls, who was a jolly drunk. Um, he was, um, he, they, he actually had most of his paintings confiscated because, because he owed, he would just borrow um, and he, he didn't pay the money um, that he owed on the, roll of on the rolls of linen that he painted on and eventually his paintings got confiscated. Um, funny story, but um, he was essentially a drunk. Um, he was an incredible direct painter. It's why John Singer Sargent idolized Franz Halls uh, more than any other painter with Velasquez being you know, his second idol. Um, Rembrandt, was a bit more of a tame painter. Um, Rembrandt used the rose matter more as a glaze, and sometimes, and you know, commonly, he would heighten um, some of his earth pigments with the rose matter, which would cause some some fading. Um, Franz Hals um, did that to kind of more extreme degrees, which is why we see Franz Hals' um, beautiful reds kind of washing out a bit more so than the Rembrandts. Um, you want to avoid using rose matter or synthetic alizarin with mineral-based pigments, especially those that are not calcined. So you can use rose matter or alizarin crimson with a, um, let's say a burnt umber, but you can't use it with a raw umber or a yellow ochre. Um, for some reason, it's got an odd relationship and it fades pretty rapidly. So Here's, you know, an example of an ang. Um, we've got examples of that underpaint. The thin transparent glazes are becoming more transparent in time and fading a bit. So I imagine this was much more ruby red and much more vibrant when it was painted. But even with that, it's still holding up pretty well. Um, we've got bone black or ivory black. This is calc calcined um, bone. 
Um, this is carbonized bone. So th these, uh, these bones are pretty much um, burnt in the complete absence of oxygen in a crucible of sorts. And that essentially causes it to um, carbonize into this black color as opposed to white bone ash. It's just like when you have a fire, if you have a fireplace, at the end of the night, there's always that big lump of charcoal, that piece of the wood that did not turn to white ash. And that's because the white ash snuffed out the oxygen. And then it, you know, essentially carbonizes. One thing that you want to keep in mind, um, you want to avoid using high carbon blacks like pure lamp black because high carbon blacks like this are pretty notoriously um, greasy colors and um, poor dryers. Lamp black is essentially um, burnt, um, burnt soot or it's the soot from burning um, some type of oil. So you, you don't want to use lamp black because it'll kind of never totally dry and it will um, lead to cracking and you know, plenty of other issues. Same thing, you want to avoid petroleum-based pigments like asphaltum. Um, so avoid high carbon blacks. Lamp black is so kind of, I'm sorry, bone black and ivory black are a little bit more susceptible to cracking. They are very slow drying. So if you do choose to use bone black or ivory black, um, add a tiny bit of vacuum body linseed oil and that will help create a stronger oil paint film. And that should reduce some cracking, but at the same time, stand oil has a low acid um, count, which can lead to even slower drying. So gonna have to take that um, with, um, with uh, you know, kind of the pros and cons of it. You can use iron oxide based blacks as well, like Roman black, castle black, um, Mars black, and that that's all fine too. Those are generally a little bit more opaque and faster drying because they're iron oxide based. Um, going forward, some more pigments that you see commonly used. Genuine ultramarine worth its weight in gold, even still. Um, if you were to just grind up lapis lazuli um, without getting rid of all that fool's gold or that pyrite, the acidity of your oil will decompose the um, or change the pyrite. And, you know, where you've got lots of bogs um, with lots of kind of pyrite or iron sulfate um, present, acid rain can, can essentially um, change the pyrite or the fool's gold into sulfuric acid. So there are bogs, you know, acidic bogs of sulfuric acid. And that's actually because of the high quantity of um, pyrite present. So we wanna get the pyrite out of that. Chinini writes, um, you know, in his book, um, the Craftsman Handbook, a way of purifying it by um, mixing the ground up lapis, not too small, um, with gum rosin, uh, beeswax, um, gum rosin and beeswax. I feel like there's something else. Can't remember what else is mixed into it, but you essentially mix that. It's like a, a black blue candle. You mix that under a bath of warm lye. And that's a traditional way of separating the um, lazurite or the blue pigment of ultramarine from the stone. Now, if you've ever um, splurged on it, Natural ultramarine is a big kind of letdown compared to what you typically think or typically see from synthetic ultramarine. It's a much more subtle, subdued color. The most, you would have to use the highest grade um, of lapis to get the best grade of um, genuine ultramarine. You'll also only yield about 1% the weight. So for a hundred grams of lapis, you will only get about one gram of um, pigment out of it. So it's a very, very expensive color. Synthetic ultramarine is smaller particle size and significantly more chromatic. That came about in the 19th century. Here's some really good examples of um, natural ultramarine when used in a glaze. So rarely in old master's paintings do you see that ultramarine used um, in many other mixtures, with perhaps the exception of like a Vermeer, which had um, who like to use genuine ultramarine um, much more liberally than a lot of the other past artists. Artists like um, Rembrandt, you essentially don't find um, any natural or genuine ultramarine. You find much more azurite and smalt. Um, that brings us to malachite and azurite, which are cheaper alternatives. Um, you know, the malachite was used very commonly in egg tempera, has a tendency to brown or turn blackish when use an egg tempera, but the type of green that you see in early, early Northern Renaissance paintings or, you know, the greenish fields 
in you know medieval paintings or like a Botticelli. The azurite is this really beautiful blue. Particle size needs to be slightly large to use it, but at the same time, it does have the tendency to go green. So sometimes you'll see a painting um, from an old master and you'll see the sky is actually turning green. Um, that can be caused by two main things. Um, a, the oil is ye yellowing, the blue and the, the blue and the yellow create a greenish hue. And also some of those particles are actually turning into malachite. Hey, Eric, I just had a couple questions about like a non-toxic alternative to any kind of turpentine. Like, would you recommend turpenoid natural or anything similar? Terp um, turpenoid natural is a brush soap. So, um, Turpenoid natural, to the best of my knowledge, is actually, I mean, if you if you read it, it's, it's you know, there's the regular turpenoid, which is, you know, in the blue bottle with the, or in the white bottle with the blue writing, and then you've got the turpenoid natural, which is blue bottle, or white bottle with green writing. Turpenoid natural, to the best of my knowledge, is actually brush soap. Um, the turpenoid is odorless mineral spirits. There are five companies that I know of in the world that distill crude oil um, into, you know, that essentially distill crude oil into the many, you know, many different, um, you know, fuels and stuff that we use from mineral spirits. Um, you see it commonly known as white spirits um, in the 19th century or in the early 20th century, um, but gasoline, um, jet, jet rocket, rocket fuel, um, you know, all many different solvents and fuels come from the same crude oil. Um, so terpenoid is actually odorless mineral spirits, gamsols, mineral spirits, rubisol from natural pigments, mineral spirits, once again. Um, there, is there a non-toxic alternative? No. Um, you know, that, that, that kind of depends on what you're calling non-toxic. Um, because non-toxic really means it's not going to, you know, it's not going to be toxic for you at all. And even your lavender spike oils are toxic. What about I mean, citrus thinner, um, Jennifer asks? That's still toxic. Okay. It, it, it comes down to more or less toxic. So, you know, how much or how little exposure is going to cause um, damage to you. I think it's best. Like, if, if you can smell it, there's a VOC. So, you know, those strong solvents are, you know, that's their whole purpose is they're highly volatile meaning they're going to evaporate pretty quickly, which contaminates your air. If you're breathing anything other than air, it's toxic to you, right? So all of this is one Google search away. Google search the toxicity of any of those things. Google the effects. Some of them are not nearly as researched, like lavender spike oil isn't quite as researched as let's say mineral spirits or turpentine, but still toxic. Um, the best thing you can do is strip them from your general working process in just period. There are specific brushes that you can use. There are specific materials that you can use to make it to where using those solvents are not as necessary. I keep turpentine mineral spirits for a couple of reasons. A, dissolving varnish resins. If I'm making, making a DeMar varnish, obviously I'm gonna to have to use turpentine. Um, I use a really nice um, gum spirits turpentine, um, Diamond G Force products um, out of Georgia. Um, that's like, if, you're gonna, if you want like the best gum spirits turpentine, Diamond G Force products, you can find it on Amazon too. Um, if I'm using mineral spirits, there is fast evaporating, there is slow evaporating mineral spirits as well. All the mineral spirits and it's multitude of different branded names. It's gonna come from five, um, essentially five companies that I know of. Um, that means the same um, mineral spirits that you're getting at the hardware store is essentially the same one that you're paying three times the amount for in the art store. Um, so, you know, it's, it's all gonna be pretty toxic. The other reason I would keep mineral spirits around is to do an imprimatura, to just decrease the viscosity to make a really thin, lean um, layer of paint for my imprimatura. But I do add some stand oil into that paint as well, um, just to um, kind of assure, be, just to be assured that 
too much of that oil is not getting absorbed. Eric, can you just comment on uh, ventilation? What you would recommend? A very good, um, if you have something like a fume hood that will suck a lot of the air out of your studio, that's great. Um, that's a little unrealistic for most. Um, if you have a good air purifier that can get rid of VOCs, so a good HEPA filter will get rid of the particles, very small particles and allergens and things like that. If you're making paint, a HEPA filter is really essential. Um, but if you are um, working with solvents, you want a, uh, an air purifier that will get rid of VOCs. So volatile organic, organic compounds is the main thing that you're trying to look out for and get rid of. I can take some more questions too. We're doing good on time. Water-based oil paints, what's your take on that? Um, I guess my question is if you're not using solvents, why are you using water-based oil paints? Um, I think the main thing is, you know, people think that you have to use solvents to oil paint. And some people that haven't painted in 30 or 40 years we're used to opening up. I mean, those of you, those of you that have, you know, painted in the 70s or in the 80s, you probably used to remember when you would spit paint out of the tube, it used to just stink up your whole studio, right? Um, and that's because the companies were using odorless mineral spirits or just mineral spirits as a wetting agent um, to, to make making the paint easier. Even old tubes of paint that I collect from like the 19th century and uh, that are in like lead um, or tin tubes, um, those have a terrible, you know, terrible stink to them as well. Companies don't do that anymore. It's, you know, they don't use those, um, those solvents to kind of wet the pigment and make it easier to grind. Um, so when you'd spit it out, it'd essentially be evaporating into your airspace as opposed to it evaporating in the factory airspace. But I guess my, my concern is if you're using water mixable oil paints, I, I generally assume it's because you're afraid of the toxicity of oil paint. Now, the, the, toxic, the main toxicity of oil paint comes from the pigments, if, especially if you take solvents out of the equation, it's coming from the pigments. Um, so you're still using the same toxic pigments, even in acrylic, which, you know, um, those of you that witness the, the birth of acrylic paint and the whole non-toxic type of kind of spiel about it. It's more so them saying that there's no solvents in the same way, but the, all the toxic pigments that are going to, um, you know, if there's anything that's going to mess you up, it's going to be your cadmiums, it's your leads, it's your heavy metal based pigments and ingesting them through inhalation or ingestion. Um, sometimes you can absorb some of them through your skin, but that's a bit of a minor issue compared to ingestion and inhalation. Um, so I don't know much about water mixable oil paints. I don't have much to comment on them. I would just say, um, if you're comfortable eating, um, flaxseed oil or, um, linseed flaxseed oil in like a salad, you know, that's the binder in, you know, your oil paint generally, same thing with walnut oil. That's not toxic. I mean, you know, you know, a little for your paint, a little for your, little for your salad. The main toxic thing is your solvents and your pigments. Now, same pigments and water mixable oils as you know regular oil colors. So the main thing that you want to avoid is eating the paint, sanding your paintings, breathing it in, um, and avoiding solvents to the best of your ability. That means you know when you wash your brushes, um, if you have a sludge jar, go do that outside, as opposed to doing that in your bathroom or inside of your um, inside of your studio. Don't contaminate your air. Um, I have a few questions about Gamsol. Okay. Um, Toxicity recommendations and use will damage your will damage your nervous system. Very toxic, um, accumulatively toxic. So chronic exposure, small exposure, is going to do long term damage. So avoid it. You don't want to have respiratory and nervous system depression um, from your overexposure to those solvents. You know you wouldn't. Think of it, I like to think of mineral spirits side by side with gasoline, although gasoline is, you know, worse. 
Um, would you just open up a can of gasoline in your home, just sit there with it for a few hours? I mean, aside from the fire hazard of it all, I, I mean, it would stink it up, it would fume you out. Now, the whole odorless, the odor is not very aggressive. Some mineral spirits, the odor is very aggressive. And those, I mean, you really, you know, get fumed out of your studio. But since the odor isn't as strong, that doesn't mean it's, it's not just as toxic as the ones that are more strong odored. So you're one Google search, one Wikipedia search away from the toxicity of it uh, or learning about the toxicity of it. So that's my recommendation is just type in odorless mineral spirits, toxicity, go to Google and you'll I'll have all of your answers um, there. There was a second part of that question. What was that again? If there is like a safer alternative basically for Gamsol in terms of like a solvent, like what would be the go-to? I mean, there are less toxic alternatives, lavender spike oil, the, um, the orange, um, the citrus based um, solvent. I mean, those are less toxic, but solvents are toxic, period. You know, turpentine, toxic. So it comes from a tree, still toxic. Um, the main thing is reducing your exposure to them is I think the best thing that you can do. So if, if you're used to using turpentine or mineral spirits through many layers of paint, that's probably why you're experiencing lots of sinking in. Um, and it's probably the reason you probably have a scratchy throat or feel a little bit dizzy or additionally out of it, out of, you know, at the end of your working session of painting. Um, the thing with solvents um, VOCs, the whole, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Doesn't really apply to the exposure to those VOCs. There is a certain point when your body says enough is enough and you can spend years mishandling solvents, acetone, odorless mineral spirits, turpentine. And then one day you will open up that can of mineral spirits. So you will just spray some household cleaner and your throat will tighten up. You will get a splitting headache and you'll get nauseous. Um, I personally can't, I can't be exposed to um, mineral spirits, VOCs without getting a headache and without having like a, you know, asthmatic reaction anymore. And that's because I grossly mishandled them um, a bit too much in my very, you know, short life at this point. So I mean, it, I, I, the reason why I'm so adamant about it is because I've firsthand experienced the ramifications of mishandling the solvents. Okay, so I have another question. If you're not using odorless mineral spirit, uh, spirits when you're cleaning your brushes, what would you recommend? I just use the brush soap. Brush soap, okay. I mean, when you've got brushes like this, you can just, I just use the brush soap. When I'm using a, like a massive brush, yes, I keep a tank of mineral spirits or turpentine and I go outside and I um, swish it around and try to get the majority of the paint out of the paintbrush. But I... You know, if can you see where the stain is on the brush? One one etiquette, you know, painting etiquette that you should all follow is try your best to never let paint touch the ferrule, because the same capillary action. You know why you wouldn't take a roll of paper towels and leave it on a wet counter because all of the water will get sucked up into the roll of paper towels. The same thing with your paint. The capillary action will happen to where the paint will actually get sucked up into this ferrule, which acts like a little cup here, and then you'll start to develop that little rock, what it seems like a hard point right at the ferrule. At that point, your brush will splay out, it will lose its shape. And it's a ter terribly hard to um, get all that paint out of there. So I only load up my brush a certain amount before, um, you know, just in my painting in general, but I'm very controlled as far as, you know, painting. So not loading up your brushes, you know, to where paint's billowing all over the, the ferrule makes it to where you're painting, washing your brushes is just a bit easier. Okay, throwing you a curveball here, but can you explain um, using a gesso primer for an underpainting? Uh, okay, so a gesso primer for what? Uh, just to start a painting, like an underpainting. So I assume we are priming a panel or priming a linen or canvas. So that's Correct. an acrylic dispersion ground. So. An acrylic dispersion ground is usually a mixture of chalk, a white pigment, sometimes talc, um, and your, you know, acrylic polymer. So, you know, an acrylic resin, which dries through evaporation. 
um, that's just going to be, you know, you, you can do, do multiple layers of it and it's going to be more absorbent than the um, oil grounds. You know, there might be some lack of adhesion because when oil paint dries together, there's a kind of a cross linking of, the, of each of the paint layer. They eventually become one layer of paint. Meanwhile, there's not as much of a chemical cross linking with um, um, acrylic to oil. But oil on oil, there's a cross linking that can happen, which can lead to um, less delamination where your paint cracks and falls or flakes off. Okay. Are you going to go over um, properly cleaning your brushes at some point? If that's something that you know you you all want to see, yeah, I'll go over it. Um, Great. I mean, it's going to be difficult. I mean, I'm not going to be able to get the camera, you know, in the you know other room. But I'll I'll wet a brush and you know bring up the brush up and show how I kind of suds it up. Um, one thing to avoid is slam washing your brush, which is when you just like slam your brush like into your bar of soap and just shake it around. Um, you know, imagine you pet your dog or, you know, did that to your own hair. That's of course going to damage the brush, but yeah, I'll go over some of how I clean my brushes. Awesome. And real quick, um, natural brushes versus synthetic brushes. Can you just kind of go over that a little bit? So natural brushes are generally going to be more delicate, meaning they usually, um, usually will have, you'll, you'll have more breakage. Um, now this is, I'm speaking just compared to Trakel's synthetics. I'm not speaking to cheaper synthetics from other brands, just Trakel synthetics. Um, I've never experienced, I mean, I've highly abused a lot of my synthetic brushes and I've never experienced a hair breaking off. Now with the natural, even with the um, natural hog bristle from Trakel, I mean, it's a natural hair. So if I abuse the heck out of the brush, scrubbing and scratching, some of the fibers will break. So um, with the sables and Kalin Kalinsky sables, um, you don't have as much of that breakage as let's say the hog bristle if you're kind of scrubbing at it, but there is still um, more breakage than I would say the that you would experience with the synthetic. Now, how smooth, and how stiff the filament is, is going to determine a lot. So there are grooves in the hair and there's grooves in you know, both the natural hair as well as um, the, oh, I actually think I closed this. Um, I had a couple of photos of what the um, hair, hair looks like under a microscope. There we go. So this is, this is a sable. That's what, oh no, that's Black Bear, sorry. I just downloaded the wrong one. So this is essentially, you know, our hair grows gradually. Our hair also has um, the, same, the same appearance. So because the hair grows gradually, it grows in this almost kind of scratchy scale formation. Each hair from a different, different you know, species is going to be um, slightly different. So one of the main differences in natural to synthetic is these grooves on the fiber. Now, um, there have been modern innovations to um, simulate those grooves in the hair, um, even with the synthetics. And that is why you have things like the Sienna brushes, which are I mean, you, you barely tell the difference between sable and the synthetic sable. So um, I'm a kind of, I, I used to be a big snob and only work with sable brushes. Um, and then, you know, with, you know, fur trade becoming, you know, harder, harder, you know, supply chain ethical issues, sable is more expensive and harder to get. I started moving over to using more of the Sienna brushes and, you know, I, I can barely tell the difference when I'm holding a Sienna brush and holding, you know, one of the red sable brushes. And, you know, to the best of my knowledge, the main difference is, you know, how much the manufacturer is simulating those grooves in the um, each individual strand to make it act or have the same drag or pull as, um, as a natural brush from a synthetic. Anything else? I have a question about using rabbit skin glue, chalk, okay. and gesso ground with top sizing on a panel. 
Say that again. Jasmine, do you want to uh, please jump in and, and rephrase that? I'm not sure I got it right. I, this is me. Can you hear me? Um, barely, but yes, go on. I was asking about using traditional gesso ground okay. to rub it in glue on a uh -huh. rigid panel. So obviously that would not go on a canvas with the yeah. top sizing of glue because chalk is going to be too absorbent for oil. But it makes a beautiful surface to paint on if you have. So don't is that top size it. I think I think I would say just don't top size it with glue. Um, is it too absorbent? Top, top size it. Top size it with real oil. Just top size it with oil paint. Top size it okay. with a campitura, a more opaque layer of paint with some vacuum body linseed oil in it, and that will reduce the absorbency. But okay. at the same at the same time, I mean, it's like. The whole purpose of that ground is for it to be absorbent. It's like yeah, but I heard that too too much absorbency is also not good because it causes sinking in, and it just you know I don't want to steal time, but you know the similar ground would be the tempera grassa, which is mm -hmm. the oil and the egg. That is also very, it's very fun to paint on it, and it's like relatively cheap and you can make. I would I, I think the main thing is you know. Um, rabbit skin glue is, is a, um, inferior material for the 21st yeah. century, um, because it swells and shrinks with changes in heat and humidity. Um, you don't want a whole layer. That's just, at, at least it'll be all your ground as opposed to a thin layer of just glue that's going to swell and shrink and cause all your paint to crack. So, Thank you so, much. so I would put like a full layer of paint with some vacuum body linseed oil, which will reduce sinking in the same way. If you were going to finish a wood piece of furniture, you would start with a linseed oil or a tongue oil cut with turpentine. Then you would use regular linseed oil or tongue oil. And then you would use a polymerized or a stand oil on top to do that finishing coat. And the reason is the high viscosity, uh, the honey-like viscosity won't get sucked into the surface nearly as readily. Thank you so much. I appreciate your You're time. very welcome. Got one more for you. Um, how do you manage the fat over lean principle when you use stand oil at the in prematura? The fat over lean principle is outdated. The, the correct way to think of it is more flexible over less flexible. And the same, if you liken your painting to a house, um, the best choice is to have a solid concrete foundation. For example, that's why I would also choose a panel as opposed to a stretched linen. Although I love the feel of stretched linen, I would choose a panel because that likens my painting to a house, a solid foundation. Now in my imprimatura, it doesn't matter if I add a little bit of stand oil to it. I mean, especially if I'm using a very thirsty and fast drying color, for example, like a iron oxide based pigment like raw umber. So with that, that is going to dry faster, which is going to be less flexible. You could even use an alkyd resin in your earliest layers in your underpainting or even for your imprimatura, which will also cause it to dry faster and harder. You would want to avoid using very slow drying colors like alizarin crimson for your imprimatura. So also, if you are using any mineral spirits or some solvent, you have to keep in mind that a small quantity of that oil is also gonna get sucked into the substrate, leaving the paint on the surface more lean or straying away from its critical pigment volume concentration. So a little, little doesn't hurt, but thin, it's a stain. It's not like a full, full layer of paint. The fat over lean principle, just think of it as more flexible over less flexible. So if you did a layer of paint with a ton of oil in it, say you made that kind of terrible mistake, and then you let that dry for three months, just because you knew you added a bunch of oil into it, now it's dry, it's cured, dried, and hard. So you could paint over with less oil on top of it and you wouldn't have nearly you know, as much of an issue. Of course, if you're adding too much oil overall in general, um, you're going to have the issues of you not maintaining the critical pigment volume concentration of your paint, meaning you're making your paint too oily or too lean. Um, there's a kind of a middle ground where your paint is neither too glossy nor too matte. Um, each of those, too glossy and too matte, will have 
um, big issues such as uh, increased yellowing, increased cracking, efflorescence, susceptibility to moisture. Um, so there's different different issues that you will experience, but that that's essentially um, that's essentially that. Does that answer the question? We have a lot of questions in general about the fat over lean principle. Okay, well, why don't we jump right into making paint? And I will, and you can just keep keep telling me. So what what I'm going to awesome. do is I'm going to I have to move my microphone here over to my palette nasal. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a um, a short 10 minute break. That's going to give everybody a chance to stretch their legs, grab a coffee. I'm going to put a timer up here and um, we're just going to take a quick 10 minute break. I'm going to move the cameras around, give you all a chance to do that. And then I'm going to take more of those questions. We're going to go right into making the paint. And we're also going to go over correcting the viscosity of our, all of our paint before we get going in the demo, which will reduce or completely eliminate the need for you to um, have one of those metallic cups of miscellaneous medium that, you, that you're constantly dipping into allowing you to better control the viscosity of your paint in general. All right, just give me one second. We're just gonna change this to 10 minutes. I'm going to just, uh, I'll keep the recording going, sure. All right, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. I'm just going to mute myself and uh, stop the video and um, we'll be right back here in nine minutes and 44 seconds.
Alrighty, welcome back. I'm just gonna change the exposure of that just a bit. There we go. It's a little bit less blinding, isn't it? So I've got a nice honed marble slab here. Um, you can use a textured glass honed, that way it's not super polished and smooth. What I thought we would do is we would make some genuine rose matter today. So that way we stick with something non-toxic, that way I don't have to suit up and, um, with my daughter being the age that she is and just having a child in general now, I try to avoid making extremely toxic pigments if I can. If I need to make lead, if I need to make a, you know something toxic, I usually will uh, go outside, suit up, you know, full respirator and everything. But with these relatively non-toxic pigments, I, I don't have to take nearly as, you know, kind of crazy of a precaution. So, um, Bliss, why don't you start to feed me some more of those questions while I while I get going? I'm gonna put on some gloves. Great. I did have a question about the use of liquid. Okay. Um, specifically for glazing and indirect painting, is liquid plus oil okay to use, or is there a better alternative? I assume that liquid is being used because you're impatient and you want it to dry fast. Um, liquid is an alkyd medium, which usually requires a solvent. Alkyds require most of the time a solvent uh, for them to dry. So that's why liquid kind of smells like spray paint, doesn't it? With liquid, you've got some of the same toxicity as you do regular mineral spirits and everything. <coughs> um, you, this goes back to making sure that your painting is dryest first and layers following are slower drying or more flexible. So long as you are following that principle to a degree, that is you know, good. But if you're using, for example, let's say you do liquid with ultramarine, which is a slow drying color. Let's say we do uh, liquid with ultramarine and titanium white, both slow drying colors. The liquid will speed up the drying time, but if one day or two days later you use liquid with raw umber, which is very fast drying by itself, then that layer will be faster drying than even the layer that you did a few days prior. So the ultimate, the ultimate thing here for me is less is more. I don't like using a ton of mediums. I don't like complicating it more than it already is. I use one oil for the most part, and that is linseed oil. I do not fall for the common trap that walnut oil is going to yellow less than linseed oil. That's not really proven. One observation is that walnut oil, for example, is going to yellow slower, but they're essentially um, going to yellow to the same degree when they are, when. When the scientists artificially age the oil, they'll both go to a you know a black oil. So when you um, when you heat oil, you're in its essence um, oxidizing it, you're polymerizing it, so you're artificially artificially aging it. That's how you have things like black oil, boiled linseed oil. When that oil is heated in the presence of um, heat and oxygen, you essentially artificially age the oil. And walnut oil is going to go about to the same value as the linseed oil is. Will it take longer to get to that level of yellowness or darkness? Probably, but there's also a trade-off of um, the oil film of linseed oil is stronger than walnut oil. And there's also the loss of weight. So when your oil paint dries, it initially, um, look at me focusing on other things, I'm just making a mess. Um, when your oil dries, it expands first, and then it contracts. Now, when your walnut oil expands and contracts, it expands and contracts more so than the linseed oil. So the linseed oil essentially returns to about the same weight as it was when it was wet. There's a tiny loss. Remember, if you can smell something, there's a volatile organic compound there. So there is some slight solvent, even in you know linseed oil or walnut oil. 
but in walnut oil's case, there's a greater loss of mass and a greater loss of weight. So where the paint actually shrinks smaller than it was when it was wet. That is one of the reasons why, you know, I like to avoid walnut oil, just not knowing exactly how that's going to pan out. I can see issues with that causing cracking. That's the same issue when you're using alkyd medium. So if you stop saying liquid and you just call it an alkyd medium, which is what it is, it's an alkyd medium that is made into a gel or a thixotropic medium to essentially simulate um, Jacques Merger's, what we commonly know as Merger medium, which is a mixture of black oil, which is lead litharge, and um, boiled linseed oil and mastic varnish, mastic resin, and serpentine. So um, it's a thixotropic medium, a gel type medium that's made to mimic that. But in reality, in, in its simplest description, it's just an alkyd. So it's a very, very fast drying um, modified vegetable oil. So um, using liquid isn't necessarily bad. It's just needs to be used with additional care. For example, I would, you, you're, you're pretty much fooled by some manufacturers when they've got like, Galkid light or like liquid detail that are encouraging you to use an extremely fast drying medium on your final layers where you, if anything your la your final layer should be the slowest drying especially if you are consistently working every two or three days on the painting having said that you should always let your paint dry very thoroughly before you work on it again i put out just a little bit of pigment now once again, I'm using primarily linseed oil. So I, when making paint, I choose to use a, I choose to use a high acid linseed oil. Now, all of our vegetable oils share a very similar profile of fatty, fatty acids, saturated and you know, polyunsaturated, saturated fats. So what we are looking for is a oil with the highest iodine number. Here, let me actually, I'll pull up a chart that, um, that um, photo credit to uh, natural pigments or rublev colors. So let me just share this. So here we go. So as you can see, linseed oil has the highest number of alpha linoleic acid. Um, seconds to that is hemp seed oil. And then of course, we've, we've got you know, our walnut oil third to that. Hence, walnut oil dries much slower than linseed oil. So the iodine number for the linseed oil is going to be 204. Second highest is going to be 162, which is the walnut, followed by um, our hemp seed oil, or I'm sorry, hemp seed actually was second. Um, third is walnut, followed by safflower oil of the high um, linolenic variety and poppy seed oil. So the Poppy seed and safflower oil come in different varieties, which can sometimes make them um, additionally slower drying. And um, we can almost categorize them as semi-drying oils. My recommendation is to stick with the you know, tried and true highest acid content, which is going to increase the drying time, or it's going to make the paint dry faster. Higher acid, faster drying. That's why when you use a um, low acid stand oil, it's gonna slow the drying time. So when I'm making paint, or if I have to just change the viscosity of my paint, if I'm using just straight oil, I would use something like a pale grinder's oil, which is a refined high acid linseed oil. My recommendation is to use the best materials that you can afford. If the brand that you prefer, I prefer, I use exclusively Trakel. 
And I use exclusively natural pigments and rublev colors. That's mediums and mediums oils and paint. Um, same thing with Chacal. I use exclusively Chacal panels, brushes, um, thing, things like this. But with that being said, um, use what you know, use what you're comfortable with, and you know, question your manufacturers. Your manufacturer should be able to tell you what the acid, you know, what the acid levels are from, you know, whichever oils they're, you're buying. If they're not telling you, maybe you should second guess, you know, using them perhaps. I, you know, share, you know, philosophy of, you know, sharing is caring. And I want to know exactly what am I making my pain out of exactly what, you know, what is in all of these things. I don't like these proprietary mixtures, mediums where I don't know exactly what's in it. You know what I mean? So very simply put, I have a high acid refined linseed oil here. I have an angel refined or an alkali refined linseed oil. Um, I have a vacuum body linseed oil at a medium and a high viscosity. So the bubble is going to raise, uh, you know, slower or faster. You can see that one's just finally reaching the top. Of course, it's a am more amber color. These are commonly known as stand oil. They're essentially vacuum body linseed oil. What that means is those oils are just regular refined linseed oil like this that is heated in the complete absence of oxygen. So it's heated in a vacuum, obviously. It's heated at a specific temperature for a period of time. The longer it is heated, the higher viscosity it will become, but the acid content will lower, which will decrease the drying time. But the high viscosity honey-like oils like vacuum body linseed oil will reduce sinking in. It will provide a nice, flexible, strong oil film, which will reduce um, the need to oil out quite as much. And um, it can reduce cracking of some troublesome colors like your um, umbers and your blacks. Every single color is going to crack um, more or less, depending on what oils are added into, into them, their particle size, and just their natural, um, you know, just their chemistry. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a few drops. I'm just going to dip my, my brush in and just put a few drops of oil here. Now, what we're making is genuine rose matter. This is the type of rose matter that you would have, um, that you would have seen from like an old master painting. So I'm gonna add just a tiny bit of oil and start mixing this up, making this into a thick paste. I want to gradually add oil. Um, if I add too much, then I'm stuck kind of going back and forth, back and forth. I'm adding more pigment, more oil, more pigment, more oil. To me, it's just a little bit safer to add oil. Now, the slab that I'm using is marble. It's an 18 inch marble slab. You can use textured glass. Um, you can use silicon carbide to texture your glass. Silicon carbide is essentially going to be um, the abrasive that you would find on your standard um, sandpaper. So you can do that and mull it with your muller, um, and that will texture your glass. It will even texture, let's say, a polished piece of granite. Now, in a lot of analysis of old masters paintings, you find calcium carbonate. And of course, um, marble is com essentially composed of calcium carbonate. Now, there's uh, a, a couple of you know question marks. Did the old master choose to add the marble dust to the paint, or is the marble dust there present because they were grinding on a marble slab? We'll never fully know. Um, but both are um, possibilities. Calcium carbonate is um, commonly used as an extender pigment. In other words, the extender, an extender pigment can change the physical properties, the working properties of the paint, while also changing the um, transparency or opacity. For example, um, my favorite extender pigments are barium sulfate, calcium carbonate, and powdered glass. That is a crystal leaded powdered glass like you would find from a really good scotch or brandy, um, you know, decanter or, you know, a, a crystal glass that you would drink, you know, a, a liquor out of sorts. Lead oxide is the main, um, you know, lead part in that. Now that lead oxide acts as a slight sicative as well. Sicative 
uh, meaning a drier. So it, it is a reactive pigment. So we can glaze by using A, a transparent pigment, you know, for example, alizarin, ultramarine are just transparent pigments compared to your black or your titanium white. Meanwhile, we can also glaze through the introduction of colorless transparent pigments, calcium carbonate, powdered glass, um, to make the paint even more transparent by creating kind of an amalgamation or a mixture. So one way that you do not want to glaze is to essentially be adding liberal quantities of oil, deviating from the critical pigment volume concentration. So now that I've got this a, a, a stiff kind of cakey mass, I'm going to hit it with the muller. That way I can get a better pigment oil agglomeration. That, that essentially means the pigment in the oil is essentially going to, the oil is going to start to surround all of the pigment particles. So I definitely know that I'm lean right now, but it's so much better. You can see once I do that, um, it starts to loosen up, right? So it's better to start lean when you are making your own paint as opposed to being too oily. So start off lean, work on getting a good pigment oil agglomeration. Once that's made into a better paste, then we can gently and gradually add the other oils of our choice. You can do circles, you can do figure eights, you know, go up, down, up, down, side, 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 um, figure eights like that. Um, pick your poison. You know, it's, you, can, you can have a personality with how you mold, what you feel works best. You can have larger and smaller molars, glass molars like this, a larger one for larger surface area, a smaller one if you want to reduce particle size. When you've got very precarious pigments like natural ultramarine or cobalt dope glass known as smalt, um, you would want to use very little pressure that way you don't reduce the particle size too much. So at this point, you know, I can scrape this up. You see how fluid that is now? That's a much, much better paint viscosity. If I were to judge it before I got a good pigment oil agglomeration, I would have far too much oil. I can even, let's bring you in here, get you a little bit closer. So now I'm just gonna mix that paint, which is a little bit stiffer with the one that is looser. And now we're gonna mix this up. And all of that paint will flow just much easier. This is really as simple as you know making paint is. I used to do this every single day. Of course, it was time. Um, it was definitely you know a good hour before my working day, but I really enjoyed the ritual of making paint before I worked, and you know getting a feel and getting control over the paint. So many times you spit the paint out of the tube and you say, "Oh no, this is too oily, or this is too lean, or too sticky." And your first thought is to just be frustrated with the manufacturer. But especially if you're using paint without stabilizers, you, you should have the knowledge and control to modify this paint, that's no, not my hair, um, to the level that you see fit. Now, look at how, look at how fluid that is now. I'm sorry. So that paint is actually, really good to go. I was hoping to add perhaps a little bit of vacuum bodied linseed oil to it, but I think that that is just, just right. Now, when you're using a genuine rose matter, you'll notice that the particle size, or even if you buy synthetic alizarin, the particle sizes can be a little bit gritty feeling, sometimes a little bit sandy or scratchy. So if you want to reduce the particle size more, you can just apply pressure and make it a finer and finer paint. The same thing goes. If you've ever used, let's say, um, Windsor Newton's yellow ochre, I know at least 25% of you are gonna be able to get a laugh at Windsor Newton's yellow ochre and how it feels like stiff, gritty baby poop. 
um, it, that sandiness can be remedied. If you just have a piece of marble or you know a, um, a, a glass slab and a molar, you can make that a very smooth paint. So if you do buy a paint, perhaps by Williamsburg. Williamsburg in recent years has been um, introducing larger or more varied particle sizes to their paint, which is most, or which is more similar to the type of paint that the old masters would have had. Um, if that particle size is too large for you, you can just bring it to the slab and just mull it up and you'll be able to get this really nice, smooth, long paint out of it. Now, remember how cakey and un, um, you know, unworkable that paint was before I mulled it. Keep in mind, I had, have not added any oil to this. Having said that, when you do take a paint, let's say an iron oxide based pigment, like a raw or burnt umber, and it's gritty or yellow ochre and it's gritty, and then you reduce the particle size, typically when you increase the surface area, meaning break those pigments down to be smaller, you are going to usually need more oil, more surface area. That means more oil to get a good pigment oil agglomeration. Questions? Eric, um, question about how you store your paints that you make? Small tubes. Okay. Small and tubes like this, big tubes like that, depends on how much I'm making. Even when I make some of my own mediums, my amendment color. So one of the thing, one of my favorite glazing mediums is to take crystal glass powder. You can make your own glass powder by just taking some glass and grinding it up to a very fine particle size. Um, fume silica and linseed oil. And then I can just tube that up. And then I can amend my colors, making them more transparent by introduction of transparent pigments like the powdered glass, the fume silica, and the small amount of linseed oil. So it essentially becomes like a transparent paint as opposed to a liquid medium. Um, Eric, is it okay to add calcite, barite, or lithopone? Yes, all extender pigments that'll increase the transparency of your paint. Okay, that's done. I'm gonna put that on my palette. Any questions? Is there, does anybody want me to go over a little bit more of paint making before we move on? I've got all of my paint on my palette, but I still have to correct the viscosity of it. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about the full fat over lean and. Um, amending your colors, amending your paint as you get ready to work for the day. Yeah, we definitely have a few more questions, Eric. Sure. Um, this is from Tina. Um, how did Rembrandt create his paints to catch the light? Did he crush into his paint using chalk, glass, or sand? Um, glass and sand can be thought of almost the same both being silica-based, that is. Um, chalk, um, chalk can also be, you know, right up there with calcium carbonate. Um, you know, so yes. I mean, I would say, yes, those are amendments that Rembrandt would have used in his paint. If that catch the light in a specific way, you know, we that we may have to talk more so about you know, what is he doing for an underpainting? Um, how much impasto is there? You know, what is in each of his mixtures as, you know, he's going from one layer to the next, be it direct or indirect. So you're, you're on the right, you are on the right track. I think that the best thing for you to do is experiment for yourself. To, there's, it seems like no two people will agree on the technique of almost any old master for the most part, because the old masters are like us. They're experimenters. They're um, pushing the envelope of what they were taught. They're trying to figure things out for, their, for, for themselves. So it's almost as if there was an extreme analysis of all of your paintings all at once. And somebody tried to put like a full blanket statement on how you achieved your look. You know what I mean? So when you look at a Rembrandt, I think it's you know important to 
um, do in, you know, see if there's any analysis of the pigments in the paint. That's right away, a perfect example of how you can figure out what's in it. And B, go through the whole process yourself. Um, you know, I recently, um, I think, I, I don't, I wonder if Nadine is here, um, but I, a student, um, she used to be the atelier student, an atelier student for the online, but she ended up doing private lessons with me. And we, you know, we did this Rembrandt, pretty much this, the, the head of Christ, um, pretty much side by side. So we did the underpainting together. We mixed up our paint together and um, we, we essentially went through the whole process. I'll see if I can find some photos of, of this as well. Um, but the best thing to do is find a Rembrandt that you really admire, that you like, and try to reproduce it, replicate it using time-specific materials and time-specific techniques. And then you can judge the end result. Of course, big part of that also um, hangs on your ability to draw proportionally and understand colors and values. But you know, in, in, in lessons, we go over all of that stuff too. I hope that answers your question. Eric, one more time. Can you please repeat the ingredients and mediums that you use to make that? That, that piece of paint? Yes. Um, that is pretty, um, pretty exclusively just um, pale, pale grinders oil, high acid linseed oil. I didn't add anything else other than that. In these, and I, I just have to, I, would, I just want to flip this around for you. Give me one moment. I just have to get to OBS. There we go. So in these colors, In these colors, we're going to put different things in them because we want to make our paint a little bit more transparent. But for that, for that, all it is is a high acid linseed oil, um, also known as a pale grinders oil from natural pigments. It's a refined linseed oil. It's a refined high acid linseed oil. Not all linseed oil is at the same acidity. So I have a little bit of a mess here, <laughs> little, little bits of paint everywhere. But um, let's start with Let's start with the most important one, and that is lead white. So this is not a regular lead white. This is a stack lead white. I wouldn't um, dream of using anything but the best for you all. Um, so this is stack lead white. This is Dutch process stack lead white. Um, a, what you can use as an alternative for this is a lead white number one. That is going to be a lead white in linseed oil. A lead white number two is typically going to be lead white in walnut oil. So first thing I'm going to do, just do this. Feel and look at you know how fluid or what the viscosity of it is. I'm getting the feeling that my paint is just ever so slightly too sticky. Have you ever had that paint where you grab it and you know you're just going to have to keep dipping into that little cup of medium? Let's remedy or resolve that now. I, I want to introduce a polymerized linseed oil. So the polymers create chains. It's, it's almost like open-ended, you know, um, uh, chain links. Now, the more, you know, the, the tighter or the greater the polymerization, the tighter those links become. And that's why you have some See how slow that, that bubble will raise compared to let's say that. And then we've got extra high viscosity. Look at how slow that bubble is. So if you can imagine the, the uh, molecules of the oil kind of gripping onto each other, the harder they grip, the closer they get to a solid or the higher viscosity they get. I'm gonna use a medium bodied, um, or a medium viscosity vacuum body linseed oil, stand oil. I'm just gonna dip it into my brush. And over here, I'm just gonna put a little puddle. You can choose a better way to get your oil out. You can use an eyedropper or whatever you wanna use. For me, I just do that, take it, just wipe it off, and that's totally fine. 
So what I want to do is add a very small amount of vacuum bodied linseed oil. So I'm just going to take, um, you know, one of my Trakel palette knives, just grab a small amount of it and put it here. I don't want to grab with this um, other palette knife because it's got white in it. I'm just going to taint the whole thing. So I'm going to take this nice clean one, mix it up, essentially judge the viscosity of it. I personally like a wood palette. I'm using a glass palette because it's easy to clean, but I do like a wood palette because sometimes it can't absorb some of the oil out of the paint. I actually really like that if my paint is too oily. So the patina that develops on it is nice. It's also very similar to my um, uh, Imprimatura, especially the Umbri ones. I'm just gonna add a tiny bit more. Really wanna make sure that I mix this up very thoroughly. I don't want spots of high oil and then other spots of low. This is, I would say, the most important part of my day. Fixing the viscosity of my paint. If you feel that your paint is too oily or too stiff and sticky, do something about it. If you had a workshop, you know, you know, on days, that's what you would consider your um, school where you would offer tutelage to young men and women to study with you. For example, um, Anthony Van Dyke was a pupil of Peter Paul Rubens in Rubens' workshop. Um, there's also Rembrandt's workshop. The students were in charge of making the paint for the master artist. Now, if you had this student that kept bringing you paint that was either too oily or too stiff, you would be very quick to kick them out because you are essentially giving them room and, room and board, um, giving them you know, a, a job, paintings to, paintings to make for um, patrons and everything. So you're doing a lot, you do a lot for your students or your apprentices in a way. And like their one job is to make your paint for you, right? And if they keep messing that up, you'd be quick to kick them out. Same thing when you spit it out of the tube. Sometimes you get a tube, you squeeze it, and half of the oil in the tube seems to spit out, right? The way to remedy that on the short term is to A, massage or agitate your tube. One thing that I like to do is just go to something hard and just tap, 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 tap. The heavier pigments will settle to the bottom. I do not like letting all of my tubes hang upside down like that because all of the, my paint does not have stabilizers in it. So I expect a degree of pigment oil separation. So if I have a tube that's hanging upside down for too long, all of the heaviest pigment particles will settle right to the mouth of the tube. And then it will be like a, um, you know, a kind of an impenetrable rock, you know, at the mouth of the tube. And then I can't even get paint out of it. So I keep them flat. I agitate them frequently, flip them around. You get which, you know, you, that's what you get for dealing with paint that is similar to you know, what you have made, or um, in other words, paint without commercial stabilizers, which are primarily there to emulsify the oil and reduce pigment and oil separation. Eric, I just have a couple questions for you. Sure, hand me with that. Um, everyone's curious what type of paper towels you're using to wipe your palette. Oh, these are just like the blue shop towels. You can get them from Walmart or Home, Home Depot. Um, blue shop towels, they're just very little lint. Um, that's what I like to use. You can use cut up shirts and everything like that too. But I swear every single time I cut up the shirt or I use one of those bag of rags, I'm just getting cotton fibers and everything anyway. So I'm just like, whatever. I don't use, you know, this, you know, very frequently. Um, so that's okay. Just a little bit. Mo most of my paint is a little bit lean because it spit out some of that oil over the course of time. Um, question from Sandra, if paint from a tube is too dry, is there a way to resuscitate it? Exactly what I'm doing here. Um, or are we talking about the whole tube? I'm not sure. Sandra? If we're talking about the whole tube, cut, cut it open, throw it on the slab, mix it all up with, with more oil. If, if the oil has been spit out over the duration of you owning the tube. If it's starting to dry because you've left it open, that's a slightly different issue. Um, but if it's just now lean, um, cut open, if the whole tube is lean, 
you can cut open the whole tube and just spit out some of that um, or just spit out all of that paint and mix it up with the oils of your choice. In this case, I'm adding a bit of vacuum body linseed oil to my paint right now because we're going to be working on um, what would be considered more of a second painting pass in that French neoclassical way that we were looking at the um, French artists like David and Jerome. I have Naples yellow here. Right, I'm sorry, I've got lead tin yellow, it's one of my favorite colors. Just because I'm you, just because I'm using a, um, a Jacques Louis David painting as an example, I I have the genuine Naples yellow. Um, so in the 17th century, 16th, 17th, 15th, primary high chroma yellow was lead tin yellow. In the 18th century, primary high chroma yellow was Naples yellow. A single Dutch family apparently died with the recipe or the kind of um, process of making the lead tin yellow. So the genuine Naples yellow is a lead and antimony yellow as opposed to the lead and tin color. This one's fairly stiff, so stiff. Do you see how, can you hear that? This is a very stiff cakey color. I added just a little bit of that vacuum bodied linseed oil, but I do want to keep the quantity of that vacuum body linseed oil relatively low. So I am going to add a small amount of that high acid um, refined linseed oil to this, this paint as opposed to just the stand oil. So just one, two drops, I think should be enough for now. That'll at least allow me to judge and then add more. I can always add more. Um, taking it away is a bit more difficult and more time consuming. What I'm shooting for is a relatively equal viscosity of all of my paint. The only reason why you pull out that medium is because you're, you know, you do not like the viscosity of, you know, one or more of your paints. I'm just going to add a few more drops there. So with this, I just want to decrease the viscosity a bit. Would that seem to be just right? So a couple of drops at a time. Make sure I mix that really thoroughly. Okay, hey, Eric from uh, Vero, I hope I pronounced your name right. Uh, what's the purpose of using high acid oils, please? They dry faster. Dry faster. Have a higher iodine number. They dry faster and stronger. How do you put the paint you make into a tube? Like that. You just go. So the tube is open in the back, see? Oh, sorry. The tube is open in the back. See, it's open there. You just slip the paint in like that, and then you tap it to make it go down. Then you crimp the bottom of it. Oh my, I forgot my yellow ochre. I'm just gonna... Go grab my yellow ochre. So I start with the lightest colors. If I was making paint on this lab, I would keep a I keep a dark, um, dark piece of granite, dark marble for darker colors, lighter marble, lighter granite for um, brighter ones. So I'm just, just using glass. I start with white and I lead towards darkness because it's most important that that white is pure and unadulterated by those darker pigments in general. This, this is a yellow ochre. Um, the, my favorite region that for yellow ochre to come from is Blue Ridge. Um, I believe it's Virginia. So that's a Blue Ridge yellow ochre. Um, I find that German yellow ochres are a little green for my liking. Even some French yellow ochres have a tendency to be um, a little too green for my liking or a little too red. This to me is like a perfect middle ground. This is pretty good. I think I, I think I'm, I think I want just a tiny bit of vacuum bodied linseed oil because it's just a tiny bit stiff. 
I'm just going to grab. Eric, is that Naples yellow next to your lead tin yellow? Yep, we're at stack lead white. We're lead white number one, lead tin yellow, Naples yellow, um, and then yellow ochre. Okay, thank you. Following that, we're going to do genuine vermilion, or if you can't find it or afford it, you can substitute it for a cadmium red. There are, there has been some supply um, chain issues with uh, genuine vermilion or mercuric sulfide. So it is, it is pretty difficult to find the genuine vermilion these days. Um, but if you ever, you know, when it comes back in stock from one of the many manufacturers, it's worth every penny. Um, I absolutely love genuine vermilion. This is genuine vermilion. I'm gonna get rid of some of that ochre. There's a little bit of oil. I don't know if you can see, but it spit out a little bit of oil too. I'm gonna to mix that up. Viscosity of this is great. No changes needed here. If anything, the viscosity is actually might be even a little too low. Um, Luckily, I keep some tubes with uh, excessively lean paint in it. So let me see if I can just locate one of you. Not that one. Ah, there it is. Sorry about the hold up. I just want to suck some of the oil out of this paint. That actually might be a little bit oilier, oilier than the rest. And I don't want there to be any one oil that is far oilier than the rest. So I've got this old too, um, where it's just really stiff. You see how hard I have to, see how hard I have to press here just to get that to come out. So I'm gonna take a bit of lean paint and add that to my otherwise overly oily paint. So I like to keep some of the tubes that seem to be, put air quotes, dry. Um, in other words, they're more lean, meaning there's a higher pigment ratio or higher big pigment volume compared to the oil. This allows me to backtrack. You see how matte the color is getting there? That's letting me know that this is now too low in oil. Now, as I grab the rest of this, I'm at just about the same viscosity. I might even be a little lean right now, which isn't a problem because I can always remedy that, which is a tiny little drop of the oil. But let me just mix this up a bit more thoroughly. And then, yeah, it seems pretty good. This is the, like I said before, the most important part. I also like when I put my paint down, do you see how I don't just leave a, like a pea-sized blob, but I take the paint and then I drag it. That allows me to grab a smaller amount of paint, just a little bit more controlled as opposed to being a top grabber or grabbing paint from the top of a mountain, um, which usually is going to result in um, grabbing too much paint. That's synthetic alizarin and natural rose matter. I usually only have one of those on my palette. Um, I just did that because I just made it, so I might as well have it on my palette. I'm gonna grab a new rag. Clear this off. Now I've got um, two different raw umbers. Like I said before, I'm not a huge fan of, calci or of calcined clay-based pigments. So I have a, you know, we're doing essentially a French painting. So I thought it appropriate to have a French umber, but I also have, you know, one of my favorite regions to get raw umber pigments from is, um, or to use my favorite raw umbers are from Cyprus off the coast of Greece, a little bit closer to, um, a little bit closer to Turkey, 
Egypt. So there's a little bit of red left over there. That's okay. I'm going to grab this warmer Ooh, viscosity. That's decent. Um, I want to actually reduce the particle size of this. So I'm actually just going to take my molar. I'm going to stretch it far. And that's going to make the paint a touch smoother. I'm applying quite a bit of pressure. As you can see, my table's kind of moving around. So now the paint has gotten much smoother. Now watch as I pick it up. Still has this kind of matte finish to it, right? You see that matte finish? Remember what we talked about, about the critical pigment volume concentration? Remember what I said also, when we reduce a particle size, we generally need a bit more oil um, because now we have increased the surface area. So I'm gonna grab a tiny bit of that vacuum bodied linseed oil or stand oil. Do you see the value difference already? And the color difference? So now let's take, mix some of that up. You see now the difference in color and value. So this is why it's so important to be controlling the viscosity of your paint is because you may be painting this thinking that this is the value that you're getting. Then when you varnish your painting, that's what it turns to. That's a pretty big shift in value, how light or how dark, also how chromatic it is. Scoop this all up together. Give it a good mix. Getting a small motor like this is very useful, especially if you're, you know, wanting to paint at, you know, if you already are painting professionally or wanting to paint at this level, I think that every painter should at least have some experience making paint or learning about paint in general, because this control of paint is not something that most people are familiar with. But to me, this is one of the most basic and necessary things that I would introduce my students to, which is why we are doing it right now. Um, because if your viscosity is, you know, uncontrolled, going all over the place, it just makes, you know, the, the time on the surface of the painting uncontrolled too. It's hard to get better when you're constantly juggling all of these different um, variables. This is the same raw umber, whatever, they're a little bit lighter. It's not, not too big of an issue. This has a nice oiliness to it, but can you hear that? Can anybody hear that? Nails on a chalkboard. Yes. Ooh, scratchy. Particle size, just a little bit gritty and sandy, which is great for an earlier layer. I like varied particle size because that actually bounces more light. Per the question a little bit earlier about Rembrandt, um, larger particle size reflect more light than homogeneously small particle sizes. So I'll mull this first. Typically, what, I'm, what I would do is I would add a tiny bit of stand oil or vacuum body linseed oil first. Um, that way I just mull it once, but I'm going to do this, go over this again for all of you. That way you can see that the color is going to get more matte. You can actually hear once the paint particle gets smaller. You'll hear these particles scream. And then eventually, do you see how it got real quiet? So you can hear, you know, a, a blind man could, could make your paint for you in a way, just by feeling and just by listening. Of course, we can use our eyes too. But can you see how this color's got nice and matte now? That's a nice reduction. I'm gonna go back to my palette knife, grabbing a small quantity of that vacuum bodied linseed oil. Look at the difference. It's almost as if you were oiling out the paint. Now, if you're painting with this umber, which is too lean, too, you know, it, it's gonna make problems for you. So just I would really stress that. Scoop all that up. 
music together. And I'm happy to take more questions too, by the way. Sorry, Eric, I was just making sure I, if there were any questions that I left unanswered. Guys, if you could do me a favor, if I didn't answer your question, um, can you please retype it for me and we'll pass it on to Eric? Thank you. Do you Keep in mind, if you're, if you're grinding type it. on your palette um, that you paint with, chances are you're gonna texture it a bit. There'll be some scratchiness on it. Um, that happens. Final one is our black. Since what we are painting is from an 18th century painting, um, I could have Prussian blue on my palette. I just don't feel the need for it for the flesh tones that we're going to be doing. Um, I also don't mind a tiny bit of umber left over here because I am gonna use bone black for my final color. Really good viscosity. But once again, I want you to look at the matteness here. See how matte finish that is? I want my dark value. I'm just gonna grab the tiniest bit of vacuum bottle <laughs> oil, like, oil like that. I'm hearing a bit of an echo of myself. Hey guys, can you do me a favor please and just type your questions in the chat? There's just a lot of people and I don't want anybody to get cut off. Great. Thank you. So look at the value difference there. That's how dark, if you were to put pure black or one of your darkest values, a vacuum body linseed oil is really helpful, even at a very small quantity. It can, can bring out the vibrancy, lushness, and value, and in color some of your paints. And just mix that up with the palette knife. The surprising difference nonetheless, though. Now all of my paints share a similar viscosity. Eric, can you please describe the difference between vacuum bodied oil versus high acid linseed oil when, for, when correcting viscosity? If I add regular linseed oil, what is going to happen is whenever you add linseed oil, whenever you add, you know, whatever vegetable oil it is, one thing that you can always assume, your drying time is going to increase. In other words, your paint's gonna dry slower. Across the board, we're not talking about alkage, we're not talking about cicatives, black oils, alkage, or any of those things. But when we just add an oil, be it walnut oil, linseed oil, um, the drying time is gonna slow. Now, the difference between, let's say our vacuum body linseed oil or our stand oil and a refined linseed oil is A, the refined linseed oil is going to decrease the viscosity at a greater rate. Hence, a higher viscosity oil is going to keep the paint at a higher viscosity. Lower viscosity oil is going to lower the viscosity at a faster or a greater rate. When you are using a polymerized linseed oil that is heated in a vacuum, we're talking about vacuum bodied linseed oil commonly known as stand oil, that vacuum bodied linseed oil or stand oil is not going to yellow or darken more over the course of time. For some odd reason, what you get is what you get. So if I were to add this, this is going to impart some darkening and some yellowing to my white, albeit not very much. This is going to do less. The catch is when you add refined linseed oil or just regular linseed oil in, in, in general, this is going to darken in yellow more than its blonde color at the moment. So that's the big catch is they're all gonna slow the drying. Of course, one is gonna keep your viscosity higher, um, but at least there's not going to be a big difference in the amount of yellowing and darkening when you add the stand oil. 
or the vacuum bodied linseed oil. So those are the some of the main differences. I'm just taking my gloves off and I'll get very sweaty very fast. Um, what other differences are there? You're gonna there... you're going to experience less sinking in when you use a vacuum bodied linseed oil as opposed to a regular refined linseed oil. Um, you're going, your paint's gonna dry with a more kind of enamel finish. If you add too much vacuum bodied linseed oil, if you can't even keep your paint on your palette knife, um, that might mean your viscosity is a little too low. Um, and at that point, the, you might experience wrinkling um, or alligatoring, depending on you know, what pigment you chose, but um, the whole, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So if you add too much stand oil into your paint, you're going to deal with much, much bigger issues. Um, your paint will take an excessively long time to dry if you add too much to, especially a slow drying color, um, to the point where it will drip. It'll, it'll, it'll essentially drip down your painting because it'll be wet and sticky for weeks. But that's also an excessive amount of stand oil that you would add. Hey, Eric, I got another question for you. Um, what might happen if your pigments have different viscosities in a single layer of paint? Um, so ideally, they have a similar viscosity, which is the critical pigment volume concentration. If they have differing viscosities, um, you deal with, oops, start back up. Um, you have to deal with um, certain bits of the paint drying faster, certain bits drying slower. If you add a very um, lean paint to a mixture, it can decrease the overall pigment volume concentration for that one specific area. Um, it's a very complex issue. That's why I like to just keep an equal viscosity overall. Um, when I think practically, what happens while you're working is you lose control over the paint on the painting. You've probably, uh, many of you have probably experienced a long day of painting where you're trying to do some of those final details and you load up your soft brush and you try to make a mark. And it's almost as if there's, almost as if no matter what you do, the paint won't fall off of your paintbrush. Why that's happening is because the paint on your painting is a lower viscosity than the paint on your paint brush. So generally speaking, when you are working in, a, in the course of a day, your paint should start at a higher viscosity and gradually turn to a lower viscosity. So if I'm pulling a 15 hour day of painting, which I usually am doing, um, I will have my paint all relatively lean in the beginning of my day and then gradually add a drop or two of oil to the mixtures up here throughout my day, still within the, still within the confines of the critical pigment volume concentration, still keeping them all relatively equal. I will rarely add extra oil to things like alizarin's, rose matters, or ultramarines, those very oily colors in general. I try to avoid adding more oil because they're usually the nature of the pigment provides a very low viscosity all by themselves. Eric, can you please point out the paints on your strings when you have a chance? Lead white, lead tin yellow, genuine Naples yellow, yellow ochre, genuine vermilion, alizarin crimson, Rose matter, raw umber, raw umber, black. Bone black or lead black? Bone black. I would never use lamp black for reasons that I stated earlier that high carbon blacks have a tendency to be very poor dryers and crack a lot, which is why I add a tiny bit of stand oil into that black as well to reduce some of the cracking over the course of time. I have um, a participant asking, are there any alternatives for umbers that you would recommend? Um, what are you trying, what does alternative mean? Like, are we talking about different shades of umber? Are we talking 
different pigments all together. Whoever had the umber question, I, I apologize. There's a lot of questions in the chat. Go ahead and unmute and ask. I think this pertained to underpainting, Eric. You could use Sienna's. You could use Sienna's. You can use a synthetic iron oxide. Um, we are actually right at, I believe we're right at our lunch time, or at least a couple minutes from it. So we are essentially good to go for, um, for some people, the afternoon, for some people, the dead of night. Um, in the beginning, I'd like, you know, as we get back from that lunch, one hour break or that lunch period, I'm going to go over just some of the marks that the each of the paintbrush is going to make based on their hairs. And then we're going to, going to jump right into the demo. Let me actually show you what we are going to be working on in the format of it while we're at it. So one moment. So this is what you can expect. Just one moment. There we go. So this is what you can expect for today. This is a painting that I started in a previous workshop. This was one single layer. We're essentially just going to be developing this forward um, using the um, couches or the couche. Um, we're going to be applying thin transparent veils. I'm also going to go over making these paints more transparent through the use of a transparent pigment as opposed to the excessive addition of medium. That way we can maintain the viscosity of our paint by adding a trans, consider it like an amendment color or a transparent paint. That's going to allow us to um, adulterate the transparency of our paint while also um, allowing us to maintain the control as we're here on the actual painting. So I'll take one more question if if somebody wants to, you know, ask one more before we uh, break for an hour. Nothing. Bueller. Bueller. Um, Eric. Oh, is there? Is there an alternative to the genuine vermilion? You can use a cadmium. Um, if you're using cadmium red, I would put barite chalk, barite or chalk into it to reduce its tinting strength though. Cadmium red is just so intense, so high tinting strength. You know, the genuine vermilion isn't nearly that, um, you know, much of a bully. So um, I would add some, amendment to it, be it powder glass, calcium carbonate, calcite, um, or barite, barium sulfate, um, into the cadmium red to just decrease the tinting strength a bit. You just have to be careful because barite in particular is a terribly slow drying color. Cadmium red obviously is also a very slow drying color. Usually modern manufacturers are going to put some, some type of cicative in it without even telling you to speed up some of the drying times of those um, troublesome colors too, to equalize the drying time across the board, which is a very big no-no in my opinion. Um, but that's why, I, that's why I kind of make my paint when I can and use paint without stabilizers and additives um, as well. But that, that should give you a similarly um, acting color, similar color as well. Of course, cadmium is going to be just a little bit higher chroma. All righty. So if if any of you want to actually like chime in here, I'm gonna I'm gonna just press pause for a minute. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm just getting the palette squared away. What's going on with you? I just have to get a store. Here we go. Hold on, everybody. Just give me one second. It's just not registering my palette camera. Just a moment. Pause this. There we go. Sorry about that. All righty. Welcome back, everybody. Um, those of you that had to join a little bit late, just a couple of things. Uh, Everything is going to be recorded. You will get an email either tonight or tomorrow morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, that's going to have a link to a you. This is going to be uploaded on YouTube. So everything um, in the morning and the demo is going to be recorded. So you don't need to worry about that. Every second of this will be recorded for you. I know there's a lot of questions I wanted to think you all verbally for your, your kind comments and we will do our best to get to every single one of your questions. Um, yeah, so let's get going. So we've got, we've got this. Now, this was done in a single wet layer. If you do, if you are interested in seeing the beginning of this, there is, if, if you go to the ARA Boston link for you know, upcoming webinars, if you scroll all the way down, this is part of another webinar workshop, so you can get um, the video at the beginning of this. Um, um, so you can see if you were interested in doing this as a copy or wanting to see um, some of the grammar of coloring. This was primarily a skin tones workshop, um, but you can see how that began if you want. Hey, Eric, um, can you please adjust your microphone? Yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to turn the gain up and change the pattern. There's a couple questions in the chat too, Eric. Whenever you're ready, I'll read them to you. Sure, go for it. Cool, so I have one. If your um, tube paint is too oily, how do we correct that? If you've got a tube, kind of like I did, that is the same color, just a little bit more lean, you can do that. You can put it on a piece of cardboard or a paper towel or something that's gonna absorb or suck that oil. Um, out of it as well. So putting the paint on something that's absorbent is a great idea. If you have intentions to make the paint, for example, more transparent, what you can do is you can um, actually add an extender pigment. For example, if I have a paint that's too oily, I can add calcium carbonate or chalk um, one of those pigments that are going to make it more transparent while also, you know, just adding that pigment, which is going to make the quantity of pigment closer um, to the critical pigment volume concentration relative to the oil. So that's an option. Adding more pigment to the paint is an option. Sucking the oil out of the paint is an option. If you want to keep the viscosity of the paint the same, what you can do is you can make a medium. So this is a medium. This is just a little tube that I have here. This is a mixture of powdered glass, fume silica, and linseed oil. So yeah, very simply put, only if, you, if you're familiar with natural pigments, it's um, a gel medium called oleogel, which is a mixture of 
fumed silica and linseed oil. That's at a 70-30 ratio favoring um, 70 favoring linseed oil. So that's 70% linseed oil, 30% um, fume silica. Fume silica is just terribly light. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, Eric, so sorry to interrupt. You're still getting a little feedback on your mic. What does it sound like? There's a slight room echo. Okay. Well, that's going to, that, that, that may be what it has to be. So, okay. um, you know, I can't be standing here. Like right now I'm like talking right in the microphone. So there's not much of that, but I do. It's not have, like terrible, but I, I just do have to know. go back and forth from the easel to that. And my microphone is essentially in the center there. So if that sounds bearable, then, you know, that that's just what it has to be. Okay. Um, another question from Amanda. Do you mix new paint piles every time um, you go to paint or do you preserve it overnight and whatnot? Um, if I'm, I mean, I'm usually painting most, most days. So um, if I have a slow enough drying color, yeah, I would just use it for tomorrow. For example, this genuine vermilion, I could sit that out on my palette for like five days and it'd be fine. You know, it, it, it'd be totally fine. The alizarin, I could let that sit on my palette for like three weeks and it would barely even skin over. Um, the lead, I would just toss away. That dries very fast. The lead tin yellows, those dry very fast. Bone black would be good for a few days, even if you didn't put it in the freezer or anything. I don't recommend putting paint in the freezer because when you put it in the freezer, take it out, you do have to deal with condensation. Um, that um, introduces water to your paint, which makes me worry about efflorescence and things like that. So I'm not a huge fan of freezing my paint. I think it's just easier to um, have nice fresh paint every single day. So for the most part, I make my paint fresh every day, but there are times when I'll just let it sit on my palette and just use it in the morning, especially if I know it's going to still be wet. The fast drying colors, the umbers, I'd never save. Half the time, you know, the umbers can't last you know, they can't hang with the amount of time that I'm painting. So um, I would toss those at the end of every single day. I'm just going to fold up a couple of paper towels. I'm just going to put them here where you can't see. So I've got these paper towels here just to kind of wipe some paint off. Now, one thing that I don't do a lot of, you know how some people make a brush stroke and then they do this, they yank paint off with their brush. That's a great way to make your, let's say your flat brush do that. So if you're constantly applying friction to your brush, it's eventually going to start making those um, fibers kind of splay out as if you were to take a, um, a balloon string and score it. You're essentially doing that every single time you're yanking off paint, you're damaging the fibers um, a little bit. So I try to do that very little. If I have to do it, I essentially do it like that. I might pull it off, but I'd much rather open up a new brush or use a new brush as opposed to, um, you know, be yanking the paint off of my brush. I like once my brushes are filled with good paint, good mixtures anyway. So I would just use more and more paint. I intended to do some of um, some mark making to show, you know, what the different paint brushes will do. I think as opposed to doing it on a blank uh, canvas, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do it. Um, we're going to we're going to handle it while we're working. So that's going to be a bit more practical. So what I have here, this is my. Um, I will consider this my glazing amendment. This looks like white paint, right? Looks like white paint. It's a mixture of glass, fume silica and um, linseed oil. So what I'm going to what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up a handful of um, mixtures that are slightly transparent. So I'm going to start off with some mixtures that I know without you know any shadow of a doubt of that I'll use. One of them is um, red and white to create this pink. Now, in you know today's painting, the main thing that is you know so discouraged is using the color very pure. Um, when you actually assess analysis of many old masters paintings, I mean, they primarily used limited palettes and many of, you know, many of their mixtures are actually far more simple than we like to paint. So um, I'm not going to, I'm going to follow a principle 
um, to make the most vibrant painting I can. Now, keep, keep in mind this. A yellow pigment only looks yellow because that is the color that it rejects. So it will absorb all of the visible wavelengths of light that make it look green or red or blue. And it will simply reject the yellow. And that's what we see. So the rest of the colors, um, they all are rejecting the color that they're not, essentially absorbing the other wavelengths of the, the colors that they enjoy and they you know, partake in. So the more pigments we mix together, the grayer and lower chroma, chroma meaning the, in chromat the intensity of the color, how vibrant it seems. So what is most important here is that our mixtures are as simple as they possibly could be. And that is going to lead to a higher chroma painting in general. So I want to make the um, I want to make the most vibrant paintings I possibly can because who wants to make a, a dull painting? I'm just gonna change the exposure there. That way you can see those colors and those values just a bit better. Um, I've I've pretty much made a general gradation. I'm not a big fan of making lots of swatches. For example, you know, I've seen some people, you know, they mix up this value and then they've got a swatch. They mix up this value, then they've got a swatch and they mix up that value there, a swatch. And then they've got 50 million like swatch mixtures to which they only use like three or four or five of them. Um, I find it much more intuitive to have a natural gradation because then I can grab any value of this color that I want within that gradation. I've messed up my light under the scale. I'll just add a bit more of that lead white number one or that stacked lead white. Now to make this just a bit more transparent, I'm gonna take this um, powdered glass amendment. I'm just gonna put a little dollop in each of those areas. I already have light value on my brush so I'm just go or on my palette knife. So I'm just going to mix this into my paint Eric, when you have a chance, can you please um, reiterate the ratio of glass silica and the linseed oil? So, fume silica to linseed oil, 70-30 ratio. 70% linseed oil, 30% fume silica. Add another, um, pretty much however big that dollop is, mix you know, double that with powdered glass. So then 50-50 ratio, powdered glass to fume silica and linseed oil. Follow me? Then if the viscosity is the tiniest bit too stiff, add a few drops of that vacuum body linseed oil or that stand oil to the mixture. I'm gonna take and make a mixture of genuine vermilion, and lead tin yellow now. More lead tin yellow as I come down. More vermilion red as I go up. This peachy color as I sometimes like to call it. Once I have that, I'm gonna grab a tiny bit of that powdered glass medium or amendment, I will call it. This is going to make the paint more transparent, remember. When I'm creating are these different transparent mixtures for my couch or for my cooch. So cooch is French for laying down. When you see a Bouguereau, a Jerome, um, or a bark, this would typically be the working procedure. This I will apply transparently. You can consider this almost like a glaze with the exception being I'm going to be working into that glaze as opposed to just leaving a thin veil or transparent layer of paint. I'm gonna start mixing up some of the darker valued um, colors. For example, I'm gonna take some of my black and white Oops, let me make that. I was gonna move the uh, reference. That way we get a little bit more space.
There we go. I'm going to take black and white, essentially create a gradation out of that as well. Really nice, cool gray, that black and white. Add a bit of this powder glass. Later, if we have some time, I'll even show you how when we add that powder glass, I mean, it really doesn't change the value of even dark value or even of you know dark valued colors. For example, I can mix it into my black and it won't make my black look much brighter at all. Not in the same way that even just the tiniest speck of white will. Eric, you had some questions about the Zorn palette and the Munso coloring system. All right, hit me with them. So Zorn, would you recommend that? And are you an advocate of the Munso color mixing system? Uh, so I'll start with Zorn. Zorn is the Zorn, I'm gonna put big air quotes up there. The Zorn palette is great. Um, which is essentially what you see me working with for the most part. We've got white, we've got our high chroma red, we've got our yellow ochre, we've got our black. Um, but you know, when you really look at Zorn's work, I mean, there's a lot of evidence of many other colors in there. So the way that I interpret the Zorn palette is that there are certain colors that are essential to a figurative or a portrait artist that you will almost always see on the palette. <laughs> Black is almost always on the palette of portrait artists, figurative artists. Um, talk to you know an impressionistically trained person and they would scoff at that, but um, Black is always on there. We've got our high chroma red, that can be cadmium red, that can be genuine vermilion. We almost always have yellow ochre as well. Zorn used that as his primary means, but when the situation called for a higher chroma yellow or a higher chroma blue, like his painting of Isabella Stewart Gardner, you can see the evidence of all of those other colors kind of coming in. So although the Zorn palette is a great starting point to understand temperature and cut and value, temperature and um, color relationships. I think that gradually adding colors that you deem necessary is also very important. Munsell, I don't know a ton about it. And to me, I'm overly analytical as I'm sure you're all starting to learn a little bit about me. Um, for me, Munsell takes, I don't know, Perhaps the Munsell system, I think, is an excellent tool for people who do not have enough vocabulary about mixing colors or just a standardized vocabulary um, to communicate color in, you know, space. For example, you know, we have we have color in space regarding, you know higher or value or higher or lower value, lighter or darker, higher or lower chroma. And then we also have the limitations of the reality that we live in. For example, there are much more high value, high chroma yellows in the world than there are low value yellows in the world that are also high chroma. Meanwhile, there are much more high chroma, low value or high chroma dark blues and dark um, violets, dark reds, compared to very, very dark high chroma oranges. So if you can think of, you know, color in space as this kind of misshapen egg, you know, you should, you should be able to com communicate with, uh, you know, anybody about what are those kind of facets that can be used to describe any color it's chromatic intensity being higher or lower, it's value being higher or lower, and then it's general hue, whether it's closer to blue or closer to red, you know, a green can lean more neutral, more lower chroma, but it can also lean a more blue green, it can lean more um, red green, you know, you know, there's, there's, or more yellow green, you know, there's, there's, I think, a really good importance in that. When it comes to the replication of all of the charts 
and the, the swatches and you know all of like the numbering of it um that to me is when i get totally lost um i think that for me i paint from a you know from like a philosophy and a grammar of coloring that i've essentially acquired from copying the old masters and studying the old masters not that i'm trying to just um grope at what the old masters did is what I want to do. And that's the beginning and end of it. But to me, there's, you know, if, if to me, it takes some of the spontaneity, or at least when I tried to really get into it, it, it made some of that spontaneity harder to achieve. When I think that a better way of learning, for me personally, a better way of learning color was to give myself higher chroma colors than I use in the studio and go plain air painting and discover what impressionistic uh, array and mixing of color can I use to achieve a look that is similar to reality. Because- Eric, is there, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say my, one of my main philosophies is to mix no more than three pigments in every single mixture with white maybe being the third or fourth. So if I can make a mixture out of two pigments, that's excellent. If I can mix out of three, that's great too. Four is pushing it. Five, I've really messed up the mixture. I know I'm usually started over. Is there an alternative to bone black that you would recommend? Roman black, Mars black, some iron oxide based black. I'm going to essentially make a green. I, I, you know, I've got red, um, red, blue, green, orange, essentially. That's vermilion and genuine Naples yellow um, or Lenten yellow. This, um, we've got vermilion and white. This, we just have black and white. This, we have black and Naples yellow, more or less. i add a little bit of that amendment to help make my color more transparent without making it super oily because we spent a long time getting those colors to be at the right viscosity. Make sure I mix enough paint too. I don't want to be too miserly with the quantity of paint that I'm using. Um, I'm just going to That's be pretty orderly here. I'm gonna also make a couple of dark reddish mixtures. So I'm gonna grab vermilion and my French raw umber. I'm gonna mix those together. More or less, just keep that red pretty warm, gradually getting darker towards my raw umber. If I want to make that even darker, I can add just a touch of black towards the end of it as well. It gives me quite a few options to choose from, where I'm going from two mixtures to a little bit of a third to primarily just raw umber and black over here. There are many other variations. I can take, you know, just the straight um, black. I can take just straight black and vermilion as well. Mix those together. See what I'm going to get. There, I can take, you know, my umber with my ochre or my umber with my Lenten yellow. Um, so there's there's a variety of other mixtures that I can make. Um, right now, these are going to be um, our basic ones. I just want to see if I can get that out of the glare. All right, well, let's get to it. So one interesting thing to note is that the Trakel Spectrum brushes are a nylon synthetic, but they have none of those grooves, none of that kind of coarseness on the um, actual fibers. Now, when I'm mixing paint and everything, I wear gloves because it's a messy job. Now that I've got all of that paint mixed up. I actually take my gloves off because 
Um, a, my hands get all sweaty, and B, um, I'm very orderly. Once I have this set up, um, I never let my brushes roll into my paint. So I barely will ever, you know, get paint on my hands at all. Um, I'll certainly wash my hands, you know, following it, but I lose control over my paint brushes. So I, I do like to, um, I do like to not wear gloves when I'm painting in general. The sweatiness of my hands just kind of bothers me. Bit of a pet peeve, but that is what it is. Now the first first concern that we kind of have to think about whenever starting a paint starting painting for the day, fresh and new is how much sinking in am I dealing with? And surprisingly, because I've added a little bit of that vacuum body linseed oil, you can see that this painting has a slight gloss to it. I could oil this out and you would experience, you would see very, very little difference in the um, sinking in. So the com combination of our, you know, quadruple oil primed linen or a lead oil primed linen compared to, you know, one, you know, this painting, which, you know, you can see there's a certain matteness to it. If I were to oil that out, that would be much darker. This, because the values are generally lighter and because I use a bit of that vacuum body linseed oil, I'm actually experiencing very little sinking in. So the, you know, the, the million dollar question is, if you don't have to oil out, should you? And the, the answer is kind of no, um, you shouldn't. Oiling out is actually not a good thing to do. Shocker as that might be. Um, it is sometimes a necessary thing to do, especially when you're working on a very dark painting. But when you oil out, what is most important is that you completely cover every single little area that you applied oil to. Because when you apply unpigmented oil, what is going to happen is that oil is going to dry. It's going to harden and become a solid, which we will call a linoxin. That linoxin will yellow and darken. So it will be essentially like putting a yellow glaze on it just in the section or in the pattern that you oiled it out. So if you choose to oil out, you can use your, you know, the, the cleanest linseed oil that you can find. You can apply it with a makeup sponge. That way the quantity of that um, oil that you apply is very, very minimal. If you are looking to get greater opacity, um, not applying a, you know, any oil or not oiling out is actually better. If you want more transparency, oiling out can be good. Um, in past workshops, I've talked about ways to kind of get around this where as opposed to oiling out with unpigmented oil, we actually apply a glaze, just a broad general glaze and then, and then work into that. That's essentially what we are doing here, but in a more piecemeal or in a bit more of a specific way as opposed to a broad manner where we might take the entire cheek, um, nose area and just put a, you know, red glaze on that and then a yellow glaze on the forehead and then a cool glaze on the um, chin area. So there's many options, but the most important thing here is to avoid oiling out and not working where you have oiled out. I saw some questions about varnishes. Um, you should always varnish your paintings. You should ideally wait um, until your painting is thoroughly dry. If you're using very fast drying pigments and straight linseed oil, the quantity of time that you might have to wait could be less than if you were using slower drying pigments. You want your painting to come to a very hard, um, thorough dry. You should be able to take a knuckle and you know pretty much do that and not see any paint on your finger. Um, general rule of thumb, six months would be great. If you can't wait that long, you can use a Regal Res 1094 varnish. Um, that's your Conservar from Natural Pigments. That's your Gamvar from um, Gamblin. Um, both Regal Res 1094 varnishes. I'm going to take, make one more mixture. I'm just going to take, I'm um, going to come down here. I'm just going to take white and Lenten yellow. Just gonna mix those together.
Eric, can I hit you with a couple questions? Yeah, hit me with it. Uh, differences between lead white one and lead white two and when you would use them? I would use, um, earlier in the workshop, I mentioned this lead white number one is lead white bound in linseed oil. Lead white number two is lead white bound in walnut oil. I don't prefer to use walnut oil these days because I am suspicious or worried that when it dries, it seems to lose mass or it seems to lose um, volume. So with that, the paint, when, when your paint dries, it puffs up, it swells. And then over a few days or a few weeks, it gradually shrinks. Now, um, linseed oil expands and then contracts just about to the same level that it was when it was wet initially. Meanwhile, walnut oil expands and then contracts far more than it was when it was wet. So there, is, there must be some volatile component in the um, walnut oil, which is making it lose that volume or lose that mass or weight. So I worry that that in conjunction with the fact that walnut oil generally um, is slower drying and generally also um, has a softer, weaker oil film. I choose to use linseed oil based paints. Um, walnut oil is not going to not yellow. You know, many people may think that walnut oil is not going to yellow like linseed oil, but over the course of time, it's almost guaranteed that they're both going to yellow about to the same degree. Um, it's just the rate at which that yellowing happens might differ slightly. I'm arming myself with a handful of brushes. I've got some Spectrum brushes. These are Spectrum Brights. Um, one thing that was mentioned earlier is that the Spectrum brushes are nylon synthetic and there are no grooves. So it's a very smooth hair fiber, um, which allows me to apply paint very smoothly. We don't want a very scratchy rough look to the painting. So I'm gonna apply quite a few of these, um, quite a few of these transparent veils of paint with this very smooth, soft brush. So first thing that I'm going to do is I'm gonna grab a little bit of my lead tin yellow. I'm gonna mix it in with my um, kind of pinkish color here. I'm trying to aim for a very similar value um, that I have here. Right away I do that and I'm just a little bit brighter. I can live with it being a touch brighter, but that may be uh, a little too bright for my liking. So I'm actually going to grab a little bit of my same mixture, which is essentially the same, that high chroma yellow and that red. I'm just gonna pull my, pull my transparent mixture here back just a bit, a little bit darker. I don't wanna go too dark. Great, and now I'm right on, right on target. I apologize that it you know, may look like I'm not doing anything, but that's essentially the key here is making sure that what we do is not too dramatic. So you can see that you know, there's that little speck of the value that I had before. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to unify this area with this transparent veil of paint. I can go a little bit brighter. I'll add a little bit of that white, a little bit more of that lead tin yellow. And I'm going to apply you see how I can just bump that up just a tiny bit brighter. As I move to the left, you can probably see a little bit more. I'll bump the uh, exposure down here so you can see that a bit better. Camera can't always catch everything that our eyes can. So here I'm just applying a slightly more chromatic transparent layer of paint in this plane just in that area. Now I'm going to tile away from that where I'm going to start applying different mixtures connected to and you know, beside that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go slightly darker. I'm gonna get slightly cooler as I go. So I'm gonna grab the you know, a very, very, very tiny bit of my greenish mixture to neutralize any of the red that's in my mixture. Also, that's going to ever so slightly darken it. I'm gonna apply that right here on the forehead. 
you can see that my, my intensity of color will go just a tiny bit higher. This will allow everything beside it to look slightly cooler um, in relationship. I'm gonna add a little bit more of that green to go a touch cooler and a touch darker. I'm gonna apply that on the forehead as we go away from the most light facing plane. Hold on, just, um, Liz, can you mute Samantha? Yes, sorry. Um, got another question for you. Is sure. cerium oxide similar to powdered glass? What is it called? Cerium oxide, similar to powdered glass. Uh, that is a new one to me. So I can't answer that. Um, I, that's, that's, I like when there's things that I've never heard of. Um, so I, I actually can't answer that because I don't have the knowledge for it. Do you believe that a yellow painting can be corrected by bleaching it in natural sunlight? Um, when you deprive your painting from natural light, um, they will yellow. So if you, if you were to store your painting in a dark closet, it will yellow. So when you expose it to light, I mean, and we're not talking put it in a sunny window, but just in a room that receives light, it will gradually lighten. You can even do that for, you know, your panels that you get, the store-bought panels or even a roll of linen. If you leave those panels or that linen out to be exposed to light, they will brighten up. So if that's not going to remedy the natural yellowing that's gonna happen when the painting dries. But it will, there is a level of that yellowing which is reversible. Um, so when you deprive your paintings from light, you will um, experience some additional yellowing. So to answer your question simply, um, yes and no. Oops, one second. You saw that error, right? Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> I got it. I got another question about varnishes when you're ready. Sure. My camera doesn't like that, um, uh, that I have it plugged in. So every now and then that happens, but that's natural. All right, hit me with that. Okay. What is your opinion on retouch varnish? And is it bad practice to work a painting after varnishing? Um, that might, I apologize for the, for the bluntness, but that might be among the greatest sins. Um, don't ever do that, ever do that. Um, if you work on it on top of the varnish, your varnish is, your varnish is the barrier between the outside contaminants, that's all of the contaminants, dust, smoke, everything in the air, um, that varnish protects your painting from that. Um, so your varnish is gonna yellow, it's gonna crack, it's gonna darken, it's gonna get dirty. Eventually your varnish has to be removed. So your varnish is the protecting layer. That varnish eventually has, eventually must be removed. So when you remove the varnish, off goes that new work. Now, when you use retouch varnish to get around um, the whole sinking in, uh, that also can be very problematic because try this. Take a painting that you don't care about if you have, let's say, mineral spirits and wipe your painting down with mineral spirits. Now, I mean, we're talking to stretch linen. The mineral spirits will penetrate all the way to the back and it will wet the back of the, lin back of the linen, which is telling you that that mineral spirits can permeate through every single layer of, those, of that paint. So when that mineral spirit comes to touch, when you, for example, you do retouch varnish in between layers. At the end of your painting, you varnish it like you should. The mineral spirits in the varnish will penetrate all of those layers and it will also dissolve your retouch varnish layers, which will cause it to swell 
because your varnish also swells before it shrinks as it dries. So it will turn your painting to like a puff pastry. You may not notice many of the negative ramifications right away, but over the course of time, all you have to do is, um, over the course of time, you'll notice. You may not be alive to notice it, depending on how um, well you or thin um, you handled everything, but Joshua Reynolds is a great example of experiments gone wrong. Look at Joshua Reynolds' earlier work when he was a student compared to his later work when he was um, deep into experimentation. And you will see that his later paintings actually look way, way, way worse than his earlier paintings, which actually don't look too bad at all. I'm gonna to continue to add a little bit of that greenish color to my pinkish, um, to my pinkish mixture here. I'm going to make my colors darker and cooler as I turn away from the light source. Good questions, by the way. I apologize. Eric, I have a question about um, David and how he worked his paintings. Do you, can you comment on that? Um, so, As in, did he build up his paintings in layers? Yes, much of the French neoclassical way of painting um, was, I, I, we could say to a degree, derives from, you know, David's, um, David's methods. I mean, he, he kind of paved the way for French academic painting, especially um, in the neoclassical tradition. So um, almost every, the majority of paintings would have started on as a drawing. That drawing would then be transferred and then there would be a layer called an emboche, um, which is a thin washy layer of paint which allows the artist to um, essentially establish the general value um, and color relationships. Then there were a few stages from dead color, first painting and second painting. Now in many Davids you see they're unfinished kind of in the same way that mine is unfinished where he developed the portraits first and then worked out from there. There are others that are worked more holistically if you were to look at you know, let's say Bouguereau's paintings or Jerome's paintings were using the exact same method, essentially, but in a slightly different manner. But yes, they are most certainly worked up in layers, first starting with thin and washy, where I would use, let's say, an opal brush, which, you know, I could apply that thin washy paint um, and, you know, push it around with a stiffer, um, with a stiffer hair, as opposed to relying on mineral spirit or some solvent, then um, it is worked up with more opacity. And in the final layers, that is where more transparency is used, kind of like I am doing here, where I am establishing some of these transparent mixtures on top of my dry foundation. I just want to decrease the value relationship with that shadow, how it meets the light. So right here, I need a cooler, lighter value. So I'm going to add a tiny bit of my cool gray to my pinkish, orangish mixture. I want to decrease the value relationship. There are a couple of ways to soften an edge. We can take a soft brush and blend it together. We also can just use the values. So right now I am primarily looking to value to make my change in edge quality. So I'm not looking to come in with some soft brush. I'm looking to definitively, definitively say this value or this plane here I'm saying it's generally going to be that value. It's going to be that level of lightness. Now, if there's a hard edge between the shadow and the light here, it is because there is too much contrast. I feel good about my light. I feel like this might actually be a little bit darker, could be darker, but this shadow here is definitely too dark too. 
So by lightening my shadow to still be darker than my light plane, I can help essentially soften the edge between the two. I'm using a number four um, Trakel Spectrum. I'm just gonna say what they are. You can generally assume all the brushes I'm using are Trakel. Trakel has been so kind as to sponsor this whole event. And it's all I essentially have anyway. I'll send you guys some more links too in the chat for the uh, Trakel brushes. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this cool color and I'm just going to hug my warm shadows as well. That's around the brow. And that is also around the warm shadows. Remember, if, our, if we are working from natural light, which pretty much every artist before electricity was, um, cool light source, North Light Studio, which means relatively warm shadows. To complement that warmth in the shadow, there's usually a cool half tone coming right out of that shadow. I'm using cool grays and cool greenish colors to differentiate between a slightly warmer and a slightly cooler color. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going to take a slightly greener value, slightly darker. Once again, I want to soften a bit. So I'm applying paint in a fairly direct manner around these shadow divisions. I can start to drag the paint from one piece into another and almost seam or um, stitch the colors together. So one thing that you notice in a lot of old master work is the preference for round brushes. And in order to get a smooth transition, there would be a very systematic method of hatching with the brushwork, which you can see very which you can see is very reminiscent of the older master drawings that have such wonderful flamboyant hatchwork. Now, when you look at the hatchwork in an old master drawing or engraving or etching, there's there's something so hard to comprehend you know, with how they knew exactly how to make each of those curves go around the form. But that way of thinking is carried over and into the painting to let the brush strokes wrap around the form while also creating a stronger sense of three-dimensionality or volume. Eric, when you have a chance, can you please elaborate more on cool, warm, cool transitions and relationships? So if our, if our light source is relatively cool, we will have a relatively warm shadow shape. From the warm shadow shape, there will be a pattern that develops. Now, this is not to dogmatize or to say that everything follows you know, this idealistic principle um, to any extreme degree, but the pattern exists in reality, the visual reality that we all partake in. Um, but the pattern is warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool. Now, those relationships are all relative. So a cool color in one area might be a, a cool area in one area might be warm relative to another. I will pull up a, um, I'll pull up a drawing or a painting to illustrate. Obviously not a drawing. Um, just one moment. Da, 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 da. Where are you? I res, I res. There we are. Just one moment. And guys, if I missed any of your questions, please feel free to wait a couple minutes and then repost them and I'll do my very best. We're getting a lot of them. Thank you.
Okay, so this is my painting of Beatrice. Um, every single this many people see this, you know, on Instagram or online, and it's like, oh, did you did you glaze? Do you blend? And I'm like, yeah, not really. Um, when you really get up close to it, you can see the the thought process that I've got this warm, you know, we have this kind of warmer yellower highlight. Surrounding that is a pinkish cooler light. Then surrounding that is a warmer oranger. Then we've got a cool moment, then a warm moment, then we're back to cool, back to warm, then we're at cool transition. Um, then we're back to warm shadows. I mean, look at how red that is. Look at how warm and vibrant those shadows are. From a distance, all you see is Beatrice. All you see is this painting. You see her. But when you really start to get up close, I mean, there's some incredibly bold, vibrant warms in the shadow. Of course, it's not overly garish that there are a mixture of, you know, cools in the warms and warms in the cools. And that kind of interplay, that intermixture is what makes it seem to be also smooth and so lifelike to where when you look at the color of the asphalt road or the white wall sometimes it's difficult to discern exactly what color it is and the same thing with flesh tones we have to abide by a somewhat organized reality because we do live in an existence which follows by patterns and you know reality has a you know i think there's an integrity in nature that we as artists and throughout history artists have paved the way for scientific innovation um, so I think that deeply looking into reality as it exists, but also within your own psyche, as far as, you know, what you are saying is aesthetically pleasing or appealing to you can help you formulate a grammar of coloring or a control over the colors that goes beyond just what the photo is telling you or just what your eyes are telling you, because there are many optical illusions um, in play at all times to convince you that one area is warmer or cooler or lighter or darker, such as simultaneous contrast, that optical illusion, which can make a color look warmer or cooler relative to what is around it. So the main grammar of coloring in this case is warm shadows, cool half tones, warm lights, coolest, highlights. So my highest lights are more gray or more cold pink as opposed to being extremely vibrant, while in another case that might not be the case. I hope that was helpful. Is there a recommended way to train your eyes to see and distinguish between the warm and cool? Um, to distinguish the difference between the two, I do think that experience is, um, I hate to say paint more, but paint more. And, you know, the, the most difficult thing with relationships is assessing how warm one color is compared to a different valued color. Because it's easy to say that this right here is cooler than the warms that's, that are next to it. It's easy to see that this shadow now is cooler than the shadow that is above it. But when you're looking at very dramatically different values, that's where it becomes much more difficult. One of the best things that you can do is study after the masters. Um, for example, doing master copies where that grammar of coloring is very evident or noticeable can be a great way of um, bringing that to your sensitivity, your you know, observations. That's how I've had to go about it personally. I hate that that's not you know, a perfect example, but no, I don't have one recommendation. Um, I think that one of the main things is studying after the masters and especially looking for fine examples that you 
that you feel are reaching that aesthetic ideal. Now, if you want your work to have the soul of a Rembrandt or the soul of a Vermeer or a Da Vinci or whatever, I mean, you should probably be doing some master copies of their work because there are hidden lessons, there are hidden secrets in the master's work that your eyes alone will not get. Copying it is one of the only ways that I know of to unlock some of the mysteries of the masters. And, and, and you don't even need to use all of their exact materials and everything, but it's as if uh, a musical composer or a, you know, a, a pianist wants to be this great musician, but is you know, not even playing the scales. They're just wailing on the piano and hoping that magic comes out of it. They learn to play their scales. They learn to, the scales are equivalent to your academic exercises, learning about shape and value and form. Um, and then they, they play music from past artists, past composers or other musicians. And that unlocks a level of proficiency with their medium, a musical one based on sound, which then they can interpret and you know, pretty much introduce their own individuality, their own, their own kind of um, sound-based aesthetics too. Eric, do you have time during the webinar to go over the different strokes that each brush will make? Yes, let me actually just take a moment to just, let me, let me actually go over that because all of this is just going to take time. So let's actually get, let's get a panel up here. There's a few of them that I think are just so useful and so important. So let's just put that there. Great. I'll zoom out a bit. Okay. So the first, the first brushes that we are going to talk about are going to be the spectrum brushes. Now with the spectrum brushes, once again, it's nylon, nylon fiber, and it's a very smooth fiber. So when I, when I load up my brush, now one key here is look at how much paint is on my brush. Do you see where the ferrule is? Never get your paint touching that ferrule. That's a, you know, that's a fast route to you ruining your brush. The, the Spectrum Brights, these are flats essentially. They make very nice, smooth, oops, where's my brush? There we are, sorry, I did it a little too high. They make very smooth swatches of paint. So you can get a very smooth, clean patch of paint. Now you can couple that with, you know, let's say a darker one, you can put that right beside it and have a very delicate change in, let's say, temperature and keep it very smooth and relatively blended without having to pull out, you know, old faithful, your, you know, your soft sable or your fan brush to actually do that smoothing. The smooth, smoothness happens just because of the smoothness of the fibers and also the control of the viscosity of the paint. Now, how many of you have spent one too many dollars on that, the worst little brush with the tiniest little hair. This isn't, this isn't a good example because I don't own any because I bore them so much. But have you ever spent the money on one of those little tiny brushes and it's just got the most tiny little bit of hair and you try to make a fine mark and it just completely just creates this little blob of paint. Um, no matter what you do, it, it essentially just leaves little blobs as opposed to leaving real marks. So I really like the Spectrum rounds, liners, and script brushes or riggers. So the liners are longer haired rounds. The rounds are, you know, a bit more of a um, beefier brush. So there's more hair in it in general. So this is the round brush. This is the liner brush. Same general size, just a different diameter, but essentially the same length. 
Following that, we have a rigger or a liner or a script brush, which is um, one of my favorite brushes. You see the old masters use these all the time. When you assess that wonderful calligraphy um, in you know, old master's hairs or in, in like an old master painting of hair. So these are the three round brushes that I use in the general day. So we've got line, we've got our round, our liner, and then our rigger. The rigger is so amazing. Watch what happens. I'm gonna just gonna take some of you know some of my black. Oh whatever, I'll, I'll grab a little bit of that rose matter. It's gonna to go to waste anyway. Um, I'm just going to load it up once again. Not getting any of that paint on the ferrule. I'm gonna do the same thing with the liner. I'm gonna do the same thing with the round brush. Now, a nice control over a round brush is great because a round brush can take on the characteristics of a filbert if you load up the brush the right way. I can leave a mark Essentially like that, it looks like a filbert, right? If you look at the side of the brush, you see it's really sharp like that. So I can also leave a long straight line. If I load it and twirl it, then I can essentially have a little bit of the best of both worlds. Now with the script and the rigor, one exciting thing is they simply don't run out of paint very easily. And that can sometimes be one of the most difficult things when painting is you're trying to use these little brushes and do those long details, those long curls, but you run out of paint. So with this liner brush, I just, I'm gonna use my mall stick. This is just a mahogany dowel, half an inch um, that I shellacked. I'm going to set the mall stick up to where it acts as a guide for my hand. That way I can maintain an equal amount of pressure when I'm making that mark. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hold my brush back. And look at how you know, long of a mark that I can make that's relatively consistent. Back here, that's when I run out of paint and it starts to break a bit which is kind of a bummer, right? Especially when you want a really fine line to last for a, you know, a long while. So you might need to decrease the viscosity of your paint. In other words, add one tiny drop of oil to your paint. This is a larger rigor, but I just want to show you how long of a straight line, oh, I just gotta get my mall stick just right. How long of a, a thin consistent line I can get out of that rigor before even really grabbing new paint. So the rigor will hold a lot more paint. This is how you can do all of those lovely curls that you see in those Dutch paintings where you see the hair is just painted as these series of, you know, spinning and twisting curls. Um, you can get finer riggers, you can get thicker ones, all of them to make bigger or smaller marks. But I love painting with riggers in general. I've done almost entire paintings with essentially nothing but riggers. So that one Rembrandt master copy that I showed a little bit earlier was done primarily with larger, um, larger and smaller riggers. So the Sienna brushes, um, these are the synthetic hog bristle. So this is what I'm, this is a Sienna number six filbert. This is the thing that I like about natural hair brushes and um, these, the synthetic, is that they, there's something really wonderful about a good sable brush because when you get a really nice sable brush, they're kind of puffy. They fluff up and they can leave more paint. So as, you, as we kind of assess the quantity of paint, 
let's say in the area that we just did with the spectrum brush, um, the quantity of paint is fairly low, right? It's very smooth. Now, when we use the Sienna brush, the brush itself just holds more paint, which is really great when you are wanting more of a fuller bodied look. So you can still get the same level of smoothness, but the amount of paint that is put on is slightly greater. And that's because there's those little grooves in the, um, in the filaments or in the hairs, which can grip more paint and leave it on your painting. The, um, I, for the most part, like to use the Sienna filberts for, for laying down larger quantities of paint doing larger backgrounds and things like that. Meanwhile, I like to use these spectrums as I get closer to those, um, I'll say, details. Um, I do like to keep large, um, large brushes like this, like large rounds, to just soften and smooth things out as well. So that's perfectly fine. That's kosher to do. You can just use an empty round brush. And because the fibers are so delicate, you can get some really nice blending just by putting two pieces of paint next to each other and then just doing a very small amount of just touching. What do we have? Okay, so the hog bristle, the opal brushes, this is for, you know, when we're doing that, the aboche when we're just laying down these big broad um washy tones of paint i would use a brush like this now there are two main ways that you can hold your brush everybody should become proficient and comfortable holding their brush in two main ways in my opinion there is holding your brush like this we have a long handle let's not have a long handle and hold our brush up here first off um, hold your brush farther back. We can hold our brush similar to how we write. If I were to flip that around, I could write in that manner. So as I bring my brush this way, that's the comfortable way that you would hold, you know, a pencil and whatever. So I can make brush strokes like this. Now, the main thing is I have to move my elbow if I want, you know, 360 degrees can sometimes be very uncomfortable. Like you find yourself in a weird position, breaking your wrist like that. So when we apply paint like this, generally speaking, there's a lot of pressure on the hair. Now, when I am laying in large areas of tone, I actually hold my brush overhand like that. So we can hold our brush this way and we can hold our brush that way. So if you want to learn how to switch the grip, I luckily, this is how I hold my pencil. So in between my index and uh, middle finger, so I hold my brush like this, and then I just do that, flip it, and then I essentially just grab it like that, and then I'm overhand, like I would be riding a bike. So if you've ever wondered how to get those thick, um, juicy, kind of broken edged brush strokes that you would see in an impressionistic painting, you would not want to apply those like this because the angle of my brush is a bit more perpendicular to the surface. You would want to apply the paint more parallel to the surface like this. First off, let me go over how I would lay down those um, washy tones. With just this paint that we have already made, I would hold my brush overhand like this, and I would, um, I'm going to put air quotes scumble because the motion that I'm doing, but essentially scumble, working the paint into the linen like this. not using some liberal quantity of mineral spirits, but I would just stretch the paint thin like this. And I would keep adding more and more paint um, to have that same washy quality. You won't lose the control of the paint if you do it that way. Now, as we move into laying down some of those thicker broken edged brush strokes, I'm gonna grab, you know, let's say I'm gonna grab some ochre, 
and some vermilion. I would load up my brush heavy on the side of it. I would definitely work some paint into the center of the brush, but I would make sure to load the brush in a circular manner. If you're using a filbert, the same thing applies. You can do this even with softer brushes, but what, what I like to do is load the brush up like that and then have my brush more parallel. Do you see how my brush is parallel to the working surface? Now I'm just holding, I'm essentially holding the brush in between my fingers like this, just delicately, just holding it. Now I can twist the brush like this. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hold it parallel, twist and let the paint fall off of my brush, as opposed to holding my brush like this to where I'm left with that. So I want the paint to just fall off organically um, to use perhaps a Bob Ross analogy. It would be the equivalent of how Bob Ross would have the, um, his palette knife and he would lay down the you know, bits of snow on the mountain. He would hold that palette knife really gently and he would just kind of let it fall off. So that's another way that we can make a variety of different brush strokes. But by holding our brush in that overhand position, we're not confined to only so much of a direction of our brush stroke without us breaking our wrist. When we hold our brush like this, we have available to us 360 degrees to leave a brush stroke in any direction. So when you're out there landscape painting, I could be putting in the sun dappled nature of the water or applying the tree or just massing in an area very easily and very quickly without needing any medium. You know, that's just my straight paint. Um, that makes life so much easier. And at the end of it, that sinks in less and is generally more vibrant because there's a slightly higher quantity of paint that's not lacking the oil that the oil that the mineral spirits or the solvent will generally deprive the paint from as it gets sucked into the substrate. There's of course old faithful when we need to soften something we can use you know our um, you know our sable or our sienna soft um, soft brush like this a fan brush. I prefer to use large flats or large filberts as opposed to um, fan brushes because have you ever had a fan brush get all, you know, get all wet and then it's real spiky? That's the most annoying thing in the world. Then it starts to leave what looks like, um, you know, scratches on your painting. So I like to use a, a large, a large Sienna filbert or a large Sienna round or a sable round if that's what you have and essentially just pull my paint in a downwards direction to remove any of that glare. For example, if I leave a brush stroke in a horizontal direction, that's going to catch more glare than one in a vertical direction. I will illustrate with straight black. Judge how dark that is compared to this. I mean, let me actually get you, I'll get you a little closer to that. Okay, do you see all those little speckles, all that glare? So when I make my brush stroke going more vertical, so yeah, there's absolutely none of that speckled glare. When I make the brush stroke horizontal, there's all of that glare. That's primarily because my light source is coming from above. So even with a really nice soft brush like this, I would want to, at least at the end of my day, Pull some of my brush strokes down. That way I have less glare on my painting, which makes my painting look more smooth. Second I do that horizontal, you can see there's all of that glare once again. So I do like these brushes for applying a larger quantity of paint while also smoothing things out. The golden taclons, I really like those for just all around 
um, soft, delicate work. So I like the golden Teflon rounds. Those are the main ones that I um, use for applying paint in a very controlled, delicate manner. I'll use this, the direct demo. I hope that was helpful. If there's anything else you guys want to see me do with the different brushes, please let me know. So I'm going to load up this golden tack on. Ooh, that's better by a lot. I'm welcome to take more questions too. I had a question, is there a, a subsequent video of the painting that you're working on right now? Yes. Cool. It's on the work, it's on the webinars. Okay, um, I'll, I'll send you the link, guys. So it's on the webinar page, it's on the, it's a skin tones workshop. It's a pre-recorded it. webinar. Um, and you can, you, it's, if you scroll all the way down for the upcoming webinars, it'll be at the bottom of that page, but there will also be a, another link that's just recorded videos. You'll find it there too. We just have it in multiple places on the website. But I talk much, 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 much more about the grammar of coloring um, and warm, cool relationships, as well as the palettes and the aesthetics of flesh tones from one century to the next. Um, Tina, go on. Sorry, Tina was asking the flat brush that you use to knock down the glare. Which type was that that you used? That was the Sienna brush, the synthetic Sienna. sable. Okay. Which you know, I'm sometimes like, wow, this is a good sable, and I'm like, oh, damn, you got me again. Um, it's a synthetic. It's hard to believe because for so many years, synthetic sables were just the worst. I don't know if anybody gave them a chance um, within the past 10 years or so, but there were a whole bunch of duds that just looked like, they were just essentially brown, regular synthetics. Um, but this, there's a, I don't know exactly where the company is. I think it's a Japanese company, but they won't even let anybody know their process or what it's made out of because they've, they've mastered it or whatnot, but um, they're pretty good. I mean, I, I like them a lot. Like I was very upset once I found out that sables are going to become more expensive and harder to get a hold of. I mean, I, I hate to say that I, I, I blew a lot of money on sables just stocking up. Um, I'm sitting on, I'm, I'm sitting on a good like 50 sable brushes that are unused right now, just so I can like use them as time goes on. But you know, the the Sienna's it's like I haven't even used uh, used a lot of the sables sables that I'm um, stocked up on because I mean the the Sienna's are just kind of doing the job for me I kind of forget about them but it's it's kind of a nice gift to yourself when you're digging in your studio and you find um, like a squirrel that's you know hid away and not um, you, know, you you find it unexpectedly I'm just applying some of this smooth tone for those cooler transitions with this golden tack line. I like that the golden tack lines don't leave the, um, I'll call it the thumbprint of their own, um, their own shape. They just leave a really nice, smooth layer of paint. Let me grab my warm value here. Just gonna bump my warm shadows down a little bit. I'm going to grab some of my vermilion and raw umber. Those of you who are interested in, you know, let's say setting up your studio, setting up a still life, controlling lighting and everything. I am doing a webinar. Um, it's a Kiriskiro crash course where we're going to be going over the lighting, the setup. Pretty much it's six weeks, just like this, six hours a day. Chances are we're gonna paint for a little bit longer than six hours a day because I like to paint for longer than six hours a day. So um, 
it may go a little bit longer um, with no additional charge to you, but just so we can get farther in the painting. But we're going to take a painting essentially from beginning to end. Um, we're going to go over setup and lighting, lighting and everything. And it's going to be essentially this exact format. And I'll have more time to focus on. Um, there's just so much to cover. But yeah, that's going to be happening in the next um, next couple of months. The darken my brow, you know, this area right below the brows, just a little bit too bright. I'm just going to apply a darker veil of tone here just to darken it without completely um, covering that up too opaquely. Just by doing that, it's going to make this area look a little bit softer. I'm going to come in with one of my darker, warmer reds. Eric, I had somebody ask, um, what brushes would you recommend at the beginning of a painting versus like the middle versus finishing a painting? Good question. Beginning of the painting, like I was saying with the Bosch, opals all day. I'm a whole bunch of these. Let me actually show you. I've got a video for you. Um, I would start off with the opals. Then I would lead to the Siennas. Then I would lead to the Spectrums, finishing with more of the Spectrums, um, the Sienna rounds, or maybe even the Golden Taclon rounds. I finish my paintings primarily with rounds. Um, I would also go from big brushes to small brushes. I don't start a painting with a whole bunch of small brushes, unless it's a small painting. You know, I mean, small brushes, small painting, big, big painting, big brushes. So what I'm going to do is um, we're going to we're going to watch a quick video. Just give me one second. Let me pull it up. This was an altar piece that I had to finish in two months. So um, it was a whole lot of um, it was it was a, it was it was a lot. Let me get this. It's only about three minutes. It's very fast. So here we go. So this is the altarpiece that I had to do. What is that? There it is. The <laughs> oval round. Now watch you. This is the motion that I'm. This is the motion that I'm doing, right? And then we'll speed up. So all of that is essentially, uh, you know, work with that oval brush. Just essentially scratching in the pretty much the appropriate tone. And you can see as time goes on, I will use, I know it's hard to see what brush exactly I'm using, but the small areas, you see there's me using the Sienna. That's just to apply a little bit more paint. I may do touch up with one of the golden tack lines, but essentially just laying in the forms, working from general to particular. Most people think that I glaze this, but you can see me using those Sienna brushes. I'm just laying down really juicy, chromatic, direct paint. Um, I'm also doing a, a webinar on direct painting as much as I love glazing and everything. If you can't mix it right and put it down, glazing isn't gonna save you. Glazing is still gonna be terribly difficult. So the goal is to make something look as if it was glazed, but you know, with really purposeful direct paint. Here's me laying in this entire painting with you know one of the um, one of the opals. Because this is such a large painting, there's so many figures and everything. Um, one thing that I do, because I don't like to oil out, my objective is to leave them a hot mess. Like, oh my goodness. Hold on, wait. We have, to, we, have to, we have to stop here. That is a hot pile of trash of a portrait, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not good. Now, why on earth would I oil that out? 
if I spend a whole bunch of time on the portrait in the very beginning, it's going to almost require that I oil out just to see the full range of value. So if I leave it sketchy, if I leave it loose and everything, I can always just go in once it's dry and start to make corrections. This is glazing. Start off with yellow. Most of the time people, people hear glazing and all they want to do is a gray painting. And to me, that's, all, that's, that's always been just counterintuitive. If you do a gray underpainting, chances are there's a slight bit of coolness and a slight bit of grayness that is going to be introduced into your painting overall. If you want a more vibrant painting, you can still glaze. Now, I painted this with essentially lead tin yellow and then my vermilion and just created the large form of it. Then I glazed over that with a um, quinacridone violet or quinacridone purple. Um, essentially, you can consider that your permanent alizarin crimson. And then I wiped it away, pretty much using a reduction type of a method to just reveal that yellow that I have underneath with that large form underneath. Same thing, here's more direct painting. Get that washy lower chroma violet to a more vivid, full body one. That's a lot of spectrum to golden cap fonts just to do those little kind of fine dots. I know that this that this is so quick. I mean, it's two months boiled down into three minutes. So forgive the speed of it. This was uh, prepared for in the Australian really church just to show them the progress. Again, there was no need to oil that out because it was all too light and wrong anyway. But I can at least go right into it and make those corrections. This is what we're left with at the end. So I hope that was I hope that was useful to some degree. If anybody has any specific questions on that, I'll be happy to answer those as well. I, I have them for you, Eric. Um, how big? What was it for? And what did you use for references, please? Models, teachers from the school. Um, I'm in there. I don't know if you can recognize me, but I'll bring it up again. So, I mean, this started in the midst of the pandemic right and i wasn't taking any chances so luckily where i work there are you know lots of we where you know i worked at the time i was still in boston so this is the anatomy ins instructor at the um at ara boston that is one of the models at ara that she usually models for figure um the baby is actually my daughter at the time um that's me. Uh, this is a friend of ours. This is our um, my fiance's cousin. Um, strange or uh, funny funny fact. This is actually Donna Summer's niece, like the singer Donna Summer. Um, that's her niece. Um, and then this is actually my fiance that I've made a man um, on her with her permission. I just took her face and I um, just mat made it extremely like masculine. So funny stories, but I did have to work a lot from photographs. But, you know, I, the, the key is, you know, with enough life training to make all of these, which are all individual photos, all individual, um, you know, lighting, 
making it seem as seem like a unified environment. Um, of course, there's the ethereal quality to it as well, but pretty much compiling all of those references together while um, hanging my hat on a lot of the idealistic um, aesthetics that I generally paint by the philosophy that I paint by to create a, um, a uniform appearance. It was for an Episcopalian church in Highland, North Carolina. They were doing a remodel and I was contacted about doing the altarpiece for it. Did I miss a question? I don't believe so. It was a commission okay. piece, right? Yes. Oh, um, questions on varnishing a commission piece. How okay. do you varnish on like a tight schedule? Use a varnish that you can. Um, a, I use very fast drying pigments on the entire thing, um, which helps. Um, I force them to, they had a tight schedule, but I, um, I only will bend so far um, because I won't do what is bad for my painting. So I require a certain period of time. It needed to be finished um, to where I had that video ready for them at a certain point, but I made them give me a few months to actually let it dry, dry longer. And with that, I used a Regal Res 1094 varnish. That's your gam var. That's your um, concert bar from natural pigments varnish to do it. Um, don't, you wouldn't want to use something like a DeMar varnish for it. That can pretty much shatter the painting if it's not dry enough. I've seen it, I've had it happen to me. Oops, sorry, I'm gonna turn this back so you can hear me better. Very exciting painting though. Um, also not pigeonholing yourself. I mean, I think the thing that I like most is variety. So your aesthetics and your philosophy of painting can lead to a lot of differences. For example, I'm just going to, um, I'm just gonna zoom out on this just to show you a few different, um, a few different paintings. So, you know, compare this. To that, compare that. To that. Or this. Beatrice here, you know, there's just so many different ways, different flesh tones and varieties and, you know, however you paint, you, know, you should be able to do, you know, an, an overwhelming variety of difference in your flesh tones and in just in your paintings in general, some lighter, some darker, but I think for me, the key is not painting in a way that is formulaic. Um, of course, painting in a way that is orderly and organized and easy to follow, practical. You know, look at that compared to that. Of course, you know, different lighting situations here. Let me actually change the exposure here. I think the most exciting thing is, you know, being able to, well, who has just shared their stuff? Uh, Bliss, can you? Yeah, let me um, stop them from sharing that. Just remove whoever's sharing your screen right now. Um, yeah, can you please? Remove I'm gonna that? reclaim the host. Stop them from sharing. Yeah, sorry about that. I couldn't fix it. All right. All right, well, goodbye. All right, I just removed whoever that was. Thank you. And I'm also going to make it to where nobody else can share because 
one person ruins it for everybody. All right, but let's all make you the host once again. I apologize Great. for that. Thank you. Out of all of the things that that could have been that was not nearly as bad, that's you know one of my great fears <laughs> is somebody sharing something crazy, but um, it wasn't too bad. Oh, good. All right. Well, let's get back to painting. I'm hoping to continue to take some of those, some more of those questions too. Which Treco brushes are ideal for those that are on a budget? We're just getting started. Oh, the spectrums are amazing. I mean, they're you they're usually no more than ten dollars. Five bucks, four bucks, six bucks. I mean, I'm always amazed at how inexpensive the spectrum the, the spectrums are just amazing. Um, I think that the spectrum brushes are you know an excellent budget pick. Same thing with the golden tacklon. Um, the opal can get a little bit more pricey because I like to use bigger ones. Um, I primarily use the rounds for the opal. Um, some people that have different a different touch will use more of the um, like the long filberts or the long flats, like one of those. But um, I think the spectrums and the golden taglons are really great choice for um, just average. Um, you know, everyday painting type stuff. The Sienna brushes do get a little bit more pricey. So you do have to keep that in mind. I have some materials related questions, if you're ready. Yep. Okay, differences between glass plus silica mixture and alkids. Okay, say that repeat the whole thing there. Yeah, I'm just paraphrasing. The differences between glass plus silica mixture. Okay. Um, this person's also interested in learning about alkyds and Moroger products. Um, alkyds are modified vegetable oils that require a usually a solvent and they dry through a process of evaporation and um, typically the oxidation and polymerization. They generally dry very, 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 very fast. The um, mixture of glass, fume silica, and linseed oil, or essentially um, you can consider that like transparent paint. So fume silica is essentially sand, silica, glass, that is heated to such a high, um, high degree that it shatters into this incredibly small particle size. The powdered, the regular powdered glass, the crystal leaded powdered glass is uh, more so uh, grittier. Um, but essentially large particle sizes of glass relative. It's still a very fine sand feel. Um, the crystal leaded powder glass does have lead oxide in it, which acts as a sticative, which helps speed up the drying a little bit, but that does not, um, but that does not, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, that does not speed up the drying time anywhere near as much as the um, alkyd would. So what I'm doing here is I'm just to adding a little bit of warmth and a little bit of darkness. Now, the what I don't want to do, I'll do this as like an extreme example. I don't want to come in here like a like a barbarian and do that because <laughs> it instantly turns flat, right? Instantly gets super graphic and very dark. So what I want to do, you know, at this stage in the painting, is take my time and you know essentially paint this lighter. Now. A lot of times we all have that happen, right? We, our mall stick slips or our hand slips and we accidentally put like a really dark mark where it doesn't belong. One of the things that you can do is you can take one of your makeup sponges and just gently remove. You can also take, you know, one of these, this is very big. You can get these smaller. This is 
one of Trickell's paint shapers. Um, you can just take the corner of it. It, act, it acts almost like a squeegee and just removes that paint. So if you do accidentally go too dark, you can use something like that to help remedy the situation. Thank you, Blitz, I'll get you back. Hey, Blitz, I'm just gonna make you the host again. If there's any other questions that anybody wants to ask, keep, and keep them coming. Thank you. I'm just gonna use a- Eric, can you go into the use of oleo gel again, please? So oleo gel is a mixture of Fume silica and linseed oil. 70% linseed oil, 30% fume silica. Fume silica is a very small particle size um, transparent pigment. So it creates, so the combination creates a, a, um, a transparent paint, if you will. But because it is primarily oil, you do have to keep in mind that adding a lot of oleo gel can decrease the viscosity of your paint. So um, adding oleo gel can be a way for you to make your paint more fluid. Remember earlier I added the stand oil? You could have used something like the oleo gel that would both impart a, um, a level of um, more oil and more transparency while also maintaining a body of your paint. So if you just add oil, your paint can turn to like a puddle, which will make you lose control over the paint. So when you add the oleo gel, it is a more of a thixotropic medium. So your paint will maintain its kind of fluffy body when and if you add it to your paint. And that's one of the reasons why I added some of the powdered glass into it is because I don't want my, my these uh, layered, a paint to be some come bleh, to become so fluid that I lose control over them. I want to maintain a level of control over the paint, and you lose control when your paint becomes overly fluid. I think many of us have experienced one too many times when we've added just that little bit too much medium, and our painting becomes more like a slip and slide to where it's very hard to get smooth transitions anymore when 10 or 15 minutes before the addition of the extra medium, it was easy to do. I'm just gonna hug this part of the eye with a slightly darker value. The goal here is to continue to develop the form as a generalized statement here. I would say that I am needing to continue to darken to make other values appear brighter. The key there is using the dark values to make the light ones look brighter as opposed to just making the light values brighter. So if you want to avoid chalkiness in your flesh tones or in your paintings in general, a very important point is to avoid um, always just adding lightness. When you feel that an area should be lighter, you should always contemplate whether or not you can darken the areas around it or surrounding it to make the light areas appear brighter. I'm applying this with one of those spectrum blush brushes in that kind of hatching, um, sewing type of a manner, just to apply this. I could, e I could equally um, apply the exact same thing with one of the spectrum brights. Uh, that would be one of the brushes that is um, a flat. I could easily do the exact same thing just by applying it in that manner as well. And that would be all right. Um, it really kind of comes down to what, what you feel comfortable with or how you want to apply the paint in that area. But 
The main concern that I have is making sure that this area gets a little bit darker and also a little bit cooler. Eric, can you please explain when to use powdered glass and what the desired effect would be? Do you want your paint to be more transparent is the question that you have to ask. If the answer is yes, how are you going to make your paint more transparent? Are you going to add a whole ton of medium or oil, or are you going to add a transparent pigment? If you answered yes, you want to make your paint transparent, your main options are a variety of different um, transparent pigments in general with the powdered glass or the fume silica being among the most transparent. Obviously we use glass for our, um, for our windows and everything. We can't look through a piece of marble. You know what I mean? So as we get closer to, let's say the marble, the calcium carbonate, there is going to be um, less transparency because they are a little bit more opaque, but their refractive index is similar to oil. So they are actually more transparent in oil than they are in, let's say, water. For example, barite or barium sulfate is very opaque in water, but also very, very transparent in oil. So the refractive index um, is another thing that is important to understand. That way you know why you're using that. So that's the main reason why if you came up with some other, you know, idealistic principles where you feel that the glass has some um, inner luminosity, which I would agree with powdered glass does add some kind of inner luminosity look to your paint colors. Um, that's another reason why you would choose the glass, the variation in particle size, the refractive nature, reflective nature of it can be quite desirable for a specific look in your glazing or any of those colors that you want to be trans more relatively transparent. Eric, can you please compare oleo gel to Galkid gel? Um, no, because they're so entirely different. Um, we're talking about linseed oil compared to an alkyd medium. It's kind of like comparing tomatoes and apples. Um, so I don't know much about what is in Galkid gel. You'll have to contact Gamblin for it. But I know that one's an alkyd, one's going to be extremely fast drying. That's your Galkid. Meanwhile, the oleo gel is essentially there to more delicately adulterate the viscosity of your paint while imparting transparency. I don't know if there are any transparent pigments in the Galkid gel. If there aren't, you're just adding more and more fluid medium, which can be extremely problematic. Going back to just doing a little bit of darkening. Keep the questions coming. Uh, the glass powder, that's on natural pigments, right? Correct. Okay. And if you're really desperate, you can go to Home Goods or take a take a crystal lead, you know, a decanter glass and crush it up to your very fine size. Um, but yes, it's on natural pigments. Um, I did have some questions, and I apologize, guys, because I know this came up a little bit. Um, you're using bone black for your blue, correct? And can you correct. kind of go into that? Awesome. Oh, you want, so what was that second part to go into that? Just kind of go into it and explain why, if you don't mind, please. Um, A, because analysis shows that there's no blue pigments used in the flesh tone of this. Um, B, um, the main blue in this century was Prussian blue, which is like a nuclear bomb of all blues. So there are sections in this painting where that, all, that Prussian blue does show up. Um, and the whole flesh tone is very warm. So I want to maintain that warmth in the flesh tone as opposed to um, overburdening it with these kind of very aggressive blues. The coolest colors in the flesh tone are still very warm 
relative to the bluest moments in the painting. So I'm using the black as my blue. Um, and you see that done very commonly throughout many centuries. For um, you know, whoever mentioned the Zorn palette, that's a great example there. We have Titian who said that the main colors needed to paint flesh tone are black, white, and red. So I really like using black as my blue, which helps me push my painting warmer generally. Uh, if I'm using blues in my flesh tone, for example, in the painting that I did of my um, fiance when she was pregnant, uh, I'll bring that up. There was, there was actually um, lots of blue in, in the flesh tones, lots of blue in the painting in general. One moment. Oh, hold on, I just have to. There we are. Uh, bless, I'm just going to reclaim the host that way I can share real quick. Okay. So in this, there is lots of violet and everything that I used because, you know, we've got this kind of outdoor scene. Of course, this is, you know, very kind of idealistic, but, um, you know, there's lots of violet and everything that's used to complement the excessive warmth in this. So it takes on more of an 18th century feel. Um, you know, those portraits, those commission portraits of like the aristocrats uh, in outdoor scenes kind of look. But, you know, there are much more vibrant blues that, was, that were appropriate in this just to show the relationship of the environment, you know, in the flesh tone. So my greens are greener, my, I've got stronger violets um, just in general, you know, like the transition here much more violet, much more blue here, showing the kind of light bouncing around. So in this, you know, it, it was much more appropriate to have those blues. Meanwhile, in this David, um, I'm gonna pull up a full photo of it. the main blue is like what he's wearing. You know, that's that very vibrant blue. So the coolest moments in the flesh tone are still fairly warm relative to how strong, let's say this blue is or that green is. So that's one of the main reasons why I would leave out that very strong blue because Prussian blue is so intense, so opaque, that it will turn the flesh tone a very sickly green extremely, extremely fast. Okay, so let's all make you the, uh, let's make you the host. So right now what I want to do is use some of those cooler, darker hues. I'm gonna take some of my oranges and mix it in with my greenish color. I wanna to go to the bag of the eye. You see, I'll just leave a little dot. That's my test. I could see on my brush that I was already in danger of being too dark. I'm using one of the golden Tacklon brushes. I'm just going to slightly or gently darken this not going to be too aggressive with it. Still trying to keep my paint relatively transparent. So all of these bits of paint that I put side by side should start to kind of meld and flow together, just like I had shown a little bit earlier with the, uh, with the spectrum. Those two um, brush strokes that I put side by side 
That's essentially going to happen naturally. As I put these two transparent layers of paint next to each other. Eric, I have some questions about the background um, and how you would match that color. So what I would do is I would essentially work with the value relationships and I would aim to get it as accurate of a relationship between the flesh tone. So if you want, I can, I can bring this out actually. Get a little bit more light in here. So my background is obviously light right now. The background in the painting is a kind of a greener, grayer version. So when I would be matching the value of that color, I would probably use one of these Sienna um, filberts or possibly even one of the Sienna cat's tongue brush or one of the um, uh, Spectrum brights. I'll just use one of one of these. Um, I would essentially take, I would start off with black, yellow ochre, maybe a tiny bit of my genuine Naples yellow. That's going to allow me to get a touch greener. And then I would come right to the side here. Now, if I apply paint right here, that's a little bit darker. That's already a step in the right direction. It's greener, it's darker in general, but I do have to take into account the warmness and the darkness in the hair. So I can take some of my umbery, uh, vermilion dark mixture here and just apply a small amount of paint in the, um, in the hair. There we are. Take some of my umber, darken the lightness of the hair in general. I'm gonna use a opal brush. That way I can just cover more ground easier because the hair in general is light, right? It's very, um, bright compared to what it will need to be. So first course of action is to just darken that hair a bit. I can add bits of yellow ochre and or my Naples yellow to just brighten it a bit as we get closer and closer to the center of the head. I can use that same mixture to just put a few flicks of those lighter highlights. I may not feel entirely confident in the placement or um, entirely confident in the value, but so far that gives me a good step in the right direction. The hair being generally darker and the background being generally darker with it. From there, I can be a bit more forceful or aggressive with my greenish mixtures. And I would want to have my paint budding right up to and into the mixture that I had just done, applying them in a very kind of patchwork, flat manner. I would judge the greenness of that value or that color compared to the warmth of my flesh tones as well. I'd actually like to just take one moment, just adjust, just make some adjustments on the temperature, the color and balance on this as well. Just give me a moment. Hey Eric, just to let you know it's 6.30, okay? Okay. Um, how much longer is the demo roughly? Oh boy, consider time is always messing me up here. I know. <laughs> uh, I believe we still have an hour left. All right, what time did we come back from lunch? 
We started at noon, we went to three, we went to four, and then three hours after um 4 30. So yeah, 7 30. 4 30. I was gonna say, okay, 7 30. Thanks. No, it's confusing me too. <laughs> my brain, my brain thinks that it's totally different. All right, everybody, just give me one second. I just want to just make a couple of adjustments. That way the colors aren't quite as warm. I'm always a little bit sure to what I see. Eric, is that your mic picking up a room sound? I think. Um, possibly, I can change the compression. It might be picking up um, my daughter playing. Oh, now it's on. Oh, cool. Hold on. Let me go do this. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thanks. Okay, that should be much better, right? Yep, thank you. And now the reference looks a little too yellow, but um, I'll work with the reference that I have here. I'm welcome to keep taking questions too. Yep. Um, Oleo gel, is that a form of an alkyd medium? Is it similar to gambling solvent free gel? No. Um, I think here's a, here's a really simplified way to think of it. Nothing on the market is similar to oleo gel. Gamblin solvent free medium is essentially hitting the brakes and hitting the accelerator all at the same time because it is an alkyd safflower oil based um, medium. The only reason that I can think of why it would be considered solvent free is because it actually doesn't have a solvent because it is an alkyd, which the majority of the times Alkids require a solvent. So that is a gel medium um, of, you know, it's an alkyd and a safflower oil based medium. But I don't think that it makes a lot of sense to me, considering safflower oil is one of the slower drying oils to where it's sometimes categorized as a semi drying oil, which is not good. But then you put an alkyd in it, which speeds up that drying time. To me, it's a little counterintuitive, but um, I like to keep things simple. That's why I stick with linseed oil. So with this, I would just add a bit more black to it. And when it comes to mediums or amendments, I think it's, I think it's a good to kind of categorize the difference between them. One is simply going to add more kind of fluidity, um, dragging your paint to a, um, a different pigment volume concentration. Meanwhile, the other may introduce that um, transparency through the addition of a transparent pigment. right into the edge. I'd avoid leaving, leaving a boundary. I would try to overlap my paint wet into wet, making long brush strokes. A little bit of mixing on the surface is fine. Eliza, I'm not sure I understood your question. Do you want to ask him that yourself? Well, 
or can you just rephrase the question in the chat for me, please? I've just got a little bit more of the background wet. That's just been a bit more accurate, a bit more opaque as opposed to this like kind of lighter version. But I wouldn't make any assumptions on you know being able to get this value extremely correct without more context and information. So I would want to work this in a more holistic manner. So that's about as far as I would go with the background at this moment. I'm going to turn that back on, don't worry. Okay, we'll have to do. Any other questions? Um, can you talk about, I don't even know what this is, to be honest, Neom Gilp? I don't know what that Neom is. Neom Magilp is, yeah. a, is it's a gambling medium. I don't actually know a ton about it, other than the fact that it's trying to um copy it's essentially you know mediums like marge or mediums like liquin and um, neo melgo neo megilp are you know essentially trying to copy the the megilps that you find in the i don't know 18th and 19th century these kind of gel like mediums very similar to marge medium which is that mixture of um varnish and um varnish and uh, black oil so i don't know the exact composition of it so i can't mention much about it um, but i would never ever ever use anything in my painting that i didn't know um, what was in it so that's why what i do use i can talk a lot about it my recommendation is to ask the manufacturers about these materials that you are putting in your paint. I think that's very, very important because, you know, you're, especially if you're doing this professionally, you may sell that painting. And, you know, five years from now, you know, perhaps they recall the product because it was showing issues with cracking, which is not far fetched. That does happen. Uh, manufacturers will recall products, um, especially once they start to see issues with it. So I like to use things that are kind of tried and true over, you know, centuries, um, because I just know what to expect. Alrighty, I'm just going to continue on decreasing the value relationships or um, compressing the values. So I, if I darken under the lid here, I can make the brightness of the lid look brighter without having to pick up any light paint. So here I just needed to darken underneath the lid and then I will probably darken the light point of the lid as well. Eric, when you have a chance, you had mentioned mixing CAD red with chalk. Can you kind of go into that and what the chalk medium is? Um, you can get chalk and linseed oil from natural pigments called Velasquez medium that can help you um, increase the trend or make your paint more transparent or have 
your paint be just a little bit more um, stringy or ropey. But you would essentially just take chalk and oil, mix it together, and then mix that into your cadmium red. Pretty, pretty, pretty simple. I'll link that for you guys. If you're wanting an alternative to um, the handling properties of vermilion, I would recommend um, taking cadmium red and mixing barite or barium sulfate in it. You can get the barite as a white paint, it's kind of a buff colored, grayish colored paint, um, but it will make your paint much more transparent. Keep in mind though, it will also, it's also a very slow drying color. So you do have to be careful um, with, you know, slowing the drying time of your paint down too much, especially those of you that are um, in a hurry. I work on a lot of painting, so I'm never really in a hurry when I paint because when I'm done with working on one painting for the day, it just means I get to work on the other ones that I've been wanting to. I'm just unifying this to drag a tiny bit of warmth into the glabella, this triangular shape where we turn down from the superciliary ridge um, leading to the nasal bone. Um, that's essentially called the glabella. It's that bony downward facing plane in between the eye sockets. So we're just gonna darken um, the inner plane of the eye socket as well. I'm going to put a tiny bit of this transparent color on the lid too. I'm going to grab another one of those small liner brushes. This is going to help me get into some of these, I guess we'll say more graphic areas. We've got that, you know, a certain graphic quality to the eye in general. So what I would like to do is just grab a little bit of white, a little bit of my gray, a little bit of the kind of a sandy peachy color. I don't want my, the white of my eyes to be too um, blue gray in general. So I'm just going to lighten that dark part on the bottom. Slightly darken my mixture. Reapply. Reapply the paint actually in the eye. You can see now um, those values are just a little bit more sympathetic, but there's that really dark looking gray. I'm just going to darken my value a little bit. That way I can slightly lighten that really dark, heavy gray. And then I'm gonna do a little bit of blending in between these tones that I had just put down. Being very careful to not introduce too much lightness to the upper portion of the eye. And grab a little bit of vermilion. I want to do a small amount of lightening on the lower portion of the lid. I don't want it to be too blackish and heavy. I want there to be just a touch of lightness in there. I'm just going to darken that other portion of the eye socket. I'm going to need a cooler value. I'm just going to take one of my darker cool brushes that I used for that demo earlier. I'm just going to lighten it um, with some white and lean it a bit more towards a green. I might add the tiniest bit of red into the mixture to neutralize the excessive coolness of the green. 
what I want to do is transition up from that warmer shadow here. Gonna lighten my mixture with a peachier color. Just at the very top. I want to lighten the mixture a bit and let there be, you see I have this lighter point here. I want that lighter point to be a little bit more in the center of the form. I'm just going to unify this area. Adding a bit more of that light peachy color. Going to introduce a little bit more of that brightness. I may even lighten the value a bit more towards the red and white spectrum. Just add a bit more brightness, cool pinky brightness underneath the eye socket. And we'll zoom out just a bit. about questions we have any any new questions anything anybody want to ask yeah this actually came up a couple times can you briefly recommend what paints you would recommend glazing with and which ones you would not you can use any pigment any paints for glazing if we're talking about just which colors to use so i if you want to use an a more rightfully opaque pigment, the key is to add a higher quantity of those transparent pigments. If generally speaking, if you're using, if you really want to glaze, the best thing to do is use transparent pigments to begin with. That means using, um, that means using like a lead tin yellow type two, as opposed to a type one. Um, that means using ultramarines, alizarins, quinacridones, lead white if needed, um, doing everything in your power to choose the most transparent pigments. Also using, um, using larger particle size colors, um, grittier or just slightly larger particle size colors will also have the tendency to be more transparent, although they can be a bit difficult to control. Um, large particle size colors will generally be more transparent than small particle size colors. For example, um, cadmium, cadmium red, titanium white are both very small particle size colors, very small pigments, which makes them a bit more opaque. Um, on the other hand, you know, we, you also have, you know, ultramarine blue, which is also a very small particle size, but it's, um, it's pigment itself is a transparent blue crystal. 
So that makes it more transparent, even though the particle size is small. So it's not, it's not, you know, entirely right to say that just because the particle size is small, it will make it transparent or opaque. But as a broad generalization, um, introduce transparent pigments to your palette and to your paint, and that will allow you to have more transparency overall for your glazing. But at the same time, if you can start off with an array of pigments that are um, innately already um, transparent, that, that sets you up you know, even better for success. So any color can definitely be used for glazing. Definitely. I had another question about restoring cracking on a personal painting. Restoring cracking? Yes. Oh, well, that's a unfortunate. All right, go on. How would you proceed? And is it even possible? Why is the, I, that's, I can't answer that question because I don't know exactly why it's cracking. So is it cracking because you varnished it too soon? Is it cracking because you put fast, you used fast drying mediums over a thick, slow drying underpainting? Um, is it cracking because the painting was stored in an area that dealt with lots of fluctuations of heat and humidity and, or was it on cotton canvas? Was it on linen canvas? There's a lot of variables there, but, it's very important to figure out why the cracking, you know, kind of deduce why the cracking happened in the first place. Sarah, um, do you want to hop in real quick? That way it can be mitigated. Yes, thank you. Hi, how you doing? Hi. Tell me this, <laughs> tell me all of your woes. Uh, <laughs> Well, I did a painting with uh, of the ocean with some figures in front of it and the crest of the white of the wave cracked um, like four or five years after it was done. And I'm thinking maybe it wasn't dry and I was laying more paint on top of it. Uh, okay, were you, if so you were a bit hasty before you let that thick wave dry well enough and you put some thinner paint on top? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. There's, that's your issue. The good news is, um, you know, what the damage done is the damage done. So if you still own the painting, um, you could unvarnish it and paint in those cracks, do a little in painting. I mean, I mean, once the cracking happens, I mean, the cracking's gonna continue. I mean, the painting is just gonna continue to crack over its lifetime. So that's natural, that's normal. You just have to minimalize. You know, it's, what's most important is that you take some of the information for today and, you know, proceed with that understanding that it's not about fat over lean. It's more about more flexible over less flexible. At this point, your painting is very thoroughly dry. So if you do some in painting, if you get the chance to see it again, if you own it or if you don't, you can definitely remove the varnish and just in paint those cracks. But I mean, paintings crack, that's just life. Um, if it's just a small area, I wouldn't worry too much about it. You know, if you've got clients that are like, why is my painting cracking? If it's minor, I would just pretty much say it. it's like, when have you ever gone to the museum and not seen a cracked painting? You know what I mean? I mean, that that's life. The best thing to do is move forward. If you have a client that is upset about it and you are willing to either eat the cost of the work or if they want to pay for your labor to unvarnish it and make those corrections, um, you can just in-paint those cracks to hide them. You can't get rid of the cracks, but you can hide the fact that they were there. Okay, so just paint right on top of it? Yeah, essentially, 
work it into the group and then wipe it away. Okay. Just leaving the same, ideally the same value inside the crack. Okay. I was going to sand it out. I'm glad I didn't do that. Oh yeah, don't do that. Not to mention, you know, the uh, potential hazard of the dust and everything. Thank you. You're very welcome. You can just keep hitting me with questions. Let's... Yeah, I have another technical question from Pharrell. I hope I pronounce your name right. Do you want to jump in and ask this? While he's doing that, I'm just applying some lighter values. I actually am going to apply an even lighter value with just a little bit of the lead and yellow in that pink. I'm um, right on the inside of the eye here too. Just to, now at this point, I've been doing a lot of that darkening. Now I'm just going to do a tiny bit of that lightening as well, as opposed to just strictly darkening. And I'm ready for that question if um, whoever wants to jump on. Yeah, sorry, Pharrell, were, were you able to jump in and ask us this question? I can't hear him, so I'm, or, or her, I apologize. I'm just going to read to you what was said. Okay. Is removing a far too dark in premature layer with turpentine or mineral spirits considered to be a safe practice? If it's still very wet, that's fine. If it's very dry, I mean, it's just an imprimatura. So, I mean, um, you don't want to be, I mean, I would just, if it's way too dark, I would find a painting that's appropriate for it in the future. Um, for example, like those Caravaggio paintings. Um, I wouldn't scrub at it super aggressively because there's the potential of you removing some of the ground um, and then leaving parts of your fiber of your uh, linen kind of exposed. So I would tread lightly, but if it's still relatively wet and you change your mind, you kind of wipe it all off, scrub it off, that's fine. I wouldn't be too opposed to doing that. I would be a liar if I said I haven't done that in my life. Thank you. Go ahead, Biro. Biro, did you want to hop on and ask that? I know you were interested in the layers of the Beatrice painting. Yes, thank you. Uh, hi. Um, um, previous videos uh, I saw on Instagram, uh, when you painted uh, your daughter, uh -huh. uh, excuse my English, <laughs> please. Um, I I wonder why you did a, a layer with black paint after your underpainting. Uh, I would uh, like to know more about it, please. Okay, so if you um, I mean, if you do one, um, yeah, uh, let's take a we'll take a moment to just talk about that. So let me see if I actually have an underpainting that I might be able to actually give you all the demo on that. So, oh, you're in luck. Okay, so here we have an underpainting. It's been through, um, been through hell. So when one of the re one of the reasons or one of the ways that I like to do the underpaintings, let's Let's we'll actually zoom, zoom that out. So what I want you to do is assess the texture of, let's say the underpainting in this area right here. You see the texture, you, you can kind of see it, but it's, it's not too noticeable, right? So what we can do, here I'm gonna take one of my opal brushes I'm going to take umber and black. I might even add just the tiniest bit of oil to my paint as well, just to uh, make this a tad easier. I don't want my paint to be too, um, too stiff. So I'm just going to dip that into just the tiniest, tiniest bit of oil. Now, what I would do is essentially take that then 
attack. Terrifying, isn't it? Um, so I'm just going to scumble or glaze over this with that black or dark valued color. I would do this to like the whole area or I would do this to just a section of the painting. My objective here is to give, to A, further my drawing, strengthen my light effect, um, and also give a bit more appearance or relief or volume to my opaque or my impostoed underpainting. So I'm gonna take a blue rag. Wipe that away. And then in the areas that are lightest, I'm gonna wipe them out even a little bit more. Looking for my highlights. Now, when I do this, the fluidity and the character of my underpainting becomes much more noticeable, doesn't it? So I can use that to darken a very large area, but I also can do that to increase the appearance of volume on my, um, on my underpainting. For example, I will share an example on a Rembrandt um, that I've done the exact same thing. So this underpainting is very, very stark, light and bright, right? When I do this, the whole thing, and then wipe it away, I'm left with more of that textural quality, that look to you know, my underpainting. This can be done in the beginning, and this also can be done in later layers as well. So you can definitely see on some Rembrandts where he's taken a small section on the edge of the face and actually done this and wiped away. And it's actually made the uh, appearance of the um, paint texture underneath. It's made it seem thicker, more fluid. So in the upcoming webinar that I'm going to do, the um, Chiaroscuro crash course one, we are going to be using that. We are going to be using some of the same method as well. So if you if you want like a full, um, you know, like full full explanation on how to paint exactly like that, which is really fundamentally different than you know what we are doing here where we're going for much more kind of smoothness. Um, we're, we're going to do that in one of the upcoming webinars too. Does that give you an idea or answer your question? As to why and how? Yes, she, she says, thank you. I have a question about scoring and cutting AMC panels. Okay. Um, this person is asking, what if I need to make an oval, for example, or to make a panel smaller? What would you recommend? Uh, if you need to make it, okay, so the first thing is, are you making an oval because it's a specific frame? You can unmute yourself, whoever asked that question. Yeah, Anna, I'm sorry. Could you please uh, elaborate? Yeah, for specific frames. Okay, so if there's enough, so here, oh, that's a little far as in bed. So if you have an oval frame like this, you have to kind of weigh the pros and cons. What's gonna be more work, cutting your painting or chipping out the frame? So you can just take a, you know, like a, a chisel and actually um, just chisel out a little bit of the frame to make it to make it fit. So that's an option that doesn't require you to cut your ACM. Um, cutting the ACM in an oval is very difficult. 
um, I don't want to say impossible to do by hand, but very, very difficult. I would rather not. I have tried it and failed pretty miserably. I mean, I've been able to get it into the frame. That's an oval. But at the same time, it wasn't great. Um, it was, you know, lots of you know, straight edge cuts on it. The best thing to do is buy the panel custom to fit your frame. If the frame came first and the painting's coming second, or if you're just trying to fit it into the frame. Um, if you want the oval look for your composition, my recommendation is also to, let's say, get a spandrel made for a rectangular frame. Um, it would essentially, you know, give you that oval look. Thank you. That, does that answer your question? Um, yes, I'm not sure what spandrel is, but yes. A spandrel is this. That's a spandrel. Okay. The frame ends there. That's the spandrel. You can't see the back, but it's a rectangular painting. The painting fits in the overall frame here, but the spandrel yeah. covers up the other. Okay. Yeah, that's clear. Thank you. You're welcome. A little bit of frame anatomy. Thank you. I have another question from Jasmine. Um, on average, how many layers um, would you do on a painting? And is there a maximum number for longevity? Less is, less is better, ideally. If your layers are extremely thin, like in Da Vinci's case, that's fine. Especially if you're doing a painting over a lot of time and letting it dry very thoroughly, that's fine. I usually complete a painting around with within usually like four layers um, overall. So um, I think that, you know, um, kind of you should, could, should pretty much be doing the layers based on an idea. Um, there's, you know, you can, you're either A, doing a whole bunch of layers because you're fighting a whole bunch of errors or you're doing a whole bunch of layers to achieve a specific effect. For example, I worked on this painting. Hold on, just give me one second. I worked on this painting for you know over many layers and kept returning to it from you know from life. That way I can build up enough texture. Please don't fall. Um, just zoom in on that for you. So my objective was to achieve the that kind of impressionistic broken brush stroke look like in this area so i purposely painted this in more layers than i rightfully wanted to or needed to just to achieve certain textural effects over wet and um, dry paint bring you to the these trees. But this obviously is much more impressionistic compared to what you're seeing me do right now. But that's, oops, sorry. You know, that's an example where I would do many more layers to just build up all of that complexity, all of those different colors to get, you know, these trees and the warm light that's dancing on them and all those. Um, leaves and everything, same thing with those warms and cools in there. Um, so this is a painting that I actually did more than four layers just to achieve, you know, those, some of those effects. That's why I say it's important to know why you're doing layer, all those layers. If the main reason you're doing the layers because you're unsatisfied and you're not um, getting the look that you want, perhaps that may require some additional, I don't know if soul searching is the right word, but um, searching within your technique or within your methods of drawing or painting to just remedy some of those errors um, and do a painting in 
less layers if that's what you're going for. Um, so for me, the faster I can get to the end of the painting, the faster I can get it sold, the better I am as a painter, the better I feel as a painter in general. For example, some paintings I'll spend many layers. This painting in, was done in a single layer. So that this is an ala prima painting that I did as a workshop um, a while ago. But all of that is just one layer of paint. One layer of paint is obviously going to age better than two or three or 15, especially if you know the more layers you add, the more chances and probability that you have for bad adhesion, dust, um, cracking. So I would say generally speaking, less is better. But you know, if you simplify your, your paint really well, you should, you should be fine. Does that answer your question? Can I speak for a second? Sure. So I normally only play paint in one or two takes but I've done some Rembrandt and Vermeer studies and uh, glazing. And especially the Vermeer stayed a little tacky at the end, just slightly. And my glazes were only uh, using oil and uh, odorless mineral spirit. So that's why I'm really afraid of layering. Was it because tacky I for let the layer? They, they kind of feel slightly gummy when I touch it. The paint is, I mean, it's, I can touch it and it's dry, but it feels Are we talking just a still? little bit. Sorry? Still? How long has it been dry? Yeah, I know a long time. Um, you just use linseed oil and mineral spirits? Yeah. But I probably wasn't letting the paint dry for many, many days before doing that. Like, and I, I was probably doing a layer a day. Did you use, what type of black did you use? Did you use any? Ever black. I, I unfortunately use uh, like cheaper paints, like gambling. Oh, well, there's your problem. <laughs> there's your problem. You're, you're, there's, there's very, the, the reason why I have to pause and dig deeper is I'm trying to figure out what's what's not adding up because oil linseed oil dries that's just what it does leave it with no pigment in it it's still going to dry so if you are using miscellaneous mediums with clove oil or um no no no, no. just the paint I, I, was I gambling. Just as an example just oh. as an example oh. that there are unnamed things in some manufacturers paint mm -hmm. that they don't put on the tube like they don't tell you that there's stabilizers in it. So, so for, for, for us poor people that cannot afford your full palette, do you recommend a more limited? Like I, I, I try to ask for the Zorn or more limited, like the yellow. It's like I cannot paint with $75 a tube paint. Yeah, only what you need. And you know, um yeah, I mean I mean it some of those colors are luxuries. Um, okay. They're very essential luxuries, in my opinion. Um, they make life and painting significantly easier. I mean, if you, I would, your birthday comes once a year, Christmas or whatever holidays you kind of abide by also comes. So, I mean, let somebody else get them for you guilt-free. <laughs> um, uh, but they're really, I, I really like the way that they handle, which allows me to paint better and easier because if you're using just like cadmiums, which are extremely high tinting strength, I actually really, really suck when I'm using, you know, extremely high tinting strength colors because I'm used to an older world palette, which is a little bit lower tinting strength in general. Um, so for me, they make my life easier and they're definitely worth the extra dollar because of the general look. I do feel that the general look of my paintings, my, um, my work, my work comes in part from the specific colors, not per se the specific brand, but the specific pigments. 
That's why I have spent lots of time making my own pigments. So what you need to do is figure out what colors are essential for the look of your work and you know just get that. I don't even think that you need to get all the colors that I get because I'm me and you are you. The goal here is for you to set up a um, equivalent to keys on a piano. These keys almost never change. I will introduce the blue. I'll introduce a slightly different yellow or red here and there. But where the white is, where the yellows are, where the reds are, where the earth tones are, where the blues are, the black never changes. They're keys on a piano. The pitch of the painting will determine the chromatic intensity of the color. Um, but this is the, you know, this is my piano in a way. And that's all you have to do is find the array of colors that work best for your type of painting. That's like the techniques that you use, the quality of rendering, or you know, how thick or thin your paint is, how fast or slow you can tolerate the paint drying. All of those things um, pretty much, you know, kind of come to a head. So um, I don't think I have you know, like a specific, I think that if you can, you know, use lead white, you should use lead white. That's one of the most important colors that is worth the extra dollar. Um, lead white is kind of a must have compared to titanium and definitely don't use zinc white, but um does that answer your question kind of you can dig deeper we can dig deeper into that if you'd like thank you so much you're very gracious of course i try I try my best i really do all right i'm going to continue you see i'm starting to get this nice softness around that brow i'm continuing to take one of my small spectrum brushes and just hug it with some slightly cooler color. I'm gonna do the same thing, this dark moment over here. This may be a moment for one of those soft brushes just to um, blend a little bit of those colors together. So you don't see me do that extremely frequently. I'm gonna take one of those Sienna brushes, just gonna drag. So now I've got wet paint like on this entire thing. Now I can just drag the paint into the neighbor and that's going to help give me that really soft flowing porcelain look without, without the color relationships being all um, extremely uniform. So my cool stay cool, my warm stay warm. You're at about 720, Eric, just to let you know. Oh my goodness, really? Oh man, I could do this all night. Um, well, that's a bummer. I'm having so much fun painting with you all. I, guess <laughs> I, I did have the a, most fun because I'm the one painting. But I did have some repeat questions about um, clearing the palette and cleaning brushes. If you have a chance to address that, sure. Let's let's bring this back. Um, I'm just going to make it towards just the palette. Okay, so when I'm done for the day, um, I usually will put on gloves. Give me two seconds. I'm actually just going to grab a new pair. So as you can see, not a speck of paint on me. I can, I'm, I can essentially be like one of those 19th century photos where you see Monet in like a three-piece suit with not a speck of paint on him. Um, so I've gotten very good at not getting paint all over me. And that was not that way in the beginning. So I do keep very clean. I know that, you know, when I'm washing my brushes, I like to put gloves on. I do have a fingernail scrubber. Um, it just in case paint gets in like the grooves of my um, 
groups of my skin. I just like to scrub it out. Because the last thing I want to do is go touch, go touch the door, go touch um, the refrigerator, then contaminate everything. So what I do to get ready to end the day is I gently pull the paint off of my brush like this. Once again, remember that we don't want paint way up, you know, touching the ferrule. So these brushes will be really, really easy to clean. So I essentially wet them. I'm gonna go grab a, um, I'm gonna go grab the brush cleaner too. Sorry. So um, you can use, you know, one brush up that I've used for years with like Fels Natha. I do like, um, I do like Trakel's linseed oil um, brush soap a lot. There's also a coconut oil one. So essentially I've already wet my, wet my brush here. What you want to do is do circular motions like this at a slight angle. Um, earlier, I said the one thing to avoid is slam washing your brush, kind of as a joke, but it's actually a very serious joke. Don't do it. Here, I'll use a brush that's already kind of seen better days. Um, one thing to not do is this, where you just kind of like slam your brush in there and you just kind of shake. Eric, I think you might cut out, my friend. Oh, okay. Hold on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so the main thing that you want to avoid is slam washing your brush, but you just kind of slam your brush in there and you just kind of aggressively shake at it. That's a, like a definite do not do that. Um, what you want to do is just have your brush slightly wet and then just make small circular motions like this. Then bring the brush into the palm of your hand make small circular motions like that, avoiding abusing the fibers. Then take your fingers and massage the paint out away from the ferrule. Back to the soap for a second time, back to your hand, massage it out. You should be able to just rinse it and uh, rinse and repeat for the rest of them. I, when you don't have an excess amount of paint in all of your brushes, I don't know if, any of you um, had to write things on a chalkboard or you know with pencil when your class was bad in grade school or something. Um, but I think every young child comes up with a wise idea if they can put four or five pencils in their hand, they can write four or five lines of the sentence all at the same time. And I actually do do that. So I will grab all of my round brushes in my hand like this. Now, these are similar sized brushes. I will make them to where they're all the exact same height. And then I'll, I'll bunch them up like this. Here, let me. So I've got four brushes in my hand, right? Let me see if it will focus, 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 focus. Okay, so I've got four brushes there. Then I'll hold them with my thumb and finger. And then I'll essentially wash all four of those brushes at the exact same time. Massage, pull out. So you see, I'll, I'll bring them to kind of like a flat state like that. I'll massage them out and then rinse and repeat. I'll do that a couple of times, put them to the side and just keep moving. But most of the time I don't need to use any mineral spirits. I just use the brush soap and that's fine. Of course, I always pull the paint out of my brushes towards the end of my day. I use a lot of brushes. I've probably used 20 brushes so far um, or more, but that's just me. So I would like to also take a photo of the way the painting looks.
Does anybody have any other questions as we come down to our last four minutes or so? There were a couple. How often do you wash your brushes? Every night. Every night. Only if like something really bad happened, will I um, not wash them. I'll wrap them up and throw them in the freezer or something. But for the most part, yeah, I'll wash them every night. I take good care of my brushes. Yeah, I know that also the old masters didn't really have running water to wash their brushes. They let their brushes sit in pretty much a vat of um, linseed oil. If that's what you choose to do, that's great. But um, washing my brushes, I feel like, you know, I've had some sables for five years and they're still like brand new. So I do wash them every night. I do take good care of them. I'm not, I'm not incredibly obsessive about it. But yeah, I do wash them every single night. At a, after at the end of a very long painting day, I may have like, you know, a, I couldn't hold all of my brushes with one hand. It's a lot, and that's why I wash multiple brushes at the same time, you know, in, in one grip. But that that is what it is, right? Can I share your Instagram in the chat, Eric? Yep. <laughs> Um, okay. On Instagram, for those of you that are on Instagram or TikTok, um, my social media is really easy. All it is is Eric Johnson Artist. How I got that, it's a surprise to me too. So I've got the easiest social media to remember, no, no numbers or letters. I'm very, um, those of you that are essentially meeting me for the first time, um, I'm, I am very um, open in giving when it comes to information. So if there's any questions that any of you have, you have my email, feel free to send me an email or you know message me on um, Instagram. If you comment on things, I try to make it a point to answer everybody. Just please give me some grace because um, with that spirit of giving, a lot of people take advantage of that. So I try my best to get to everybody, but if I don't get to your question or I don't um, respond to your email, it's probably because I've missed it or something happened when, uh, when it came up. So you're never bothering me by sending or another one or following up. Um, what are a couple of other things? Um, for those of you that are in the, um, for those of you that are in the um, Boston area, you can um, definitely sign up for the scholarship. Bliss, if you wouldn't mind putting the scholarship, um, the yep, scholarship information. Um, so if you are in the Boston area or want to come to ARA Boston to study, um, you can definitely um, apply for the scholarship there. There's lots of upcoming webinars and different, um, different things that you know, many of the other instructors, we do have guest instructors come to Boston. So if you ever want to um, come to Boston, if you feel comfortable with the way the pandemic is, or even post pandemic, um, we do have a lot of different instructors come from around the country and around the world. So um, it, it'd be great to keep updated if, if um, you want to study from you know, specific artists, even sending a note to the school can sometimes um, be a way that we um, we see the demand for specific artists or specific work workshops that you may want to see. I know I personally make workshops based on what um, based on what people uh, based on what people want to see. So if there are specific things that you want to focus on, please feel free to send me an email. Let me know uh, if it's portraiture, if it's still life. But if you want to do a webinar, want to focus on something in particular. Um, I, I do make workshops based on requests as well, not just kind of what I'm interested in, but um, um, just kind of choosing all of that. So give me just one moment. So Bliss, give me one se second. Yep. Um, Alrighty. 
Um, I just want to just go through what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the list of the links. If anybody wants, um, let me ask you all this. Would any of you want to um, get a, um, at the end, there's going to be an email that's going to be sent out to everybody. Does anybody want a list of the, um, the chat? If you want a list of the chat, I can save that. If you want to save it, actually, that's actually better. What you can do is on, on your screen, there's going to, underneath the chat section, there's going to be three dots. You can pretty much click save chat, and that's going to save all of the links and all of the stuff. Trukel is going to send out an email um, just announcing the uh, winner of the uh, the winner of the prize pack, as well as just all of the links to uh, the upcoming webinars, the materials that I've used, and I guess the um, the, the the drum roll right now is um, uh, to announce the winner of the prize pack. So. Uh, congratulations to Paige Weber. Um, you, you've, you've won. So congratulations. Thank you. I hope, I hope they, the materials serve you well. Um, any of you that obviously did not win, um, nobody likes the feeling of not winning. Um, so I also do, in the spirit of giving, I do lots of giveaways and everything, just random draws for like my materials. So um, I am, you know, uh, I am a protein member for Drakel. I'm also an ambassador for natural pigments and rhubarb color. So I do like to um, not just keep all the materials for myself, but um, I, I use my own money and, you know, I, I earn things from the, com from the companies that I work for. And I do try my best to give opportunities that way. Um, people can just, you know, have them as just kind of a, a good thing. So um, follow me on, in, on social media, uh, Instagram or TikTok, and I will be doing giveaways, not only for, not only for, you know, certain materials, but also giveaways for uh, webinars and workshops. So um, yeah. Does anybody else have any other questions? Anything else anybody wants to talk about? Uh, Sanchi here. I have one last question. Um, I, I don't know. I was carrying this painting. It was varnished and everything. It's scratched. Can I re-varnish it? Say that again. Uh, I was carrying this completely finished painting and varnished, and the varnish <laughs> scratched. Uh, of other people that are disappointed too. Okay, and uh, it has been scratched. And it looks scratched. Does it usually happen? The varnish scratches. Um, the varnish, the varnish is there to protect your painting from scrap scratches or abrasions. So um, yeah. I would look at it very carefully to discern whether or not it's the varnish that is scratched or the painting that is scratched. So the varnish can be struck can be scratched without any damage being done to the actual painting. So one of the purposes of, of the varnish is to protect it from minor abrasion, stuff like that. So you definitely could be, um, you, you definitely could be um, safe from your painting being scratched. If it's scratched, unvarnish it, repair it, and then re-varnish it. So just take a um, uh, turpentine and rub it, then take the scratch off, and then re-varnish it. Is that? I would unvarnish the whole thing. Oh, the whole thing, the whole I painting? Would, I would roll cotton swabs over it like you would see in art restoration mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the scrub at it, um, which can damage your painting, which is, you know, you don't want to damage your painting more in the process of trying to fix it. Okay. Uh, yeah. varnish painting, taking a slower, tedious uh, method is a little bit more desirable, a little bit more safe, but it's a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. You can probably just wipe off the varnish with some Mineral, mineral spirits or turpentine. It depends on what varnish you used. If you was a Demar varnish, you want to use turpentine. If it is no, a Gamsol. If it's a yeah, a Regal Res um, Gamsol varnish, yeah. then you use mineral spirits. Okay. I would remove the whole varnish, make the repair, let it dry thoroughly, and then essentially um, re-varnish it. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. I, I, I'm 
I'm happy to answer a few more questions if any of you want to just kind of um, put some more in the chat or even just unmute yourself. Eric, I have a question about oleo gel versus oleo res gel. Is the res um, some kind of resin that they add? I believe the oleo res gel is an alkyd. An alkyd. Um, it's an alkyd version of it, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, that was a mistake. I love oleo gel. And one time I just pressed the wrong button, got it and tried it. And I thought, I don't it like it. Doesn't seem right. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the great things is um, natural pigments is really good about providing a ton of information. So always go whenever you're at one of their products, scroll down because there's always going to be a ton of information on whatever that product is, what exactly is in it what its purpose is, what the history of it is. So always just kind of um, scroll down to see what um, information you can find right on the site too. I'll do that tonight, thanks. You're welcome. Eric, I have a question for you. You are. This is Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Um, I have two. I, you, you went kind of fast on what to unvarnish with, whether you've used uh, different products. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat that? And then the second question, is I'm, I'm listening. I'm getting what you would need. Oh, you can keep talking. I'm just getting the cotton swaps that I was talking about. Oh, okay. The the other question is, I would never knew what to varnish with, so I've got some older paintings that I need to varnish, and one of them in particular is really a nice painting, and I feel like it's yellowed a little bit up in my lights. Is there anything I can do with that before I varnish? Oh, okay, wait, hold on, repeat that last, repeat that last one again. I have a painting that is really a nice one, and I feel like the lighter colors have yellowed a little, and I have not varnished yet. How long has it been unvarnished? Um, a few years, mm. five years. Shame. Oh, shame on you. I know, um, I didn't what to do? I didn't know how to do it. Shame, shame on me. Um, okay, so your paint is like, ex your painting is e the equivalent of an extremely fine sandpaper. Okay. So it's made of, there's pigment, right? Just like sandpaper has little tiny pigments. So there's little micro grooves in the paint okay. um, surface, which can collect dust and dirt. The Impressionists have the exact same issue because the Impressionists didn't like to varnish their paintings because it would make the values richer. They liked the sunken end look because it gave a more unified value range, which was generally lighter. So that slight yellowing can just be tarnish of just dust and dirt, um, just grime from, you know, your, you know, if it's in your house, it could be from, you know, the, just the, the oil floating in the air from you frying something. If you're, you know, so there, I don't have a perfect answer for you. Um, you might want to look into Gainsborough products. Um, their Gainsborough provides uh, materials for art restoration. So what you can do is try to do a cleaning. In there, you will be able to get these cotton swabs that you know art art restorers will use. Um, that is essentially the pr a proper way to remove the varnish is doing it, doing it little by little with these little cotton swabs, not scrubbing at your painting, but kind of rolling and dissolving, dissolving it in little sections at a time. Um, so. And where it hasn't been varnished, it's just more dusty, maybe. I would clean it first and then varnish it with anything is better than nothing. At this point, you can use whatever varnish you want to use. Don't use a retouch varnish because that retouch varnish is just thin varnish. But um, any varnish that you choose would would essentially be fine that you can buy. I think what I'll do is um, message you on Instagram with what the painting is, so you can take a peek at it. Would that work? That would work. Okay. Or I guess you have a website. I could even email you. Yeah. Whatever. It's an important painting. It turned out beautiful and. Um, I don't want it to not be preserved, but thank you. You're very welcome. I will take two more questions um, because I have a four year old that's desperately calling out to me. Um, so two more questions. Bliss, thank you for your time. If you do want to um, get to your dinner and your husband, they're perfectly fine to leave too. 
Um, but I will. My pleasure. Apologize. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Eric. All right. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Bye. Sure. You're number one. Thank you so much. So I had a quick question. We have noticed that the painting that you're demoing today was a little cooler and redder compared to the reference. Is that because you kind of um, the vision that the painting is going to yellow over time and you kind of made it deliberately a little cooler and redder? Well, see, the issue is my reference and my... So, see, that's the issue is that's the same photo that I dropped to my iPad and I'm painting from the iPad and I'm pretty much matching the colors that I see from the iPad. Um, generally, when I do a master copy, especially like a Rembrandt or whatever, I will paint the colors a little bit cooler to compensate for the hundreds of years of the paint darkening and yellowing and aging. Um, so to, to answer your question, kind of yes, but at the same time, it's the reference on, that you see compared to what my camera sees is like totally different than just what my eyes see compared to my reference on my iPad and the, um, the painting. Usually it's not that big of a difference, but um, like the general coloration from like here to here is much more similar. Of course, the iPad's going to be darker. It won't be able to um, see all of those values. Of course, it just blows it out. But um, I was just working from that reference. So the reference that you see is just slightly different than what I saw. Thank you. But generally speaking, if you are doing a master copy like that, I would encourage you to paint the colors maybe just a little bit more chromatic, a little bit less amber um, in general, because that's essentially copying the aging. The, you know, hey, I, I have one question maybe you could address on your website is how do you set up your cameras and things to video? So video? yeah, how, how do you set up your cameras and your lighting for videoing? Okay, so I've got, so the lights that I use, um, type in newer, N-E-E-W-R-660, they're LED panels, you can change the warmth and coolness of it. So right, I've got you've got that, great. Yeah, I do. Great, so I've got my one light, I've got the light on my palette, I have my um, one camera, the camera there, let me gather my bearings here. Okay, so that camera, records the painting. Obviously this camera records the palette. And then I've got my, um, I've got my audio on like a boom arm. This is usually over there when I'm actually teaching on, on the regular, but that allows me to actually do all of that painting. I see some people have like their iPhone like right here and they have to paint around it. I couldn't deal with that. Um, so the, the camera's always kind of looking over my shoulder, um, but that's essentially how I have it set up. And then I, I've you. got a, um, an HDMI to mini HDMI that goes to my computer and then a um, USB to mini USB to the um, other camera. And then wow. I use OBS to kind of compile those together. Wow, cool. Hello, Eric. I have a question uh, regarding gum bar varnish. How, what do you think about that, that you can use gum bar from gambling to varnish after a week or so or two weeks? That one you can use on like... Better to wait longer, generally speaking. Better to wait longer. Scan bar is a Regal Res 1094 varnish. So it's the same thing as like Rublev's Concert Bar. It is okay for you to varnish once your painting is thoroughly dry. You should be able to put a knuckle into it and twist 90 degrees and you shouldn't get any paint on your knuckle. Um, if it's that dry, then it's okay to varnish, but it's still better that you wait longer. Thank you. You're welcome. Eric, I have a question. Okay, that'll be the last one. Thank you. Um, I know most of us oil painters are used to using mineral spirits to clean our brushes throughout our painting process. Now you're recommending to not use mineral spirits. Uh, what, if we wanted to clean our brush mid process, what would you recommend? Oil. Oil mid process. Oil, yes, just oil. Like get to okay. you know, the same tank that you would put mineral spirits in, fill it with oil. Okay. All the paint, Does refined all the paint all right out of it. Go on. Do you use refined linseed oil? Whatever, whatever oil you want. 
Um, you know, it, just linseed oil, not stand oil. Um, you know, that is linseed oil, but yeah, refined linseed oil, cold pressed linseed oil. The goal is just to get the pigment out of the brush, right? So you use that and then you just use your, use your um, rag to just suck all the oil out of your brush and you're good to go. That's cool. I mean, that's what the old masters would have done, right? They would have had a big tub of oil. The distillation and, you know, mining, you know, fracking and stuff for, you know, crude oil and then the distillation of it wouldn't be around for, you know, hundreds of years. They would just use oil because oil thins the paint, right? Makes it more fluid. So if you use a lot of oil, well, the pigment just falls right out of your brush. You just have to make sure that you're washing your brushes thoroughly enough or letting it live in oil. That way it doesn't dry and ruin your brush. All right, I guess at that point, thank you all for coming. I hope to maybe see you uh, as one of my students at the Atelier private lesson or perhaps maybe even one of these webinars. If not, uh, that's good too. Um, stay in touch, send me an email, follow me on Instagram. I will follow you on Instagram and just thank you all for joining. Have fun painting and keep on, um, just keep on living life, a life worth living. And this is always a good dedication for your life, um, painting art, the arts just in general. So, um, thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, thank Eric. you so much, Eric. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 -bye.